about 2,500, and uh, we saw unwinding the bank nifty again, uh, which potentially could be in focus today considering the interest rates. That's where we saw further unwinding, the decline around 11%. And uh, well, we saw an advance of uh, uh, nearly 1%. The big positive, of course, is the bank nifty has closed about the mark of 48,000, and that has been a little bit of a psychological resistance as well as, well, a level to keep an eye on. Uh, let, let's move on and talk about the options market as far as the nifty is concerned, considering we we once again tested life highs. In fact, we did uh, make a new life high yesterday, 22,600 and thereabouts. And which is why 20 to 500, 20 to 600 is where we also saw a lot of writing in terms of calls as well as puts, and in terms of your overall, uh, you know, options expiry into the new week. And we are now starting uh, and keeping our well eyes on 23,000. That's the next level to watch out for on the higher end. And of course, on the lower end, we are now starting to see a little bit more uh, support building around 20 to 400, 20 to 500. Moving on, in terms of stocks, uh, well, it was overall a good day of trade. So we saw a lot of longs building in for Ipka Labs, Kotak Mother Bank, LIC Housing, and Bandhan Bank. And of course, in terms of uh, short, uh, well, rather decline in OI, uh, longs and winding for Dalmia Bharat and Coromandel, and of course, Aisha Motors, Devi's Laboratories, and Hindustan Copper saw about a short covering. But uh, today is going to be about the monetary policy, Alex. There are no big weekly options expiries today. Mm. So I reckon uh, we could potentially see a trend towards the latter half of the session. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Agam, for getting us those details. Now, let's get you the expectations on the RBI Monetary Policy Committee's uh, meeting, the outcome uh, of which is going to be announced at 10 o'clock today. Pallavi Nahata is joining in to give you some context uh, about uh, where we stand right now, the economy, uh, and what the RBI's Monetary Policy Committee is likely to do. Pallavi, uh, what are the key highlights to focus on? Hi, Alex. Good morning. So, uh, the RBI appears to enjoy wide policy optionality. Uh, we've seen GDP grow by 8.5% for the October-December quarter. GVA grew by about 6.5%. Uh, post that release as well, high-frequency indicators continue to show that economic activity remains strong and resilient. Uh, on the other hand, retail inflation has again come in at 5.1%. That's the last of available print that the MPC has. Uh, food inflation was a tad elevated at 8.7 percent, but core inflation continued to be a source of comfort. Uh, so broadly it appears that we are beginning to see space for rate cuts, but no urgency for one. And that's exactly what expectations are as well. All the economists polled by Bloomberg expect a status quo uh, and uh, when, when the MPC does announce its decision in a few hours from now, uh, the RBI is also expected to continue to maintain the stance at the withdrawal of accommodation. Uh, what then are we going to be watching out for uh, in the policy release? Uh, essentially, one thing that we're going to be watching out for is, see, so far we've seen one external member, Jayant R. Varma, vote for a 25 basis points rate cut. Uh, we're also going to be watching out for what the other members do this time around. Will any more of the external members have the same ask as him? Uh, another thing that's we're, that we're going to be watching out for is the growth and inflation forecasts. If the RBI does tweak either of those, uh, we are seeing some headwinds uh, in terms of higher crude prices, continuously high food inflation, uh, the IMD commentary on the uh, heat waves in the next next few months. Uh, so that's one thing. And one more is uh, what the RBI says on liquidity conditions. Right. Absolutely. Pallavi, thanks so much. And in fact, what you just pointed out on Brent crude, if I'm not mistaken, the expectation from the RBI or the uh, estimate is lower than where the current market price for crude is, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. That's, that's true. Uh, so, you know, at this point, uh, we're unlikely to see the RBI change its uh, forecast as, just as yet. Uh, it's too soon maybe for that to happen. But that's definitely something we're going to be watching out for, what the RBI has to say on higher crude prices. And essentially, uh, from what we understand, if we continue to see these high prices, it'll definitely have implications on monetary policy mm -hmm. and India's macro uh, uh, indicators. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Let's talk about Brent crude, which uh, incidentally is 
above the $90 per barrel mark as we speak. The latest update, of course, is the OPEC Plus decision to maintain supply cuts in the first half of 2024. What does that mean for oil supply and what's the context in terms of demand? To tell you all of that, I'm joined by Mihika. Mihika, what can you tell us about this latest development and also the premium that is being associated with geopolitical tension? Yes. Um, so, Brent prices have been on a bullish trend, especially in the last month. It's up about 11%. And yesterday, overnight, it rose 2% and hit $90 per barrel for the first time since October of 2023. Now, there are two, um, in entirety, two major factors. One are the geopolitical tensions and the potential supply risk. First, I'll talk about the OPEC supply cuts. Now, um, OPEC, in terms of their supply policy, have, have been tightening the market um, due to the, uh, while the global demand does seem robust. Now, on Wednesday after the OPEC meeting, um, the supply cuts were maintained, uh, indicating that 2 million barrels per day of output is currently offline via the OPEC um, plus countries. And these voluntary supply cuts will be in play till June of 2024. Um, another um, thing are the Middle Eastern tensions. Now, the latest uh, came after um, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin uh, Netanyahu um, statement spiked the prices. And, um, the Prime Minister said that Israel will operate against Iran and its proxies if it does try to um, hurt the country. And um, these uh, comments came after Iran vowed to have revenge against Israel after an attack on a um, high-ranking military personnel. Now, direct Iranian involvement does risk um, global oil supply because Iran is the third largest OPEC producer. Jan 2024 production estimates estimate around 3.16 million barrels per day of output. Absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Mika, for putting that into context for us. Uh, we will be talking about the outlook for crude in just a bit. You'll find that in uh, the next show, that is India Market Open. For now, let's uh, head on to an NDTV Profit exclusive. Uh, and sources have told us that Vodafone Idea has asked domestic lenders to give an NOC to bring new investors into the fold. Vishwanath Nair has more in this report. The uh, domestic lenders have been uh, requested uh, to give a non, no objection certificate to uh, Vodafone Idea. Uh, this is a powerful cause whenever a company is going for uh, any major fundraise. Uh, discussions around Vodafone Idea looking to raise about 20,000 crore uh, through a follow-on public uh, offer have been going on for a while now. Uh, they are, uh, the board of, of, the, of the company is likely to meet uh, on Saturday on the 6th of April uh, to discuss uh, a preferential issue of about 2,075 crore. Uh, where uh, the promoters are likely to see some amount of stake dilution. So that part uh, of, the, of the fundraising is, is on one side. On the other is the FPO at 20,000 odd crore. So uh, what the lenders uh, or the sources uh, are telling us at this point in time uh, is that uh, Vodafone Idea has not discussed the names of any of the uh, investors that they are currently talking to. Uh, however, the lenders uh, can see that the company is quite confident about going ahead with this FPO. Um, now, Bloomberg reported earlier today uh, that uh, the company has picked Jeffries and access uh, as bankers to go uh, to uh, proceed with this FPO. So uh, there is a lot of movement that is happening within Vodafone Idea. We need to see whether they're able to close this fundraising and whether they're able to raise that 20,000 crore with the right kind uh, of uh, stake sale uh, to any investor who might be coming into Vodafone Idea. All right, watch out for that stock in trade today. Uh, we have to slip into a very quick break and we'll talk about the other stocks that you should watch out for, so do stay tuned. <music> Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy.
people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids... <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching All You Need to Know. It's time to look at the stocks that are likely to be buzzing in trade today. And to tell you about the first on the list, we've got Vasha joining in. Vasha, we're talking about Soba as well as Hero Motor Corp. Yeah, yes, Alex. So, good morning. So, let's start with Sobha, uh, wherein there is a uh, business update for Q4 FY24, wherein they've achieved pre-sales of rupees 1500 crores, which was flat year on year and down 23% quarter on quarter. Uh, there was sequential decline in pre-sales for first time in last 10 quarters. Uh, sales volume for quarters stood at almost, uh, which was down 9% year on year. Uh, uh, th there were new launches in FY24 which took place. Uh, they've launched four new residential projects. Uh, two of them were launched in March, so could not contribute much to sales in Q4 FY24. Uh, then we have Hero Motor Corp, wherein they've got 605 crore demand notice from IT department. The notice pertains to six assessment years amounting to tax demand of 309 crore with interest of 296 crore. Uh, this is on the account of certain dis allowances for assessment year 2013 to 14 uh, and 2017 uh, 19 20 as well then we have prestige estates wherein they've acquired 21 acres of land in at whitefield bangalore uh, the company will develop residential project spanning over 4 million square feet the cost of acquisition is 450 crore and they expect to generate almost 4500 crore uh, also uh, uh, they expect to launch project in next three quarters uh, with development project completion in next four years then lastly we have rashi peripherals wherein they've received new orders of 1500 crore from nmd data center now order is for supply of information and uh, communication technology products uh, while the execution time period is unknown but if you see the interesting thing here is the order value is 1500 crore while the market cap for the company is around 2200 crore so these are all the stocks which should be on our radar today yeah, certainly the last one an important metric that you pointed out uh, let's talk about some of the other stocks that you should watch out for uh, in trade today and those include Ultratech Cement as well as Grasim uh, and Cello. Mika has got more uh, and she's uh, back to tell you about that. Mika, what can you tell us? Yes, I'll start with Ultratech Cement where it's commissioned a 100 megawatt solar project and it's the first project that the company has carried out and the power from this project which is situated in Rajasthan will source power to its other facilities. Power will be used by units in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Himachal Pradesh, um, Tamil Nadu, Odisha. And now the renewable capacity of the company is at 612 megawatts and the waste heat um, uh, system is at 278 megawatts. Um, the company aims to increase the green power mix by 85%, whereas as of Q3, it stood at 24. Then we had Grassums, which has approved a 26% acquisition at Clean Max Decimus, which is a, a special purpose vehicle for renewable energy transmission. It's a facility with 2.7 megawatt per hour uh, capacity in Haryana and will provide energy to the company's Pani Pan plant. The objective is to meet the green energy needs and optimize the energy cross. Uh, the acquisition cost was at 94.5 lakhs and the execution will be in the next 90 days. And lastly, we have Cello, which is commissioned a manufacturing facility um, and is going to do, do it in a phased manner. And uh, it's going to be commissioned by its subsidiary Cello Consumerware. Now, this is a glassware facility located in Rajasthan, and the company has stated that it'll have a total installed annual capacity of 20,000 tons per annum. And the ca capacity is mainly made to reduce the company's import dependence on glassware. The uh, project KPS is at 250 crores, and while the facility has been commissioned, the glassware furnace to be operational in Q1 of FI25. All right, thanks so much, Mika, for getting us those details. Turning to the currency market, and the Reserve Bank of India has deferred the implementation of its circular on exchange-traded currency derivatives. And uh, we've got Bimansa who's been tracking this uh, for some time, and she's joining us to help us understand why there was need for this extension. Bimansa, what is the RBI saying, and what are market players saying right now? Yeah, um, so the RBI clarified on its existing regulations yesterday and uh, deferred the implementation to May 3rd uh, uh, under the 
previous circular, the effective date was today. Uh, now, over the last few days, there has been chaos in the rupee derivatives market where brokerages were scrambling to wind up their positions. Now, what does the what do these uh, regulations say? Uh, they say that un users can take positions of up to hundred million dollars without having to provide a documentary evidence to establish the underlying exposure to hedge. Now, RBI clarified that users can transact in futures market only for the purpose of hedging their underlying FX exposure, which is what the norm was always uh, stating. It has, for this very reason, the RBI had said that at no point there was any exemption from the requirement of having the exposure. And they also clarified that the regulatory framework for the exchange traded currency derivatives has remained consistent over the years and there is no change in the norms. The need for clarification came because it seems like we spoke to several brokerages and it seems like that uh, for all these years, these brokerages had uh, misinterpreted the norms uh, that not having to provide evidence for uh, the trades up to 100 million dollars means that they can transact without any underlying exposure at all which was not the case uh, now we spoke to uh, brokerages again after the clarification and they were saying that uh, it doesn't really change anything for them uh, in terms of their existing open positions because about 99 percent of those positions had already been squared off because the circular was to come into effect today so that's that will only give uh, genuine corporate some more time to hedge and to produce this, this documentary evidence that they need to back up their underlying exposure so, for. So if anything, the uh, clarification should have come a little bit earlier. Yes. Most of the work had already been done. Thanks so much for getting us those details, Viman, sir. Let's turn to another developing story that we've been tracking, and that's from the aviation space. The uh, turmoil for Vistara continues, a bit growing tension between the airline and the pilots. Uh, the Indian Commercial Pilots Association, as well as the Indian Pilots Guilds, uh, Guild, rather, are now seeking intervention from Tata Sands Chairman N. Chandra Shekharan. We've got Pragati joining in. There was a letter that was sent to the Chairman, Pragati. What does it say? Right, Alex. So the Vistara crisis does not seem to end anytime soon because now the pilot unions have stepped in and sent a letter to Tata Group chairperson, as you rightly mentioned. Now, in that letter specifically, uh, the unions have said that the Vistara pilots' demands were reflective of the broader challenges that are present in the airlines operated by Tata Group. In fact, they even listed out the demands that were raised by Vistara's pilots' life, 70 hours of fixed remuneration, approval of leaves, rostering system, and so on and so on forth and the union reiterated that the uh, demands were valid and they continuously urged the Tata group and the Tata group chairperson to intervene and pay attention to what the pilots are saying. Now the context of this thing is that about two days back uh, Vistara's management and the uh, CEO and HR people spoke to the pilots uh, in a town hall that was conducted uh, while they assured uh, that uh, some remedy would be given as of now nothing has happened and hence the unions wrote to Tata group chair person for this. All right. Thanks so much, Pragati, for getting us those details. And finally, we've got a slew of business updates uh, from financial space to talk about, including Bajaj Finance. And we've got Harsh joining in to give you some perspective on that. Harsh, what can you tell us? Well, good morning, Alex. You're looking at Bajaj Finance, extremely strong set of numbers. I think fourth consecutive quarter when it comes to the AUM growth, 30% plus. Uh, it's coming at 34%, uh, just shy of 34% year over year in this quarter, 6% plus uh, on a sequential basis. In terms of customers added as well, very healthy traction, 4% sequential, 21% year over year. And the one piece that's probably... Uh, you know, in some form or shape shielding the kind of numbers that have come out is the new loans book. Uh, that one has grown by just about 4% on a year-on-year -year basis, down 20% sequentially, but that's because of certain one-offs with regard to the uh, restrictions placed by the RBI. But nonetheless, the AUM growth continues to be stronger and that will be in focus. Deposit accretion continues to be robust and liquidity buffers have been uh, pushed up. So, so all of that are positive. I'll quickly move on to Indusin Bank, uh, well, you're looking at net advances growth of roughly 5% sequential in line with what they've guided for lower end of the band, uh, of the guidance band. Let's look at deposits though. Uh, that one go growing at roughly 4.3%. LDR now inching towards that 90% mark, uh, loan to deposit ratio. So keep your eye out on that one. But strong numbers nonetheless, uh, in line with expectations. Bandhan was extremely strong, 11% uh, sequential on advances and 15 
percent sequential on deposits right. very very strong keep your eye out on that one absolutely thanks so much harsh for getting us those details that brings us to the end of this particular edition of all you need to know lots more coming up including the outcome of the mpc meeting all of that is going to be dissected over the course of the day do stay tuned this is ndtv profit Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we are already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, a IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards, simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. Very good morning, you're watching India Market Open and we are set for quite a day. Global queues are negative, monetary policy is coming up. So much that is going to decide and give direction to your trade today and we're going to be breaking it all down. But let's start with what's been happening overnight. Neeraj, uh, complete, you know, all the elements of a perfect storm. Yeah. Crude prices up, uh, bond yields uh, looking like they're going upwards and the Dow down over 500 points. Yeah, the worst day in 2024. Volatility surged 15%. It was just the classic cocktail. 
that uh, or, or a very potent cocktail, if you will. But from an India perspective, yes, Tamanna, you're right. Global markets down, VIX up, crude up at 91 and counting. And it doesn't seem like um, we are staring at the end because yeah. I think when I looked at the uh, global sites this morning, the tone from America is that if indeed this tension escalates, then they'll be supporting Israel. And therefore there is, while they are at not, not um, in sync when it comes to Gaza, when it comes to the Iran threat for Israel, America is saying that they'll support Israel. So Biden is telling Netanyahu that you better stop bombing Gaza, humanitarian, yes. humanitarian workers yes. because an American citizen has died. Yeah. I think the other story, though, of course, for another time is how the world has stopped listening to Biden, whether it's the Ukrainians who keep, uh, you know, attacking Russian fields or Netanyahu. Yeah. But, uh, you know, just talking quickly about what's happening and what's happened in the global, global markets, I'll recap it and then we have Peter Macquarie to give us perspective on, um, you know, what really is the import of what we've seen. So, very quickly, the Dow was down over 500 points, as we mentioned. Um, three key factors which is spooking investors, I would say. On the one hand, uh, they're waiting for the non-farm uh, payroll data, which will come out on Friday. Hotter than expected jobs data means that there isn't too much of a case to uh, cut interest rates. Uh, crude prices are spiking bond yields on their way up. Uh, there was a statement from a Fed official which has also spooked the market, and that's um, the other part of it. So the Minneapolis Fed president, Neil Kashkari, has in a public comment actually asked that is there a case for a Fed rate cut at all looking at all of these aspects. Now remember that this is in a statement made in an individual capacity and Kashkari tends to be a little relatively hawkish but having said that that has been enough to spook the markets. Uh, bond yields um, have not been too bad. They went up to 4.42 yesterday remember but cooled off to about 4.3 percent ahead of that jobs data. Crude is the big story, 91 on the Brent, 91 and above on the Brent. U.S. crude prices also up. Combination of factors both in the supply and demand side. We're going to be talking in more detail about that. Quick look at Asian markets before I go to Peter McQuarrie. I just want to see how Asia seems to be faring right now and it's not great. In the red largely but the Nikkei of course hit the most. But uh, let's get in a take from Peter. He's CEO XM Australia. Peter, very good morning for us. But of course, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us um, uh, you know, on, on the show. Um, can I just get a sense of whether we are seeing a momentary issue over here in terms of the crude spike? Or are these now factors which could carry on for a while? Because Middle East crisis has been happening for a while. Ukraine-Russia conflict has been happening for a while. OPEC producers wanting to hike prices and cut production has been happening for a while as well. Well, good morning, Tamana. I think it's many things, and you've probably added uh, there's maybe three or four others that you could probably put in there. And we're talking also, we've got to be t really mindful of the situation. It's been, I think, oversold to some way. We've had a nice rally to the upside, and you've had those geopolitical concerns come in. Confirmation as far as OPEC plus and overall demand is relatively strong. And I think the producers are probably wanting prices closer to that 85 to 90. And then you're rolling geopolitical tensions in there, which in turn could make that, you know, that 95 handle very achievable in the short run. Peter, good morning. Neera. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon to you, Neera Jair. Uh, now, uh, keeping all of this in mind, but the fact that the Israel-Iran issue is yes. uh, simmering now, and we don't quite know which way it will move, uh, do you reckon that there are upsides for crude purely based on sentiment, if not actual demand? Well, I think so, Naraj. I think there's, you know, that war premium slash geopolitics is always one of concern. And we're also mindful of the, you know, the Persian Gulf and the transporting of crude through that region. The overall hostility still hasn't been put to bed as far as the Houthis, what's going on there. So it's just a combination of many factors. And that's led to, you know, that spike in price. And uh, no one knows how much further it's got on this particular roll. But I think there's probably a few dollars left in it yet. And then maybe it'll just have a little bit of a breather unless you see something dramatic happen from a geopolitical concern. In terms of how far the Brent could go, Peter, would you reckon that um, 
you know, it's not too much of an upside above 91. Do you see the possibility at all of crude back at $100 a barrel? Well, look at the big guys. I mean, you know, JP Morgan have come out and said it's quite possible you could see 100. Many are saying 95 is achievable, Tamana. And I think that that's probably what the appetite's going to be over the next month or two leading in this second quarter. It's been a very uh, rocky road to start this quarter. And I feel as though that, yes, um, I would be erring on that side, 90 plus over for the rest of the quarter. And uh, if you get wild swings with geopolitics rolled into it, then, uh, yeah, probably 100 is very achievable. Yeah, 100 achievable. Some of it would be, uh, you know, force-fitted because of uh, the OPEC plus trying to push production cuts and the others. Of course, Please. geopolitical tension simmering. Thank you so much, Peter McQuarrie. Always a pleasure to have you on NDTV Profit and Thank great you. to speak with you today. Thank you All right, so, so $95 to $100 not cut out. Now, the question is that how much of this is going to have an import today? Because for the last couple of sessions, Neeraj, Indian markets have been marching to their own beat. Yeah. Impervious, pretty much, to other things that ha are happening. And the story this morning is HDFC. I don't know if you can pull that up. HDFC ADR as up high 5%. as 7 as at one point as high as 7%. Yeah. Overnight. Yeah. So some bit of it, uh, Indian markets may be factored in over the last two days and therefore this also happening. But yes, you're right. You know, financials per se have actually had a pretty strong run. And if that continues, it's a bit of a support that the markets really wanted. But somehow something tells me that the oil party might still disrupt the oil uptick might still disrupt the Indian party in the many year term. Keep in mind, oil, geopolitics and the US markets correcting led to a global volatility really shooting up in trade. That's usually uh, something that brings the market lower. But almost anybody that you speak to talks about India now being a market on dips. I think the markets have laid out the proof that India is a market to be bought on dips and not to be sold on rises. And I think that is what will weigh in the mind of anybody who's wanting to open a shot, especially in the two periods of uh, two months of election as well as uh, results coming out. And results, by the way, thus far have looked very strong, right? I mean, Tamanna was talking about HDFC Bank. That's exactly the point. If Citi's note on Indus in Bank today is an indication of 30% upside, um, Bajaj Finance numbers looking strong. So the numbers are looking strong, which is a good positive for India. Oil upstream and defense could buck the trend today, to be honest. Yesterday, by the way, in the US, the defense stocks actually had a fabulous run. Midway through the day, the defense stocks spiked to day's highs. Now, does that happen in India as well because of what's happening to tensions? Because a lot of Indian defense companies are suppliers uh, to global companies now. So that's the other interesting piece. And just w what's kind of um, buckled down um, after showing some signs, to my mind at least, Tamanna, is FMCG. And if Dabur is any indication of what's happening to the space. It need not be, but if it is, then bottom fishing in FMCG could get delayed because the commentary, the numbers left a bit to be desired. The stock corrected yesterday, yes, but is it symptomatic of what could happen to the other FMCG players? Mm. That's the key question. Um, and does that kind of derail the slight uptick that we're seeing in FMCG? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Dabur is saying that, uh, yes, rural growth is picking up, but it's sluggish. Demand is, is sluggish. That's a problem. I just want to quickly, you know, take you through what the implied open is uh, indicating. And yes, you are possibly, like most of Asia, uh, going to have a negative start for India as well, about 75 points down. Now, yesterday was an interesting day because you closed, um, uh, you know, fairly decently. What was the kind of fund flow is what uh, we should look at because you closed 80 points up on the Nifty. And here's the interesting bit. Uh, it was all about HDFC, it seems. Uh, HDFC and TCS, because FPIs, DIIs, both were sellers. FPIs, remember, last four sessions have been consistently selling, um, and DIIs were sellers yesterday as well. But um, I think in terms of now the stocks that are going to be in focus, HDFC could have another fabulous day. Like we were mentioning, the ADR was up overnight. Um, as high as 7%, the positive sentiment on the robust quarterly business uh, numbers will continue. In fact, uh, a hu n large number of notes this morning as well, Neeraj. I'm just going to go through what Nomura is saying. They've mm -hmm. uh, reiterated uh, a neutral on HDFC target price at 16.25. So they're seeing about a 6% upside. They said the gross loan growth was soft, but everyone's looking at the deposit growth. Uh, it is a seasonally strong quarter, but the deposit growth at about 11 odd percent 
um, is uh, cumulative is being seen as good. LDR has come down 600 bips and the rundown of low yielding corporate loans will be aiding NIM. So HDFC is a big one, a lot of other notes, but the HDFC of the day could be BAF. Now, if that's confusing, I'm saying Bajaj Finance um, and their business updates are completely rocking. So you have AUM growth above 30% uh, consistently. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I think Harsh was mentioning the last four quarters or some such, and we'll get him in for more details. Deposit growth is up 35% year on year. Uh, Jefferies has uh, maintained a buy with a target price of 9400 for Bajaj Finance. That's nearly a 30% upside. It's their t key top pick in NBFCs. They say that the pre-quarter update shows a robust AUM growth above estimates and growth in customer base is also healthy. City has a buy rating with a target price of 8,975 for um, Bajaj Finance. They say the consolidated AUM is showing sustained, robust traction. They're happy with the ROE, ROA numbers as well. Uh, bank borrowings have become expensive and NIMS to have probably declined. Now, the fact that RBI's guidelines on, you know, sort of toning down loans to smaller segments has already been factored in. Uh, Bajaj Finance saw that price correction, so maybe that's not too much of a concern. Um, a couple of real estate names have also seen some interesting traction, but I'll come back to that, uh, Neeraj, after what's on your list. Yeah, I mean, so financials across the board, I mean, I, I just thought Indescent Bank, the other one, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the loan growth, Maybe from from a from a twenty percent is 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 lower at uh, let's say eighteen percent. Is that is that uh, I, mean, I mean is that a sign or is that an indication or is that a derivation that we've gotten that by Indusind Bank may um, you know the slight moderation is reflecting of RBI asking the bank to moderate the unsecured loans and you know uh, LDR maybe. But City believes that it's a great number and their target prices are 30% higher. So banks and financials right up there. Yesterday we were talking about Suryodaya uh, Small Finance Bank. Today we are talking about ESAF Small Finance Bank and look at those numbers. I mean, again, uh, something, uh, a, a small number, but it, it, the total deposits uh, at 19,000 crores up 35%. Uh, gross advances, 18,000 crores, 34%. Obviously, it's a very small base uh, for a financial institution, but yet this 35% growth may get um, rewarded. So that's to be watched out for. Um, and, and one more update before we move on to other stocks and, and other newsmakers. Maybe Tamanna has more, actually. But one more update that I thought was interesting was Soba. By the way, Kalyan Jewelers this morning seemed okay, but Soba is the other one. The pre-sales numbers of 15 or 4 crores is flat YOI and about and down about 23% quarter on quarter. Now, this could well have happened. I mean, this is, you know, this number is, is happening after some 10 straight quarters of some very strong gains. Now, this is probably because of spillover or launches. A couple of launches that Soba did were in the month of March, and therefore, they may not have been able to capture in the month of March. Maybe April, May, June could be strong. We'll try and get the company to talk about it. So that's the other thing. But sales volume for the quarter as well, 1.3 million square feet, down 9% YOI. 19% QOQ. Does the street give it a benefit of doubt or does the street punish the stock today on what could turn out to be a slightly iffy day? I think that's the question. So let's wait and watch there. So, with Soba, you know, Prestige is the other one which has an update. We spoke with uh, the management at Founders Act recently. So they've acquired 21 acres of prime land in Whitefield, Bangalore for residential development of 4 million square feet. Uh, real estate has overall been down and today with the policy coming in, rate sensitives may be under traction. No real hike is um, expected, but even so. Just to come back on the financials, because uh, that is the story of the day. Uh, look at Nomura on Bandhan Bank. They have reiterated a buy with a target price of 275 on Bandhan Bank. Um, and, you know, that's nearly a 40% upside. They say gross loans and deposits have registered strong growth. This is, again, on the back of business updates. Retail and bulk deposits saw gro strong growth. Collection efficiency in MFI improved. Uh, likely moderation in slippage run rate and monitorable for Q4 will be, of course, consistent delivery on um, asset quality. But you could see an uptick there. City has retained a buy on Avas with a target price of 1830. That's another one that I would watch. The AUM growth is in line with their estimates. And uh, they forecast an AUM growth of 24 to 25% for FY25 and estimate 
of 26. So a clutch of financial stocks. But uh, speaking about uh, the space, the other big event, of course, No, today, just before that, Tamana, yeah. just before that, oh, yeah. two small stocks that we need to because they'll react today. Rashi Peripherals, watch out for that one. They received new orders worth 1,510 crores from an NBC data center. Somehow, this could well turn out to be a stock that starts off higher because if the market cap is 2,200 crores. The annual sales number is way lower than this order size, so watch out for this one. Mm. And watch out for IOL Chemicals. Uh, they've been issued a certificate of sustainability for Agabapentin, which is, um, gives them a great mix in the European regulated markets with higher margins. So IOL Chemicals is the other one. Okay, so those are a couple of uh, you know smaller companies, but you might see big moves there on a day to, like today, depending really on where the market mood uh, moves. The big story though this morning is uh, the monetary policy and I'm going to go across first to my colleague Vishwanath Nair who's joining us live from the RBI headquarters. Uh, Vishy, first up, uh, it's the first policy of the new fiscal year. I mean for the governor, obviously they've already decided what they're going to say but they're talking about this on a day when crude is hit 91 uh, and uh, you know inflation fears will loom. Yeah, that's right, uh, Tamana. So that's that's going to be one of those uh, one of those issues that the RBI and the MPC, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee, is going to be burdened with in the upcoming policy. So uh, remember that uh, as far as uh, India's inflation numbers go, it's about 5.1 percent uh, uh, as of February, uh, and that has uh, that has more or less uh, given a lot of comfort uh, to people to say that okay, maybe inflation is not such a bad position in a bad position right now. Uh, food price uh, fluctuations were a concern fuel was remaining more or less stable now of course the flu uh, the fuel component might see some uh, some volatility added to that uh, because of the weather phenomenon in india uh, because of the high heat waves uh, that are expected uh, in the later part of the year uh, you may see some agri output uh, impact as well uh, and therefore your headline number uh, might not uh, moderate as much as what one would have expected uh, now the rbi of course has repeatedly said that the job on the inflation front is not over uh, that the target for the uh, retail inflation is 4%. We are still at about 5.1%. Uh, and that, that last 100 bips, the, the last mile uh, of the inflation management uh, problem, that is something that uh, that's where it becomes tricky. And, and the RBI is going to uh, be active on that. Uh, as far as uh, the other factors go uh, for the MPC, for example, the liquidity position, uh, it, it did tighten for a bit uh, in December and early January. And since then, it has started to uh, sort of taper off. Uh, in, uh, liquidity is looking better uh, because the uh, month. Uh, upcoming months are election months, uh, you're likely to see that liquidity position remain largely stable because there will be some election spending that will uh, likely happen from all political parties. Uh, apart from that, uh, if you look at where the credit growth in the banking system is concerned, that's uh, still strong at about 16 odd percent. Uh, you've got uh, deposit growth slightly picking up now uh, with banks revising their deposit, uh, deposit rates. Uh, that transmission problem that the RBI governor pointed out last policy, uh, that seems to be waning a little bit, but we still haven't seen the full pass through of past rate hikes. So a multitude of factors indicating another uh, another pause. Of course, uh, the, the Fed, uh, US Federal Reserve has also uh, not indicated any uh, upcoming uh, rate cuts. I mean, the market is expecting at some point in June, uh, but there's no, uh, it's not a definitive yes. So we still need to wait and see how, uh, how the uh, global central banks act on the interest rates and then have to see how the MPC weighs uh, these domestic factors before they take a rate call. Okay. Vishy, thanks, and, and we look forward to your, question, to your questions to the RBI governor uh, during the press conference as well. Um, that's Vishwanath Nair, our banking editor, talking uh, about what to expect. Well, let's get in um, somebody we love talking to during such uh, instances. Lakshmi Iyer, CEO of Investments and Strategy at Kotak Alternate Asset Managers, joins us right in the studio. She talk about her thoughts on what is usually a big day. Could today be a big news-making day, Lakshmi, from the Reserve Bank governor or the MPC? Uh, I'm not too sure, Neeraj, if it's going to be a big uh, news-making day. Yeah, of course, there are breaking news uh, as far as commodity prices, specifically crude, uh, which is concerned. And that can obviously be a little bit of a bummer when you are uh, uh, at the D-Day in terms of announcing your policy and the first policy of the financial year where you will uh, you know, probably give expectations on the inflation trajectory, which is looking good so far, you know, in, uh, so far from India. In fact, I tweeted also this morning that India is an oasis in the desert as far as um, inflation is concerned. But will India want to proceed the Fed uh, as far as rate action is concerned uh, looks very unlikely.
So I'm not too sure if it's going to be like anything uh, out of the whack. Um, if at all, uh, things are looking a little bit spooky. Uh, from the previous policy to now, I think mm. they're about, what, 15, 16% up on crude oil prices. Uh, larger scheme of things may not be a big worrisome factor, but uh, if you look at the pure sentiment, I think, you know, uh, soft commodity prices are up, uh, you know, tomato, onion, uh, all these prices are also, you know, inching upwards, and it's the summer time of the year. And growth isn't looking bad. Yeah, and growth isn't looking bad. So if you have that kind of uh, Sone Peso Haga kind of moments, then why would uh, any central banker want to uh, ease rates? Yeah. Not really necessary to just gratify the markets, very unlikely. So so there is no real case for a rate cut. Anyway, we weren't penciling. I think nobody was penciling in one right now. The question is whether they will act before the Fed. The Fed doesn't seem clear what they're going to do, so we'll leave that aside. What is the commentary that you're looking out from? Apart, of course, the questions that uh, Governor Das will be fielding on what he's doing with currency der <laughs> derivative trade, and we'll come to that. But what is the commentary that you're looking out for in terms of uh, economic growth outlook as well as inflation? So growth seems to be on a reasonable footing. I think that can continue. I don't think there's going to be any change on that front. Um, <clears throat> inflation also, if you see just um, after the policy, a week later, we will have the inflation numbers. In all probability, that print could be sub 5%. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the next quarter, which is a July to August quarter, there could be a brief period where the print could be even sub 4%. So oh. I think, uh, you know, given why, why is that? The, it's a base effect. Yeah, yeah, it? it's yeah. all of that put together. So I think that part may not be, uh, you know, such a big, often, uh, sad, that big an issue. But we've also seen that uh, while domestic factors do hawk center stage, it's also important not to ignore what's happening globally. And in some sense, uh, Fed is behaving like um, La Pata ladies. I mean, <laughs> they are they're kind of uh, uh, talking about four and five rate cuts in terms of markets uh, mm. expectation, now down to maybe two or I don't know, maybe none. You don't know? So La Pata ladies is the term of the day coined by Lakshmi. I heard like fabulous. So Fed is acting like La Pata ladies. There's no reason why the RBI should follow these La Pata ladies. So then let's look at our own sort of traction and our own sort of timeline. When do you think that we can uh, pencil in a rate cut if at all? So today the markets may be looking out for some sort of a guidance in terms of when that could happen, but uh, uh, looks like uh, the indications could be still non-committal because there's so many uh, you know, things happening across. And as I said, when you have growth on a strong footing, there is no real necessity to guide the markets towards a rate cut. And look at the appetite for government bonds, pretty yep. strong. Yeah. 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 That's true. Um, just wondering, Lakshmi, on, on the growth front, <clears throat> the, the belief at the start of 2024 for many quarters was that will the RBI need to step in to support growth? Now, without that happening, the PMI numbers, etc., indicating that growth is strong, not just in India, picking up across the world as well. Could that be uh, a reason for delayed rate cuts for the rest of the year as well? Why not? Is, is Indian growth solely dependent on rate cuts? Probably not. It could be a small catalyst to probably nudge that growth. But if you look at, I mean, we've had Q4 is obviously results are underway. Q3 just went by. And um, <clears throat> the earnings were not so bad. I mean, I'm talking about the broader thing. Of course, there were sectors which were a little bit um, <clears throat> in the down. So I think, um, is that the sole reason that um, <clears throat> if it is, uh, if there is no rate cut, will go growth really suffer? Probably not. But yeah, it's a feel-good factor. You would love to see um, your EMI cost going down. All of that is not happening right now. Yep. But I think uh, that gratification will need to wait. Mm. Mm. Just uh, your take on the currency derivative rules back and forth. Now, that timeline has been pushed uh, from uh, April 5th. It had kicked in today to May 3rd. Uh, after a lot of concern from traders, etc., does this push to May 3rd give some reprieve? Uh, what do you make of the flip-flop in this entire case as far as the RBI's actions and communications are concerned? 
No, it does give some respite, no doubt about it. And also uh, the fact that, uh, you know, if there is uh, a larger, uh, you know, I would say investor interest at play, it just makes sense to probably take into cognizance all of those before you probably crystallize what you really want to do. So that mm -hmm. seems to be the way. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's a fair uh, practice which uh, the regulator has uh, actually done. But so it's, just, it's just postponing <coughs> the death knell of this entire category by a few weeks. Well, we don't know it's death knell or otherwise, but... Uh, you think it will survive if the volumes come down, the estimates volumes will come down? See, up to everything 70%. is relative, you know. Every time a regulation comes in, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, entities or skeptics who end up calling doomsday for the industry, whether it is, uh, you know, exit load going, uh, entry load going away from mutual funds yeah. or lock-ins coming or, you know, exit loads coming in for liquid funds. I think all of that, we've been there, done that. Um, it's par for the course. Uh, every regulatory change takes its time to acclimatize. So it's it's just about acclimatization. So yes, I'm not saying that there will be no impact, uh, but yeah, I mean, whoever said that regulations cannot have an impact. Hmm. Ashmi, uh, one word on uh, what happens uh, if indeed the inflation numbers, let's say crude is, uh, I'm kind of sticking back to inflation. Let's say crude uptake is transitory and it kind of cools off as well, but growth numbers at the same point of time continue to look strong. You think the bent should be towards uh, cutting rates if inflation allows it simply because one school of thought is why should we be happy with six and a half, seven? Why shouldn't we gun for more? That thought process is not completely incorrect, but I would just say that if the globe is not really supportive and we are now very well perched, uh, you know, as far as the foreign exchange reserves are concerned, we were at $640 billion September 2021. We're almost there at the same levels. Uh, why would you want to really distort the apple cart when things are going good? So that's the, I, I think, why would anyone want to kill the hen that lays the golden egg? So if things are going good, you're in a golden phase as far as growth is concerned. And just by cutting rates, is that going to accentuate additional, what's the delta? Yeah. I think that's the way one should really be thinking as a policymaker. I think one realization also has been the relatively high tolerance to higher interest rates in terms of economic growth. Right? That has now been seen over the last several quarters that it's not like there's been a big hamper to growth. So you're right, the, it, 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 Governor Das today and the policy committee is thinking that why should we rush on cutting rates, if at all. Yeah, yeah great. Lakshmi Ayer, thanks for putting all of this into perspective for us. A um, lot of ammo uh, to hear the RBI governor's speech and see what comes out of it. Uh, and look forward to have you uh, the Thank next time. You. Every, every, every time policy comes in, Lakshmi, you have to come in in the morning. It's just yeah, fantastic. We're just taking you for granted right now. No, no. I'm just trying to like put in pressure. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we are good at that. We'd love, we'd love to have you. Awesome. It's fabulous Perfect. to have Thank you. Thank you in the so morning. much. Thanks, Lakshmi. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that's the expert opinion on what to expect from uh, Governor Das and the MPC. The lineup for today. Uh, well, post policy, we'll of course hear Jayesh Mehta, VC and CEO of DSP Finance, Tanvi Gupta Jain, UBS India Economist, and Nitesh Gambhir of Access Bank uh, talking to us as well. Time for a quick break. Up next, uh, Agam Vakil, as usual, joins in to talk about the derivative setup and what you should expect from the FNO side, and in particular, some option strategies. I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy.
Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. gentleman who's uh, perhaps uh, going to move the markets, Governor Shakti Kanta Das, his statement watched very, very carefully. You know where to stay and come to live when you want to know what's happening in the monetary policy. We'll, of course, break it down for you at 10 o'clock. We can hope for those comments to begin. But uh, meanwhile, a quick look at the implied open before I get to Agam's take on what to expect on the FNO side of things. Yeah, we're looking like we're down for a bit of a negative start. We'll see how that holds, though. Agam, are you seeing those indications as well? Uh, actually, I wasn't because yesterday it turned out to be a good day of trade and there were a lot of uh, uh, well, levels that we had taken out, in fact. Uh, the real question is that if this implied open indicates, well, a, a negative opening, the, can we expect a recovery from there onwards? Uh, that's perhaps something that we will know in time. And, of course, the first hour of trade will also likely see consolidation because markets will await the, the rate decision where we are not expecting too much, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the commentary from the RBI governor as to what is in store. And that perhaps could eventually lead to some sort of reaction in the markets. That said, when it comes to well, markets yesterday, it was in fact a good day of trade. We started off at a life high, we came off substantially, and then eventually we covered back with the Nifty closing marginally in the green, where there was unwinding in the Nifty April futures. The Bank Nifty futures also saw a substantial amount of unwinding, but the Bank Nifty did move above the mark of 48,000 and, and closed above that. So that, of course, is another positive there. Now, in terms of the options market, we go into a new week, and I'm going to talk about the, the, the Nifty. Uh, well, here is where we saw a lot of traction around the 22,500, 22,600 calls as well as puts being written in terms of your overall open interest distribution picture. At the moment, we do see max OI in the 23,000 call on the higher end and the 22,500 put on the lower end. And that perhaps gives you an idea about the kind of range that uh, at least option writers are looking at as we move into trade this coming week. The range it seems has shifted higher for the Nifty. Uh, but let's move on and talk about stocks then. And we did see more longs coming through for IPCA. 
Kotak Mandar Bank advancing by around 1%, LIC Housing Finance, Bandhan Bank. And in terms of stocks, we saw unwinding. Uh, that list for you on your screen where we did see Hindustan Copper, Aisha Motors and Divi's Laboratory see some short covering coming through. But the real question is, how do you position yourself in these markets? Uh, well, let's get in an expert opinion. We have Akshay Bhagwat of GM Financial who's joining us on the show. Akshay, good morning. Thanks for joining in. Uh, let's start off with your view on the Nifty and the Bank Nifty. How would you trade them at the moment? Good morning, Agam. So for the Nifty index, uh, one thing which uh, comes to the mind is that the level of 22,520 and 22,540. If you roughly look at the last four days of action, new highs have been registered, but somewhere the prices are facing some resilience around the 22,525 mark. So this is a very important level if you are a day trader. Secondly, from the derivative data, if you were to look at the monthly open interest positioning for the Nifty index, 22,500 call still holds a significant chunk of open interest on the writing side. So clearly the resistance area is where the Nifty is currently dealing with. We need a clear breakout above the 22,550 level for things to settle or the bulls to go aggressive at the current juncture. Even if you were to look at the FIA data in the index futures in the last couple of days, there has been selling action from the FIA desk. So this just makes me believe that uh, with the global weakness uh, in the Dow Jones, the 10-year uh, US uh, yield around 4.3%, crude oil above 90, all these factors too would uh, put pressure on the Nifty for intraday trades. My sense is we might have a negative day of trade today. 22,550 is a massive resistance. A, a small, short, uh, long unwinding, if you see from the current juncture, can see the Nifty test 22,300 to 22,250 on the downside. So I would advise caution on long bets in the Nifty at the current juncture, especially if you are a day trader. Moving on to the bank index, uh, today it all eyes on the RBI policy, how it plays out. But again, if you were to look at the options data, we are dealing with a very crucial resistance, which is 48,000. A lot of call writing positioned at 48,000. Even the prices have a significant resistance area, roughly around 48,000 to 48,200 zone. So I would like 48,200 to be cleared off before I take a buy bet at the current juncture. I would be on a caution mode today, especially Nifty and Bank Nifty. I'm expecting a slight correction, especially in the Nifty index. Bank Nifty, if it crosses and sustains above 48,200, then that will be a buy bet. But if Bank Nifty corrects, expect 47.5 again on the lower side. So caution for both the indices, stay light at least as a day trader for uh, today's uh, session. All right. Akshay, let's talk about stocks then. I believe you have a spread that you're deploying on Asian paints. Yes. So Asian paints, uh, uh, you know, this would not have much to do with how the indices would play out. A strong base set up around the levels of 2850, uh, 2900. Yesterday was a strong momentum day for Asian paints and uh, this would be a beneficiary of the crude oil prices. So my sense is Asian paints is all set to move for targets of 3100 plus for the April series. You set a bull call spread by buying a 3000 call at 32 sell a 3100 call out of the money at around 14 and uh, this is a fixed loss strategy where your target potential is around 7500 and stop loss would be 4200 that's the trade i would recommend in asian paints well clearly on the max so we are looking at a higher profit as against uh, a max loss as far as this particular spread is concerned but actually you also have well what you're deploying uh, a, a naked strategy as far as infosys is concerned yes so if you look at the IT pack in the last couple of days, a lot of names uh, have done pretty well. Short covering bounce back uh, is noted in most of the IT names and Infosys specifically has not seen much of a move. Highly oversold stock uh, in oversold zone, also showing divergent indications on the short term charts, all set up for a short term pullback from the current trade. So my sense is that Infosys might be the bet you might consider in the current market scenario. I'm expecting targets of 1540 soon before the results, which is due on 18th of April for Infosys, the quarterly results. So I would play here with a, a vanilla call buying because here my risk would be limited to the premium I pay. I would go for buying a 1520 call at the premium of 30. I would target 54. That's my first target. Second target would be 71. And I will have a stop loss of 15 on this trade. Mm. All right, fair enough. Of course, sir. there you have it. Uh, a buy call on Infosys and well, a spread 
cup coming through for Asian paints towards the upside. We've spoken a lot about Asian paints of off late in any case. Akshay, on that note, taking a moment to thank you for joining us and taking us through your views on the markets as well as helping us with, uh, well, a handful of trading ideas. With that, it's back to you, Neeraj. Thanks, Agam, for that. Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, I just want to mention a word about Asian paints. Actually, two things. One, uh, that um, we, we discussed on the editor's cut yesterday, Tamanna. Mm. Uh, coincidental with the stock mood, of course. But the fact that after such a long time, the the Pat Kagger and the market cap Kagger are, are converging because until FY21 for seven years, Asian Paints market cap ran way ahead of the Pat growth. Mm. Some 24% uptick in Kagger performance for market cap or share price versus the Pat growth of 14%. Now it's about 16.5% Pat growth for the decade, Kagger, and the market cap growth is about 18%. So it's not completely off. Yeah. And at 40 times, uh, Asian Paints uh, multiples are the lowest in the last seven years. So fundamentally, uh, now people may not be able to as vociferously argue that Asian paints is maddeningly expensive, expensive mm. because it's a lot more reasonable. Uh, this is a valuation chart, um, and, and thank you for pulling that. The other thing is something that we may not be able to show here, but our colleague Chinmay showed it to me yesterday. If you look at the Asian paints five-year chart, somehow from every April, it tends to move up. I don't know if the five-year chart right now can show it, but yesterday when you look at, I mean, if you draw two trend lines around Asian Paints movements, from the month of April, I don't know if it's because of seasonality or otherwise. You think Asian summer paints, vacations may look paint karwate hain? Or maybe, I don't know, is there, maybe. is there any logic? Or uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind, no, maybe. Could be, right? Yeah, it's the it's right time to, uh, you know, redo at least the residence. Yeah, and, and, and look at that chart. So, Tamanna, I mean, this may show a rising trend line, but if you look at the last four years consolidation, you see those dips and the upticks that are happening. The upticks that are happening from every dip on the trend line mm. are happening around the month of April. Ah. We are in the month of April. Valuations are a lot more reasonable. Could this be the start of the uptick? I mean, Akshay was saying that technically things are looking strong. Mm. Could there be a seasonality impact plus the valuation impact? both aiding Asian paints. Plus, look at the overhang of what competition will do. Some of that seems to have receded. That, you know, there is uh, a player coming in, a large player coming in. Does that shake up Asian paints? And now the realization is setting. Maybe not really. It's yeah. going to take at least, I think at last count, what a lot of analysts have been telling us, at least a couple of years for a, even a number two to cement their position, if at all. So, yeah. Interesting uh, to talk about uh, Asian paints, but I would say uh, that um, the one sector which is going to be in focus today is going to be uh, the financial space. The business updates have been mind-boggling. At least uh, brokerage notes are very excited. It's not just HDFC and Bajaj Finance, but a whole slew of them. Harsh is joining us with details. Now, Harsh, before you get into those individual numbers, this is traditionally a strong quarter, isn't it? And that has to be kept in mind? Yes, absolutely, Tamanna. But nonetheless, despite it being a strong quarter, it's quite a beat when it comes to the overall expectations that analysts had with regard to credit growth. Uh, either it seems to be, the commentary seems to be coming in that it's sustaining, which is also good, which is largely in line, or it's a beat. So that's where the positivity really comes from. Uh, when it comes to, I'll start moving to individual names, when it comes to uh, Bajaj Finance, fourth consecutive quarter of 30 plus percent year on year AUM growth despite a growing base. So honestly, some of those growth concerns which were there a few quarters ago seems to be receding. Uh, strong growth continues and this is despite the fact that two of its products have been uh, kept in abeyance or uh, they're not allowed to distribute those products uh, basis RBI restrictions. And therefore, this is a big positive, 6% uptick with regard to the sequence, 6% plus, in fact, on a sequential basis. So very, very strong growth. 3.3 lakh crore now is uh, the AUM size. Even in case of customer count, 4% sequential on customers, 21% year over year. So customers also seem to be growing uh, in, in a good pace. The only piece which is possibly new or different is the new loans book that has come off. But 
it's also likely that they're doing higher ticket size loans which they've spoken about in the last quarter of course need to wait and watch the commentary as to what is happening there but new loans books seem to have come off partly also due to restrictions placed by the RBI liquidity buffers improved deposits also uh, reinforced so that growth continues last three quarters very strong growth continues in Q4 I'll move on to Indusind Bank again net advances growth of roughly 18 plus percent on the lower end of the band that they've guided for so uh, decent growth there deposit growth also at 4.3 percent uh, your LDR now inching towards 90 percent so deposit growth in line largely but LDR inching towards 90 percent is something that uh, will push us into grow deposits uh, going forward Bandhan Bank very strong growth numbers advances 11 percent sequential deposits 15 percent sequential uh, those are some very very strong numbers Casa 18% sequential so Casa ratio improving as well uh, this one needs to be watched out for especially in trade today uh, we have a Nomura note coming in 275 being the target price on this one very strong uh, ESAF small finance bank that one too extremely strong 10% on advances uh, 5 odd percent on deposits uh, the LDR seems to have shrunk but uh, the, that growth is uh, quite strong nonetheless and this is sequential numbers uh, uh, which I just mentioned last off I want to mention Avas financiers again good numbers disbursement growth seems to have come back 39% sequential growth in disbursements uh, it seems to have come back well uh, AUM growth continues 22% on the AUM growth front you are seeing gross stage 3 which is improved sequentially by 14 bips or thereabouts so asset quality will get better and likely your provisioning will come off as well so uh, lots of important metrics all of which are coming out all right, thank you for that, Harsh. Uh, meanwhile, I'm looking at the Purvankara updates. Highest ever financial year sales up 90% year on year. Uh, we'll wait for the details. Highest ever quarterly sales in Q4 at 93% year on year on Purvankara. Macrotech also flashed uh, a, a few minutes uh, earlier. Yeah, 40% uptake there too. Yeah. For Macrotech. In for Purvankara's case, it's a bit of a push back because Q3 was bad, yeah. but 90% so is strong Q4. Yeah, we, we'll have to see the details and obviously we'll yeah. know that, but uh, yeah, considering that uh, reality, a, a lot of people thought ki bas ho gaya, na? I mean, how much is there more upside, etc. The numbers yeah. are looking good. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Yeah. Sunny Agarwal, head of fundamental equity research, SBI cap with us on the show today. Kush Bora, founder Kushbora.com with us as well. Welcome to both of you. Very good morning. Kush, let me start with you. Uh, exciting day ahead. Global queues are negative, but what are the charts telling us? Hi, Tamanna. Very good morning to you. Uh, hi, Sunny. Well, uh, you know, it's a very interesting uh, setup. Uh, we have a view of 20 to 500 and 20 to 800, you know, on the Nifty 20 to 500 is here. But just for discussion sake, if I take out yesterday's move, what's interesting is that from December, you know, some of the momentum indicators are showing a negative divergence, you know, which is suggesting that even though the index is, you know, moving up, inching higher, uh, making new highs, the momentum is just not catching up. Now, typically what this suggests is that, you know, if there isn't a follow through, then you know we could be into you know a bit of a consolidation mode perhaps even some profit booking for now the kind of uh, buy on dip strategy uh, you know that we've been seeing has been working in the markets and i think we'll continue to do so 20 to 800 is uh, you know a near term uh, target on the nifty but i don't think you know we'll perhaps you know make that in a dash perhaps there will be some hiccups along the way and you know this buy on dip strategy will continue to work but i will look for any kind of confirmation whether this a negative divergence uh, you know does indeed sort of play out so if you break below the 20 to 200 mark would be one trigger to just be a little cautious on the index but up until then 20 to 800 is our uh, near term target and we will continue to uh, you know deploy the buy on this kind of strategy on the nifty at least okay um q4 updates looking strong sunny agarwal with us as well sunny good morning thanks for joining in uh, what have you made of um, the financials in particular, because Harsh was just talking about those, uh, almost almost every bank or NBFC seems to be delivering very strong numbers and this was not unexpected. Would this cause, quote unquote, a re-rating? Would this cause some buying into any of the financials that you may have noticed? Yeah, good morning, Neeraj. Good morning, Tamanna and Push. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, definitely a very strong set of number from uh, provisional number from all the banks and NBFC. And uh, that's replicating the systemic growth 
So if we track the uh, monthly data of the uh, credit growth number, so anyway, that number is hovering in the range of uh, 14 to 16% for the system, and that is getting reflected across the board. Uh, if I have to uh, pick one uh, uh, thing out of this, I mean, uh, one is the Suryodo Finance uh, is, uh, Bank, wherein uh, they have reported a very solid set of numbers. So YOI uh, credit growth was close to 41%, and Q1Q growth was 14% although a small size bank and if you look at deposit growth that was close to 50 percent year over year and 20 percent q on q so i think that and at the same time trading at close to 1.1 time price to book so this is the one uh, uh, bank which i find uh, i mean a clear outlier in terms of growth as well as uh, there is a lot of comfort on valuation trading close to 1.1 time price to book so this is the uh, one of my pick on NBFC side, I would like to go ahead with Punawala Finko. Uh, again, uh, reported a very strong set of number, a uh, provisional number. So, Q YOI growth of 54% and Q1Q growth of 13% as far as advances are concerned. And uh, uh, what I feel is that uh, uh, this is one of the, uh, I mean, best performing NBFC uh, 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 in the current scenario. Uh, if I move to a larger size uh, uh, bank, so then I would like to stick with an uh, uh, Indusind Bank. Again, uh, uh, delivered a very solid set of number, uh, provisional number for uh, this uh, uh, quarter. Uh, having said that, the general concern on the bank uh, banking side is uh, when will deposit growth pick up. So right now, most of the banks are lagging on deposit growth. So to, uh, to that extent, we may see some pressure on NIM uh, continuing in the fourth quarter. But having said that, I think that should bottom out uh, uh, during the uh, fourth quarter. And then, then FI25 is the year where we will see a, a, a stabilization as far as NIM is concerned. Uh, the only concern in FI25 going forward is the asset quality. So till now, asset quality has been uh, very rock solid for uh, entire BFSI uh, uh, sector. Uh, so going into FI25, whether the uh, asset quality will be maintained, that is to be seen uh, as we move ahead. Having said that, uh, today's commentary from uh, uh, Honorable Governor, RBI Governor, that will be very important, especially uh, taking into account mm -hmm. the recent in the crude oil prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so, his commentary on inflation and outlook on uh, uh, sure. rate cut will be important parameter to be tracked. Point well taken. Kush, before we get your ideas, anything on this financial side that looks very good for a trade. The ADR was HDFC Bank ADR, so I'm calling the ADR because that is the biggest contributor. But the HDFC Bank ADR was doing very well yesterday too. Any financials that you would trade? So, nearest repetition is not a bad thing if it does end up making you money, right? HDFC Bank is a trade that you know we've been suggesting for some time now. Uh, 1380, 1400 were the levels. Even now, I don't think uh, you know anyone's missed the boat. Uh, from a positional standpoint, you know, of course, you know, 1700 plus kind of levels are very much, you know, in play. But even from a trading perspective, if you look at, you know, some of the options data and the technical setup, I think from a near term perspective also, 1560 is a very realistic target that, you know, one can look at. So HDFC Bank is something that I have on my radar. Any kind of tips, I will uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, accumulate more. What levels would you be comfortable accumulating, uh, Kush? Uh, Morgan Stanley, for example, has a target price of 1900 today on HDFC. When you say dips, you might not get an opportunity. Our viewers might not get an opportunity for a bit. So what would you do today? Well, uh, Tamana, I mean, uh, everyone got that one for the longest time. I mean, it was hovering around those 1400 levels for a yeah. long time. And everyone thought, you know, it's a done and dusted kind of a trade. Uh, perhaps, you know, no one touched, wanted to touch at least the fresh allocations with the bar pool also. So I think even now, if you look at, uh, you know, from the target perspective and just the regaining of the lost ground, even then, I think there is, you know, this is a good entry point. But, uh, you know, considering that it's run up just in the recent past, I think 1475, 1480 would be a good zone to perhaps consider it, at least from a trading perspective. From an investment perspective, it's, it's a good idea to start uh, accumulating here if you haven't done it already. You know, Kush has that I told you so smile this morning when he's talking about HDFC Bank. But uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to have more of those moments by asking you what are your picks for the day? Well, Tamanna, I mean, on a lighter note, I... I did tell you so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why. That's why I can recognize that smile. So what are your picks uh, for the day? A couple of them, uh, both of them incidentally from the cash segment. Uh, one of them is Park, uh, Sun Pharma Advanced Research. The stock shown phenomenal uh, recovery, uh, close to completing what we call a rounding uh, bottom formation. Uh, I know the stock was locked in upper circuit yesterday, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, could be the case today also, but even thereafter, we uh, you know we have a target of four 
thirty and four fifty on Sun Pharma advanced research. Uh, advanced research. C ninety five is where I would place my stop loss. The other stock which is attempting a revival has shown uh, you know a fair degree of it already is HBL Power. Big move day before yesterday. Some consolidation with a positive bias yesterday. So HBL Power is also a buy for us. Uh, five thirty five 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 are the near term targets. Four seventy five is where I would place my stop loss. Uh huh. Okay, just just highlight both of those calls because uh, remember, I mean, Spark is still a, a, a well-known, well-entrenched engine. Well, Part Two is well-known, of course, but just the cash market trades. So Spark, the target is 430. Remember, had a big move. Uh, don't quite know what happens today, but had a big move yesterday. And HBL Par is the other one, and the target price is at 555. Um, watch out for that one, 496 and counting. Okay, so we've discussed financials. We've discussed some stock ideas. Let's discuss the bad news as well. And Sunny, want to come to you on consumption because Dabur's numbers and the commentary yesterday left a bit to be desired. Today we're seeing some notes from one of your peers uh, and, and, and cities saying that uh, on consumption items like maybe a Bata, maybe a Page Industries, the competitive intensity would lead to much lower earnings than otherwise estimated. uh what's your sense on consumption stocks uh from here on for the next one month would you if you had them in your portfolio would you swap them for better ideas and which ones are you negative on if you are negative on uh so yeah niraj i think the uh, within the consumption sector sepal is a sector uh, a sub sector which is uh, uh, likely to deliver a kind of mid single digit or high single digit kind of growth and that the commentary that was uh, uh Uh, that was from the HUL also during the December quarter, and as we see that Dabur provisional number, it seems that that is panning out to be uh, uh, on the similar trajectory, low single digit to kind of uh, uh, high single digit kind of growth, and all these companies trading at north of 50x the price to earning multiple. I think uh, uh, so. I would like to stay away from consumer staple at a current juncture, and better bet my money uh, basically on the two uh, theme uh, from a short term perspective, one or two months. So one is the summer portfolio. So recently we have recommended some stocks uh, in the summer portfolio to our client. Uh, if you want to ride on a short term move, so companies like Blue Star, V Guard, uh, uh, Wonderla. So these are the few companies or power companies for that matter, Tata Power. So these are the few companies which one can uh, add uh, as far as consumption sector is concerned. And in uh, uh, addition to that, consumer discretionary is the sector which uh, wherein I feel the numbers continue to be robust. So Kalyan Jeweller has reported a very robust set of uh, provisional updates. I think that uh, 38, uh, 34% uh, uh, consolidated revenue growth for fourth quarter, uh, and India operations growing at 38%. So I think uh, it's a clear-cut K-shaped recovery which we are seeing in the economy, and the consumer discretionary is the place to be in if somebody wants to be uh, in the consumption space. Certainly, watch out for some of these consumption names and Kalyan, Kalyan in particular on the on the other side, on on, on the right side because I think they've delivered. uh the provisional update seems to be very strong kalyan macrotech purvankar it seems to be a day when you're releasing provisional numbers then they are turning out to be good thus far <laughs> we take a break uh, of course the rbi policy stated for 10 am and then the post policy conversation with a clutch of experts so do keep an eye out for those as well but we'll be back from a break in just moments from now um and try and take forward the trade conversation I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry a IT services 3.0 if you will come up around building for ai the idea is that your jo-
Back with India Market Open right here on NETV Profit. Pull up the implied open to just give you a sense of what is it that we are likely to do today. A bit of red for sure. Whether it stays here or does it extend itself remains to be seen. Remember, we are still vulnerable to higher crude prices. Maybe not as vulnerable as we used to be uh, 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago, but we're still vulnerable. And sentiment-wise, the higher crude price would bring about some bit of an impact. That the global markets are also weak only adds to the stress. So we'll have a down day today, or at least a start which will be weak today for sure. Fundamentally, I just wanted to point out, maybe sentimentally for the market, a $90 doesn't spook you as much. But fundamentally, India is still as vulnerable to higher crude prices than we yeah. always were. Yeah. We want to move the needle, but that's a plan in the future. As of today, 1995... No, relative to 10 chains. years ago, much better off. Uh, forex reserves, uh, the alternate fuels, We can et afford it. We yes, can afford precisely. it, but it still costs us more. Most certainly. So, so that then is is not a very great thing. All right, uh, let's see your pre-open rates. We'll give it a couple of minutes to settle down. Uh, not very clear cues right now, but remember, uh, we were set for a negative day. All of Asia has uh, had a tough morning. Nikkei is, is down 900 points at one point but remember in india we have been bucking the trend uh, in in a way as well just hdfc bank in the first few uh, seconds and if we could look at what's happening there three and a half percent once again in the pre-open rates sriram finance doing very well it's a day for the financials icsa bank about one and a half percent odd banks and it has been the theme and wipro is not doing too badly this morning as well of course we'll wait for that to um, settle down. I want to look at what BAF is doing, which is what is Bajaj Finance, Bajaj Finserve doing um, this morning because uh, we've been talking about that as well. Not too much of an action right now, but again, we'll wait for some of those rates to settle. Let me go back to Kush Bora and Sunny Agarwal. Uh, Kush, you spoke about HDFC Bank. What about Bajaj Finance? Um, some very lofty target prices have been floating around this morning from several brokerages. What would be your own sort of number? So, uh, I'm, I'm a little divided here, uh, purely for the fact that, you know, this, of course, has been the darling for the markets for a very long time, but then you know, there has been that brief period where uh, and it was beaten down. The revival has been very sharp, and that actually is a cause of a concern for me. Had this been a more gradual, steady kind of a revival, perhaps, you know, the conviction on this rally would have been higher. But this has been a very sharp, vertical uh, kind of an up move. And if you see it's hovering around the 200-day moving average now, I mean, just above that, uh, but if I draw a trend line, it's still below that. And you know, that level comes in at about 7,400 uh, 7, or a little higher, but to round it off 7,400. So for me, any kind of positional conviction that comes on this uh, will be uh, when it crosses and sustains 7,400. Then perhaps, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, 7,750 as the first target and then perhaps even 8,000. But up until then, I will be a little skeptical. I will, I will be a little watchful. And purely because in the past, we've seen such big moves where the stock's actually uh, risen anywhere from, you know, 15, 20, 15 to 20% and then given way. So uh, while this is, uh, you know, an encouraging move for existing investors, uh, I will hold back my, uh, uh, you know, buying spree till the level of 7,400 is taken out. Mm, absolutely. So Bajaj Finance, you're a bit divided on. Sunny, I want to understand whether you're as enthused about uh, the AUM growth figures as uh, you know analysts seem to be, as far as Bajaj Finance is concerned. I think you're on mute, Sunny. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I think the numbers continue to be robust. Uh, so I think 30% uh, plus kind of growth which uh, we have seen on the Bajaj Finance. So uh, the only concern right now is because of the restriction by RBI on uh, basically cards uh, loan. So we have seen uh, uh, some decline in the new uh, loan origination number. But having said that, I think uh, I would like to maintain a neutral view as far as Bajaj Finance is concerned because uh, 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 healthy growth is backed by the very expensive valuation also. But right now, I would like to maintain a neutral view as far as Bajaj Finance is concerned. Mm. Okay. Well, um... That's uh, uh, on on financials, and let's. Uh, I, I think in about three four minutes we'll get the final rates as well. Um, you know, Soba left a bit to be desired. So real estate today has a chalk and cheese kind of a performance. I would reckon that Soba has done this only because of the spillover. But Macro Tech and Purvankara, very strong numbers out there from both. Now, Sunny Agarwal, 
When you look at these Q4 updates, wherein Purvangara does a 90%, but it might be an aberration and a spillover from the previous quarter, but a macro tech also delivers those numbers. A Soba, uh, the pre sales at 1500 crores is flat, but maybe the next quarter sees some upticks. Are you still constructive on real estate or now are you booking profits there? No, again, uh, Neeraj, so we have been seeing a very strong set of numbers from all the real estate companies since last uh, three to four quarters. And I think the momentum has continued, seems to be uh, continuing in the March quarter also. Uh, but having said that, what I feel is that uh, now one need to be a uh, uh, stock picker as far as real estate stock is concerned because we have seen a massive up move also in the entire real estate basket. So I would like to go ahead uh, uh, with the companies where the balance sheet strength is very robust. So companies like Oberoi Realty or for that matter Phoenix Meals where it is a, uh, the portfolio is skewed towards the commercial rental as well as it's a, a story on uh, urban consumption. At the same time, companies like Century Textile, which is backed by the Birla Group, venturing into the uh, uh, a new territory. So these are the few companies where I would like to uh, bet my money rather than betting on the uh, every stock uh, in the real estate basket. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair call. Stock pickers market real estate after the rising tide has lifted all the boats. Be very specific is what Sunny is saying. We'll talk to Kush about some of these as well, but it's 9.05. So usually the time when we get you some key brokerage notes for the morning. Bajaj Finance and Dabur are in focus. Uh, Harsh, uh, tell us what are you gleaning? Well, yes, uh, Jeffrey is on Bajaj Finance. Extremely positive, 9400 being the target price. Uh, it's a... It's their top pick in the NBFC space uh, and, and what they are suggesting is that loan growth continues to be extremely robust for Bajaj Finance. Uh, Pre-quarter update shows that uh, growth in customer base also remains healthy is what they are suggesting. Now interesting piece uh, from the city note that I read with regard to Bajaj Finance itself. What they are suggesting is uh, bank borrowing has gotten expensive for Bajaj Finance and therefore you might see a, around 10 basis point decrease on the margin count but outside of that the update is very strong they are expecting 4.3% on the ROA front to, um, uh, more than 20% on the ROE front uh, and they believe that uh, remedial measures with regard to RBI curbs put uh, will be something that will be monitored by the street as well but outside of that they are also quite bullish on Bajaj Finance uh, nearly a 9,000 rupee target price even by city so uh, that's one interesting uh, note which came through the other one was uh, you know with regard to Dabur. Uh, now, uh, you know, uh, City reiterates a sell on Dabur. Target price has been revised downwards to 500 from 520. They believe that the Q4 update uh, is is pointing to a weaker set of numbers than expected. Uh, profitability below estimates expected. EBITDA also below estimates. Margins also below estimates expected. They believe that inferior category mix is what is possibly impacting at least the margin number as well as the overall Q4 numbers. Business has increased but uh, volumes remain soft and uh, that is something that they are concerned about. Uh, they've obviously maintained their sell rating, target price 500 revised from 520. Okay, well, <coughs> Dabur is interesting, um, Bajaj Finance is interesting. And I dare say I'll watch out for, as the pre open rates are settling down, want to see if there is any kind of negative reaction to those city notes on Page Industries and Bata, because those are the other two that looked uh, interesting because they've come out and opened a negative catalyst watch on both Page Industries with a target price of 31,000 and on Bata with a target price of 1,000. Now, that's a substantial, substantial downtick uh, from the current market price for a Bata as well. So, pretty interesting to see. Um, how it goes here. But um, Kush, a technical view though, on, on, on some of these consumption names, Harsh was talking about uh, the brokerage view on Dabur. Sunny spoke about his thoughts. The stock was down 4.5% yesterday. Can it slide further? In all likelihood, uh, Neeraj, because, you know, the support zone is at around those, you know, 500, 5 levels. Uh, you know, it's actually tried a couple of times to rebound from there. And in technicals, what we you know, often see is that if the stock is knocking at the doors of a particular level, you know, either on the upside or the down, then it eventually does break it. So there is a possibility, you know, that we could be looking at uh, even 480 kind of levels positionally, you know, on Dabur. Hasn't really done uh, much in the last uh, few years, if I can, uh, you know, um, say that. So I think positionally, uh, 480 is perhaps uh, you know a more uh, convincing level. Uh, 505 is a near-term uh, uh, you know support zone, but I think that should perhaps be uh, you know taken out. Yeah, 
Um, you know, let's let's come to some of those uh, real estate names also that Neeraj was talking about. Uh, Sobha, uh, not great apps as you know updates, but Prestige on the other side has uh, announced uh, the acquisition of a property in Whitefield, free market. That stock is about three percent up. Uh, Purvankara, Macrotech, all of them have had. Uh, on the face of it, good business updates. Purvankara up 5% uh, pre-market as well. Macrotech not looking too bad. Uh, Sunny, anything that you would um, you know, start fresh buys in? So uh, basically, uh, you are recommending to, uh, referring to only real estate sector or entire uh, market? Real estate, real estate. Yeah, so within real estate, I discussed, so again, my topic there will be uh, Century Textile, although uh, provisional updates are not there. Uh, so uh, I feel uh, uh, that that is a company that is likely to do well uh, over the period of next uh, two to three years. At the same time, I would like to bet my money on Phoenix Mill, uh, which is a play on urban consumption story. Uh, so there we are seeing a, a very rapid expansion as far as, as, far as new uh, area is concerned so phoenix mill is uh, one of the pick which i would like to write through discretionary uh, consumption and one one stock pick which is again a mumbai based real estate player that is nesco which is again a play on basically mice event wherein uh, we are seeing a lot of uptake in the exhibitions which have happened over the period of uh, uh, last uh, three to four quarters so i think nesco is uh, one of my uh, pick as far as real estate sector mm. Kush, uh, any you know views or comments on any of these names that we've talked about, especially Purvankara seems to be doing pretty well, and let's see how it opens though. But uh, what would be your play on this counter and others in the space? Just on Purvankara, I mean the stock's uh, staging uh, you know a neat rebound, so there is a possibility that you know this momentum you know could well continue. The two stocks that I like from this space, uh, you know one of them is Prestige. Uh, there was a brief uh, you know period where the stock dip but the recovery has been equally sharp and equally encouraging so prestige for sure and one rather lesser uh, discussed stock which i think i've mentioned you know once or twice on uh, you know on on your show as well which is sriram properties this stock too uh, you know has you know pretty solid structure the recovery here too has been you know very smart uh, relatively smaller ticket size so i think from a near term perspective you know 140 is a very convincing level and beyond that also I'll continue to hold true so prestige and sriram properties are the two stocks that i have on my radar all right, uh, Prestige and Sriram Properties. But the other space, uh, you know, that I wanted to see how it's doing. And uh, Sunny, what would you reckon in terms of any impact you'd see? Crude at 90, we've been talking about how much it matters, in a sense, to India as an economy. But in terms of stock specifics, you had a bit of a hit on ONGC, um, IOC, all of those counters, the HPCLs, BPCLs of the world were also... Uh, you know, reeling yesterday. Uh, would you have a call today at all? So yeah, definitely Tamanna. So I would like to avoid the, all the oil marketing companies and the reason being uh, uh, very simple that with the crude oil trading at $90 and with the, uh, we all know that for the next two months, uh, there is no uh, very less likelihood of the, in fact, 100% uh, chance that there is no uh, change in the retail fuel prices. So I think the uh, marketing margins uh, for all these companies will come under pressure. And at the same time, uh, we have seen uh, uh, a big downtick as far as Singapore GRM is concerned. So I think the both the division will come under pressure as far as June quarter is concerned for oil marketing companies. And uh, positive for uh, upstream companies like ONGC and Oil India. At the same time, uh, what I feel is that uh, 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 high crude oil prices will have impact on FMCG because uh, we all know that uh, palm oil prices are also trading at a multi-year high. Uh, so FMCG companies like HUL, Dabar, uh, there we may see some uh, 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 increase in uh, throughput cost and that can, uh, hence there also we can see some margin pressure. Cement companies, uh, although uh, uh, slightly cushioned because of the no change in uh, uh, basically uh, fuel, retail fuel prices for next two months. But whenever uh, once the elections are over, we may see uh, in case the crude oil price sustain at $90, then we may see some uh, sharp uptick as far as retail fuel prices are concerned. And to that extent, we may see some uh, pressure as far as uh, cement uh, uh, companies' margins are concerned. Mm. Uh, Kush, very quick call on Hero. Hero Moto down about 1% in uh, pre-open. Um, not sure if there's any clear trigger, but there was a tax notice of about 600 odd crore rupees, which was reported yesterday. Uh, do you like it on the charts at all, or what would you recommend? 
no i'd wait for the level of you know 44 uh, 44 40 uh, a strong support zone there if that gets taken out then it could slide further so definitely a wait and watch on this one hmm okay uh, kush <clears throat> we have maybe 30 seconds if i had to press you for one top call now that the pre open rates have settled park uh, sun pharma advanced research okay so let's pull up sun pharma advanced research if we can here okay we have it on the screen 1.45% higher uh, that's kush bora's top call i think the target price uh, was uh, well th- this uptick today takes it a few points closer to the target price of 430 was it maybe we'll check with him post the market start about whether it's uh, good to buy even now uh, not bad let's wait and watch how it shapes up uh, but here's how the markets are starting off this morning it's a friday it's the rbi policy day and ahead of that uh, the global queues aren't exactly the strongest uh, indian markets though a lot better well maybe maybe you not around those points only 60 65 points we were indicating about 72 odd points so you not around those uh, the banks maybe a bit better behaved but largely in line i would reckon most sectors would be following those queues individual names could be doing well small caps have recently been outperforming for the month of april thus far too uh, doing okay flattish start versus about a third of a percent for the index get the heat map up on the screen we'll also take a check at the market breadth a bit later on but a lot of red which points to maybe not too many stocks correcting in bajaj finance case it may well be the customer edition number which was a disappointment leading to this downtick bpcl we all know the reason why hero moto corp is down tamanna was talking about that notice maybe that is impacting there is a little bit of corrective move that is coming in in lnt hindalco and aisher so two wheeler companies are certainly under a bit of pain in session today hero bajaj and aisher all three are down in trade wonder if tvs also might be down we'll check that a bit later nestle is up in the green well <coughs> I don't know if it's the 8 year old case getting quashed leading to this uptick for Maggi but Nestle is up in the green Shriram Finance marginal in the green NTPC and HDFC Bank after having two strong days starts off in the positive yet again Reliance is in the green as well upstream oil likely should do well ONGC the top loser yesterday is flattish and marginal in the green so that's the other piece to monitor so keep in mind all of these but two wheeler stocks tamanna certainly seem to be down in trade today oil marketing companies seem to be down in trade today and bajaj finance from the larger boys the one which has given out the update is is sulking a bit yeah that's that's interesting because uh, so much of uh, you know cheer for bajaj finances updates but uh, yeah yeah completely a closer look is warranted uh, on it and uh, maybe two wheeler seeing an uh, an overhang of consistently high interest rates is it starting to impact Uh, nevertheless uh, as tepid as this may seem there are a lot of uh, stars this morning as well i want to pull up avas financiers um, uh, indus in bank bandhan and esaf small finance bank so this is all about the business updates avas is doing well four and a half percent up indus in bank again same like good business updates and a lot of cheer over there but the street uh, seems indifferent so to speak let's see what bandhan is doing and uh, as well as the esap small finance bank esap small finance bank is okay just but 1.5 2% up bandha not so great this morning again uh, business updates for some of the reality stocks that we've been discussing all morning so macrotech purvankara are the ones uh, which uh, purvankara definitely great numbers 90% plus um on uh, you know sales etc for the year macrotech are also decent 40% plus numbers on pre sales but stock about 1% up i reckon there is selling pressure in the market today and that nervousness is being seen which we can also see globally and ahead perhaps of the monetary policy voltas is another one that we should quickly look and see what's happening uh, hsbc maintained a buy for 1350 So yeah the stock is pretty bullish of course the hot summer that we're all expecting the heat wave may help a counter like Voltas as well so these are few of those which are um, responding this morning but overall anirudh i think there is a sense of nervousness isn't it yeah uh, a, a bit of that for sure um, but certainly some stocks deserve mention before we get back to our guests so tamanna's mark prestige i'm sure but that's um, really for my mind at one of my, in, including mahindra life 
uh, stock which is standing out. And the shipyard stocks, uh, Cochin Shipyard is up 3% yet again, so very strong show by that one. Yeah, Mazgon Dock is up about a couple of percentage points too. I don't know if it's got the defense element to it or otherwise, but uh, clearly, clearly, those stocks the last few days have actually done very well for themselves and continue to do well. So that's the other point. I wonder if uh, ESAB Small Finance Bank and Rashi Peripherals uh, bring up those two stocks. ESAB not, not, ESAB not too much, 1.52% higher, so nothing too great. Rashi Peripherals, 5% upper circuit. Um, not surprising there. Angel One continues to sulk though and Soba sulks as well. HPCL, BPCL continuing to be under pressure. Okay. Um, uh, Sunny, um, rather, uh, Kush first, opening thoughts to you. Um, also an update, uh, you'd still go out and buy that Spark call? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, fairly, uh, even if there was, you know, a slight dip and, you know, it opened, you know, in the red, I would uh, perhaps, you know, still go out and buy. Uh, 430 and 450 are the targets and, you know, we do maintain those. Mm, absolutely. So Spark still remains there. Um, Sunny, uh, just uh, to get a sense of what you are spotting and what you're finding interesting today as well, I thought that Nestle run-up uh, was, uh, you know, one to note. Not too much of an impact. It is an eight-year-old case and finally dismissed. But uh, do you see a further upside in a Nestle, a Darbar as well? Uh, no, Taman Nako, I would like to stay away from, uh, I mean, consumer staple. Uh, uh, if I have to uh, bet on one company, I think that will be Tata Consumer. Uh, because, uh, again, there we are seeing uh, both organic as well as inorganic growth opportunity. Uh, so that's the one company which I would like to bet my money on uh, uh, in the consumer staple segment. Now, one company which I am uh, finding very interesting is Mahindra and Mahindra. So after a long time, we have seen uh, stock price uh, crossing 2000 levels yesterday. And again, backed by the uh, very robust order book, uh, uh, so standalone business, uh, uh, especially passenger vehicle SUV portfolio continue to do well. Uh, tractor business, which was under uh, pressure uh, during uh, FI24, is likely to do well on the expectation of good monsoon, upcoming monsoon. So I think both the cylinders will fire for Mahindra and Mahindra. And I feel on valuation front also uh, trading at a relatively cheaper valuation. So I feel the fair value of the business is close to 2300 rupees. Uh, so, if somebody wants to bet money for three to six months, I think Mahindra and Mahindra is the uh, place to be. Okay, Mahindra and Mahindra is looking good. Uh, IT stocks under pressure today, turning after two good days of gains. Uh, Nifty IT down about a, a percentage uh, point on open. And let's just pull up the internals to see what's happening there and where uh, the most pain uh, is really coming. But, um, uh, you know, IT is definitely one space. So, as an angel one, their um, uh, client edition numbers were disappointing and that's why you saw an angel one crack that was end of trade yesterday as well on all of these set of uh, counters sunny and i'll come to you on this whether it's an angel one whether it's a cam whether it's a bsc um you know they've had their great run do you see something sustaining there uh, so, uh, Tamanna, I think uh, the entire uh, capital market as a story is uh, still very young. Uh, and if somebody takes a slightly longer horizon, three to five years, I think there is a long runway of growth for this entire uh, capital market story, whether it is wealth managers, brokers, exchanges, or RTAs. Uh, I think uh, uh, from 4 crore uh, uh, DMAT account in 2020, now we are at close to 14, 15 crore. And I think this number is growing uh, every month. At the same time, on mutual fund uh, front, we are seeing uh, a record high SIP inflow, uh, AUM uh, crossing 50 lakh crore number. So I think the entire this uh, uh, capital market story is still young and uh, we may see some volatility in between short term uh, uh, up move or down, down tick uh, due to some uh, short term data. But uh, uh, one has to uh, uh, take a slightly longer uh, view over here. And I think uh, one should stay remain invested uh, in all these uh, names uh, from a long-term perspective. Mm. Uh, just your take, Kush, on an angel one. Well, you know, there was promise in this rally, uh, mm. but I think, uh, you know, the kind of uh, move that we're seeing today will perhaps, uh, you know, bring it into that consolidation zone. But I don't see too much of a negative here. Uh, you know, any dip towards those 28, 50 kind of levels might just turn out to be a buying opportunity. So on the whole, constructive. But you know this could this could well just be the profit booking uh, you know after the news that's just come out. So twenty eight fifty is an accumulation zone for, zone for me on Angel Angel One. Okay. Sunny, um, the last few days we've seen a few notes come out on chemicals. Uh, this morning I've seen an HDFC note 
on CDMO players, I've seen a Spark Capital Note which speaks about how some of the things might be turning around the corner uh, uh, as well. I'm trying to think, have you guys done some work on whether uh, specific buckets of chemicals uh, could, could fundamentally be strong to buy? Uh, again, uh, Neeraj, what I feel is that uh, uh, chemical as a sector, uh, uh, I feel it's just still a quarter or two away where we may see a uh, 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 commentary turning positive. Uh, so due to some global events, uh, uh, some uh, subsector of the chemical prices may shoot up and to that extent we may see a short term reaction in the uh, chemical company. But if somebody uh, want to uh, create a sustainable uh, value in a chemical as a sector, so I feel the companies where we have seen a uh, recent completion of the CAPEX, so companies like, uh, uh, example, Deepak Fertilizer. So there we have seen an ammonia plant uh, uh, basically getting commission. And uh, in case the monsoon is normal uh, uh, during the uh, June to September quarter, so we may see a normalization in the entire chemical uh, uh, basket and uh, Deepak Fertilizer can be a good bet on agrochemical as a space. Similarly, PI industry continue to do well despite of the concern that China is uh, uh, dumping. So I think uh, these are the few names uh, where, where one can ride on chemical. Uh, overall, uh, chemical as a basket, I still feel it's a two-quarter away uh, story uh, where we may see a conviction as far as earning upgrades are concerned. All right, just to look at what metal stocks are doing this morning, and you're seeing uh, some pressure there uh, on, on a Hindalco as uh, well as, uh, you know, JSW Steel, Hindustan Copper. In fact, uh, the Nifty Metal also lagging. And uh, yes, that's that's one commodity cycle which is showing quite a bit of volatility. Sunny, um, what would you do with the Hindalco right now? Uh, so, uh, again, uh, uh, I would clearly track the metal prices. And right now, we have seen a big bump up in copper as well as aluminum price uh, during the last one month. So, I would like to go, uh, I, I would be bullish on Hindalco as well as Nalco uh, among the aluminum space. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, both of you, thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us. Time to slip into a short break, but stay tuned. We have the management of Anupam Rasayan since we are talking about chemicals and chemistry. That's coming up on the other side on the latest order win and then a conversation with Pankaj Murarka on the market reaction to policy. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide? now in the palm of your hands. 
Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with... Well, chemical companies are um, in, a, in a bit of a buoyant momentum, if you will, because of various factors. In some cases, there are shortages. Some cases, there are, are duties that are there. In some cases, they have won some orders, signed LOIs. Um, and then, therefore, it's important to, of course, dissect each on their own, which is what we are trying to do today with Anupam Rasayan. They've recently signed an LOI with a Japanese multinational company. The aggregate LOI value is about $90 million over seven years, uh, but it, it's after a while that we're seeing some of the chemical companies starting to um, maybe get these orders as well. Is this indicative of things turning at the margin? Let's pose that question and, and talk about more than just this, of course, with Mr. Gopal Agrawal, he's CEO of Anupam Rasayan, and Mr. Vishal Thakkar, he's deputy CFO of the company. Gentlemen, thanks so much for taking the time out. Let's, talk, let's start off with the news first. Let's talk about this LOI with this MNC company. What is this about? Uh, where does this fit in into the scheme of things for Anupam over the medium term? And is this the first of uh, many such things that you would be doing in calendar year 24? Okay, so if I were to just give a little background to that, and then probably it can be expanded further. Uh, but uh, that this is a, a, a an effort. This is a result of the effort that we have been putting in for the last six to seven years. Uh, Japan is a, a you know geography that we have been focusing very actively. And in last eighteen months, if you see, we have built up a large team. Uh, you know, a significant presence in terms of team and presence there. And uh, again, with Mr. Gopal, our CEO, really. You know, spending a lot of time traveling to Japan and and building this uh, franchise is is really helped us in terms of uh, you know uh, culminating this trans uh, this uh, LOI. And uh, yes, there are a lot of buoyancies there, and uh, we believe that this is this is a good uh, start of a a, a journey uh, of Anupam in in, in Japan. Mm. Mr. Karbal, you want to add to that? It's cherry blossom season and certainly blossoming for you. So uh, talk to us a bit about this this particular order and what it would mean for Anupam. I, I, I reckon that the supplies commence from the current financial year. Yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, just to add to what Vishal said, uh, and maybe I'll take a kind of a bit of a step back. See, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a company, you could look at, you know, probably trying to kind of uh, solve for short term or long term. I think the approach which Anupam has always taken is look at a little long term horizon. Uh, it is a bit of a painful journey, you know, to start with, uh, but then yeah, eventually kind of it pays for. So as you rightly said, you know, for some of us, uh, you know, this journey in Japan kind of started almost, I would say that we have been in Japan for almost 10, 12 years. Uh, but uh, some of this product, especially on the fluoro side, which we have kind of, uh, you know, signed the LOI for, uh, we began, uh, you know, some of this exercise with our customers almost five to six years before. Uh, and, you know, what we are trying to do here is basically not look at, uh, again, a short term. We are basically looking at getting some of these products which are, you know, manufactured in those geography or by our customers uh, to India, uh, which would mean that we are looking at a kind of a long term, uh, let's say, solution uh, for our customers. Uh, it is a complete kind of a supply chain solution which we are providing to them uh, and which is where, you know, from a long term perspective, you know, we are able to kind of sign some of this contract. Uh, which will give us a, you know, let's say revenue visibility for next five to seven years. Uh, this is just one of the LOI which we have, let's say, kind of assigned with uh, Japan. I think, uh, you know, if I kind of talk about in last uh, two years, we would have done roughly maybe uh, four to five uh, such LOI uh, with Japanese customer. And for us, uh, while, you know, uh, Europe, uh, you know, used to kind of contribute significantly to our revenue. Uh, but yeah, I would say last four, five years, we've been trying to kind of build on to Japan and US, uh, which are, I would say, a little tougher market. Uh, but yeah, uh, we do believe the uh, maximum amount of growth, uh, you know, at least for us, is going to now come from uh, these geographies. And hence, uh, I think some of the effort which we have put over a period of time are yielding results. So is this a, is this a, Mr. Karal, is this a, a belief or hope that uh, because of this, more contracts would come your way? Or are you already in conversations with other players as well for whether an LOI of this nature or otherwise, but doing some stuff like this? 
Oh, so you are right. I think you know we are kind of uh, talking to I would say multiple customers uh, both in Japan and and in the US. Uh, and you know the way we are kind of going about it, uh, you know, is that see there are certain strength you know which we bring in in certain chemistry and certain processes. And our idea is to basically look at augmenting that uh, you know for us uh, and you know those to be our growth catalyst. Uh, and what I mean by that is that. Uh, there are certain chemistries, you know, where we have, let's say, a much better understanding than some of our peers. Uh, there are certain products where we have a complete solution, you know, uh, uh, let's say, starting with the base material and, you know, going up to, uh, let's say, almost the finished product, which we can supply to our customers. Which means that, you know, when it comes to quality, when it comes to cost of production, when it comes to managing, you know, uh, let's say, the supply over a period of time, we are at least among, uh, let's say, ahead of others. And that is something which obviously is giving us that edge, uh, wherein you know we are able to kind of have in some of these alloy. Of course, uh, you know the benefit of this one would see over next five to seven years. Uh, so yeah, from a long term perspective, I think we we do believe. Uh, I think the effort which we have put in, uh, there is a lot you know and enough and more which is going for us uh, going ahead. Mm, okay, uh, Vishal, just one quick follow up here. I mean, um, fluorination per se is a difficult chemistry. Uh, so two questions rolled into one. Um, if I'm not wrong, this is on the pharma side until 2000, FI23, this was about 3%. So does this increase that presence? And two, does it happen at the similar operational metrics or better operational metrics than your average numbers that you enjoy at Anupam? So yeah, you're right. The pharma, uh, you know, fluorination has been a very, uh, you know, interesting chemistry in that sense. And uh, there are limited number of players who do this. For us, this has been a chemistry for last six to seven years, even today, 15% of my revenue would come from that chemistry uh, included into my my, my portfolio. Uh, coming to the margins, see, we are a CDMO player. We have a very, very focused way of doing business with our customers where we look for a particular level of returns uh, on our investments and margins. And, and, and that's typically we have been in the range of 26 to 28%. I think we would try and focus on that numbers. Um, depending upon um, uh, the product to product, there may be a bit of a variability, but yes, this is where we would like to be. We would like to be in the margins which are more stable, more sustainable, where my customer is able to afford and I'm able to to, to make money out of say, that investment is the is the kind of a numbers that we will look for. <clears throat> no doubt, fluorination has its own advantages and and, and you get uh, a, a upward tick on the margin, but that's where we will, we will want to be repositioning assets. So and, and sorry, just getting a clarity, is the, does this fall within the business verticals that are existing like agro or pharma? Is it, this is a pharma thing for you? No. So this, so this, this, is, this is more into the, the engineering fluid side and, uh, and bit of it to go into pharma as well. But yes, it will be a combination of both the, both the uh, things. So it has application across multiple uh, usages. Okay. Um, I'll end this interview with a question on CDMO per se, because a bit of a hibernation out there uh, again, or a, because of funding winter, if you will, so many reports spoke about it, I'd love to understand that. But just one quick word on uh, on this fluorination, because you recent, I mean, not recently, maybe two years ago, acquired this stake in TANFAC as well. Is Now, is all of that leading up to this confidence of bagging more orders in Japan and US over the course of the next year or two? No, so you're right. Maybe we shall, I'll take a dig at that and then you can add. Uh, uh, so you, you're right. You know, I think as far as some of the, uh, let's say, final product, we have been uh, working with our customers, I would say, fairly for a long period of time. Uh, but yes, as you rightly said, acquisition of TANFAC basically gave, uh, I would say, uh, led to, you know, the whole uh, fluorination, uh, you know, supply chain from our perspective. Uh, as I said, you know, most of our customers, you know, are where either we are the only supplier or, or you know, among the, uh, let's say, the one or two primary suppliers to them. Uh, and, you know, what people, uh, let's say, in some of these developed market, whether Japan or US are looking at is that, am I able to, you know, provide him a complete supply chain solution? Mm -hmm. And that is exactly where, you know, the Stanfac acquisition really uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, act as anchor, uh, wherein we are now, you know, controlling a complete, uh, what you call supply chain, uh, you know, uh, from that perspective where we are able to get that assurance to our customer uh, that we are in a way not dependent on anybody else uh, for us to fulfill you know those requirements so this has definitely acted as a, i would say as a huge catalyst uh, you know in our uh, uh, floro uh, fluorination journey okay okay fair call um, 
uh, one question on numbers and then I, I know you're a silent period so I won't ask you guys about too much but I'm just trying to think of this. Uh, while your revenues may have fluctuated, you maintained your your margins, I heard you say that these new products are also coming at least at those margins and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Suffice to say that if indeed um, business picks up over the course of the next 12 to 18 months or 24 months, uh, then uh, because you've managed to maintain your operational metrics any which ways in this, then the pace of growth uh, on the profitability uh, could be fairly brisk if I take a two year view from here on. See, I, I'll take a thing. I'll, I'll give you a bit of bit of a perspective on that. If you look at it, my margins are not where I am talking at the the gross levels. Typically, my margins are at the EBITDA levels. So, what I agree with my customer is at the EBITDA levels because my overheads are also passed through. And so, that's the reason. If you see, my percentage margins will continue to be the similar range, <clears throat> depending upon the product profile, depending upon the the, the the, you know, the, the contribution of the different segments, it can have it, but for a, for a particular product, my margins will remain sustained depending upon the volume going up or down. So the question is that if I have a higher growth, will I have a higher margin percentage? May, may not be. Uh, absolute number, yes, definitely. Hmm. Okay. And last question. Um... Almost everybody, I speak to any company on the pharma side or otherwise which are engaged in CDMO, uh, they've spoken about, or analysts, and they've all spoken about how uh, there was, or probably still exists, a funding winter in CDMO operations. And at some point of time in the next couple of quarters, this will change. Do you get a sense like that as well? And could we therefore see enhanced order flows for everybody on the chemical or the farmer side, but engaged in CDMO? Maybe I can go first here. Uh, so. I, I would just say, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, to answer it more like generically, it will be a difficult one. It will depend, uh, you know, in terms of what chemistries uh, or, you know, what APIs you are in, uh, you know, so if I was to kind of uh, answer it, uh, it is, one thing is for sure, you know, gone are the days where you could just basically look at uh, importing and, you know, doing probably let's say one or two process and, you know, uh, imagine that you would be able to sustain on a long term. So people who have, you know, kind of a developed, I would say, X amount of uh, backward integration or, you know, so, some of the product where they have Y amount of niche are the ones who will definitely flourish. And to that extent, I don't think so. You know, uh, funding winter uh, would ever be a problem for those guys. Uh, yeah. So what I would say is that, yeah, what people saw in last two years or three years where, you know, in general, everybody kind of benefited. And you know, there are multiple reasons, including COVID. Uh, you know, where certain geographies were not able to produce, uh, definitely will not be the situation going forward. So you will have to have a certain amount of niche, either on the product side or on the technology side for you to kind of really be able to attract that kind of a capital. Vishal? Uh, I, I think that's that's where it is, that uh, there is enough and more demand. It's only that can you deliver it in, in, in a holistic manner where you're able to give supply chain solution completely through technology. That's where I would say. Okay. Jaman, um, congrats on all of this that you're doing. All the best with everything that you're trying to do. We look forward to continue talking to you, post your quarterly numbers and otherwise on important milestones to try and assess uh, what your shareholders can glean uh, from their developments and the, uh, and the events that happen in Anupam Rasai. And thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And Bye. viewers, thanks for tuning into this conversation. I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, 
but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide? now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading. Less than about 12 minutes to go before we hear Governor Das on uh, what will be the first monetary policy announcement of this financial year. Are we going to see new guidance is set or new estimates set for growth, for inflation? Not much of a chance, actually very, very minimal chance of any kind of a rate cut, but the street will be watching in commentary on what could be expected in terms of a timeline. Meanwhile, a quick look at what the markets are doing and completely tepid, maybe in wait and watch mode in anticipation of what happens in the next 15 minutes to 30 minutes or so till you have clarity as far as the governor is concerned. What is working this morning, and maybe a bit of a surprise, is pharma. Pharma has sprung to life, uh, whether it's a DRL up to 2.5%, Sun Pharma, Cipla, all of them up in the green, pushing up that index as well. DBS Lab having another good day. But meanwhile, let's uh, go across to Pankaj Murarka, he's CIO of Renaissance Investment Managers, to get his sense of... Uh, you know, what the market is expecting, if much at all, from the governor. Pankaj, very good morning to you. You know, at a time when global queues, at least overnight, have been dismal and crude has become a worrying headline once again, 
Uh, do you think that there's going to be much movement or much anticipation from what Governor Das says? Morning, Tamanna. No, not really much. I think uh, the fact is, uh, uh, it's a pretty, uh, I think, consensus view. I would expect that the RBI will have a pause and unlikely to do so, uh, and unlikely to act. Probably our view is that any rate cuts in India is only a second of phenomena. So we don't, uh, because bear in mind that uh, last year we had a poor monsoon and that led to a spike in food inflation over the last one year. It's only now that the food inflation is moderated. So uh, I'm of the view that RBI would want to watch out for how monsoon pans out this year before they take any uh, rate cut decisions. So I think rate cuts are not in the offering, at least in the first half of the year. And I don't think so that has an impact on the economy. The fact is that Indian economy has been very resilient. Uh, if you look at last one year where we have significant slowdown, especially in European markets and exports have slowed down, yet we had strong growth in the economy. So I think the growth outlook for economy remains very strong and in view of that, I don't think so. I think RBI policy will be a no surprise kind of an event. What would you be looking out for, uh, Pankaj, in terms of commentary from the governor? Um, especially in light of, like I said, Brent uh, at 1991, concerns over there. Uh, will we see inflation come back as a worry? And perhaps a reiteration that uh, you want to stay on target as with a you know, withdrawal of accommodating uh, stance. Well, liquidity in the system has already been tight. So in, in a way, there has been already been a fair bit of withdrawal of uh, accommodation, uh, COVID-induced accommodation which RBI had done has already happened to a great extent. Yes, the short-term food prices have had a spike, though uh, directionally or from a, uh, if you ask me from a one-year perspective, we continue to remain negative on crude because we think there are significant headwinds to global demand and global growth. Having said that, this geopolitical news flows has had an impact and we've seen crude has actually moved up by about $10 if you see in the last six weeks or so. But we still think that, meaning our view, if you ask me my view, I think uh, uh, all that we're seeing globally in terms of statements coming from all across Middle East and US, uh, I, I, I think there are there is more of rhetoric in this and we don't, our base case is we don't see uh, any of this Middle East issue escalating uh, in any manner. So we think probably the spike is a temporary spike and crude should cool off again uh, as we head into summers. So while it can have a temporary spike, we don't see it having a significant impact. Though having said that, given the fact that we just had a uh, uh, cut in retail fuel prices in India a few weeks back, probably once we are through the election, there will be some in retail fuel prices. But I still think that overall inflation picture in India is very much manageable. Pankaj, good morning, Neeraj here. Uh, what you are effectively saying is that the RBI decision becomes a bit of a non-event from a market's perspective. Not just now, yes, absolutely even for the next two policies. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, meaning, uh, the only thing, in fact, I would add is that uh, I would not want RBI to probably <laughs> go ahead and do a rate hike in a hurry. Uh, because uh, there are still, well, inflation is within the band, but still there are uh, underlying inflation pressures, as we are discussing, let's say there's been a short-term spike in crude prices, commodity prices are elevated. So I would, and the fact is that even at the current rate of interest, the economy is fairly strong and fairly resilient in terms of the growth numbers we are seeing. So I think RBI should, I would expect the Reserve Bank not to hurry themselves into a rate cut. Because in that case, we end up uh, getting into a situation where we can create a bigger macroeconomic imbalance going forward into the future. And we certainly want to avoid that because it's a very hard-earned macroeconomic stability that India has earned now post-COVID. Uh, there's a lot of effort that has gone into it and there's a lot of uh, fiscal and uh, pain that has happened in that sense. So you certainly don't want to disturb that. And RBI has been time and again reiterating that their major focus remains macroeconomic stability. Got it. Pankaj, now uh, from, a, from a market's perspective, the, the two sect actually real estate may not be as much interest rate linked, but be that as it may, just for the sake of uh, what's always been spoken about as, as policy sensitive or rate sensitive, uh, banks, real estate, autos, the three are on a, in a, in, on a, on a trajectory of their own uh, in autos, two wheelers maybe or more so, uh, but uh, certainly real estate and certainly financials as the Q4 updates are seen. So would you reckon that uh, a no rate cut scenario for 2024 uh, could still mean that there could be buying opportunities into these pockets uh, because of what they are doing fundamentally? 
Yes, I would I would agree with that. Though I still think there will be rate cuts in the second half of this year. I think what we, one on rate cuts, I think India and world, what we see this in this rate cut cycle is India and the world will witness a shallow rate cut cycle. There are no steep rate cuts that are around the corner in this cycle, either globally or in US or in India. Because the underlying inflationary pressures still are pretty uh, resilient in that sense across the world, including India. So I still believe in the camp that there will be uh, a few rate cuts probably in the second half of the year. But having said that, I would still think so what you said, that these sectors will do well because the fact is that underlying um, demand momentum in all of these sectors remain pretty strong. Two-wheelers have been a, uh, a, a, a laggard in that sense in the post-COVID recovery, but there also we've seen now rural <coughs> sales and two-wheeler sales coming back. If you look at real estate, meaning uh, uh, year after year, last four years, each of the years, including the last financial year, uh, uh, the top seven metro markets in India have had the highest lifetime sales. And still, uh, inventories which were piled up, uh, if you look at inventory to sales ratio in some of the key markets like Bombay, Delhi, they're the lowest ever that we've seen in the last 15 years. So which effectively tells you that underlying demand in real estate continues to be strong. Job creation in the economy is very robust. So I think the real estate uh, sector will continue to do well. And likewise for banks, <clears throat> there have been concerns on some margin pressures on banks. But I think probably now uh, uh, margin should stabilize from year on because this fourth quarter results when we see that, that should be the peak of margin moderation. And from next year onward, margin should stabilize. Uh, given the fact banks are at low credit costs and they've underperformed the last one year, I certainly see banks performing going into the uh, as we move forward in this financial year. So I would certainly think so, irrespective of the rate cut, these sectors should do well. Pankaj, are you excited at all about uh, the business updates coming in from HDFC, Bajaj Finance and of course a clutch of smaller, small finance banks, etc. What do you make of that first cut of numbers? So one common theme across all of them has been there has been a very strong loan growth. All of these uh, banks including uh, 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 HDFC is a separate case because there is a merger event that has happened. But if you look at X of, uh, if you look at the retail loan growth in HDFC Bank, it's still 15%, which is phenomenal on their size, uh, while the overall aggregate loan growth is somewhat moderate because of the merger effect. Uh, other than HGFC, bank, all the other banks have had reported very strong uh, uh, loan growth as well as uh, deposit growth. So I think all of these trends are showing uh, very strong underlying demand momentum in the economy. Uh, and uh, uh, the good thing from a financial perspective is we are at a point of time where credit cost is historically low. Uh, these banks have never had, meaning it's been about, uh, I think, 15 years, for the last 15 years, they've never had such low credit cost. And I think this benign credit cost environment might continue for some more time. So probably I think uh, the numbers are pretty uh, decent and uh, good in that sense. You know, we were having a conversation earlier this morning before markets opened with one of our analysts who uh, had this I told you so moment. I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that those who didn't uh, jump in on an HDFC at 1400, 1500 levels have missed the bus? Is this the sort of turnaround for an HDFC bank and the understanding that the merger overhang will remain for some time, but it's more of a temporary phenomenon? Yeah, I think the people who have not owned it so far, they've not, they have not. certainly haven't missed the bus because the stock has uh, underperformed for the last three years. Last three years, if you look at HDFC Bank, it's a zero return versus index returns of 20% plus Kager over the last three years or 18% Kager at the nifty level. So uh, I think this is a new HDFC Bank now because the merged entity is certainly a financial giant with 15% market share in uh, loans uh, and, uh, and now with mortgages as a new growth engine where HDFC Bank could not participate uh, earlier before the merger, there is a new growth engine in place. So I certainly think that HDFC Bank, let's say from an investment perspective over the next three to five years, uh, is an attractive investment, uh, this thing. Having said that, given their size and scale, their growth rate will moderate. And I still think that they can grow in line with, uh, let's say, industry growth or a couple of percentage points above that. So if they can do a mid-teens kind of a growth, which is my base case over the next three to five years, that's still very good for a large, uh, if I could say so, financial conglomerate like HDFC Bank. So I think it's still not late. People haven't missed anything. Okay. Pankaj, uh, just one quick word uh, before we thank you, and that is uh, that this small turn that we're seeing in pharmaceuticals, yesterday we were talking, or rather this morning we were talking to Anupam Rasayan, 
which were one of large orders, so some chemical CDMO companies are also talking about that. You track that space closely. We have about a minute left. Uh, are you constructive here? So CDMO is very exciting as an opportunity, Neeraj, across uh, pharmaceuticals and chemicals for India. I think there's a big opportunity there. We have to be selective in stock picking. Chemicals as a space is coming out of two years of underperformance. I think the worst is behind. Probably going forward, the sector should do well. So we remain positive on both, but one has to be selective in terms of stock picking, I would say. Pankaj, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us and giving us that perspective. Uh, that's Pankaj Murarka, CEO of Renaissance Investment Managers, saying that, I mean, of course, nobody expects a rate cut. The poll of 39 economists on Bloomberg survey, none of them expected a rate cut. So not anticipated now, probably not even in June. The question is only post that, will we have a shallow rate cut cycle, a deep one or none at all? And that remains in the air. The, I think the questions today to the Reserve Bank of India will be a lot more on technical factors and not as much on what is the outlook on rates per se. Maybe the global factors and how much of a play they will have when it comes to the inflation expectations for the country. But Taman, I dare say, I won't be too surprised if uh, there is a lot of emphasis on what the RBI thinks of growth, because the RBI was ahead of the curve in trying in, in identifying that the growth numbers might look solid. Mm. And then the PMI numbers for India, both the flash PMI and otherwise, have now shown that manufacturing-led growth could actually spur the Indian growth numbers to higher levels than what people had anticipated. So a lot of emphasis on RBI's expectations for growth. I reckon you might see an upgrade in growth uh, predictions. Could be interesting to see that. I think you, you most like, because a lot of global agencies have all gone ahead and done that as well. So the 7% uh, growth uh, figure that the RBI has picked could increase. So that is one thing you will see. Inflation, uh, you know, like Lakshmi was telling us this morning, Neeraj, uh, for the next couple of quarters might seem like it's cooling off. But I don't think any central banker right now in the world is going to stick their neck out and say that I need to cut rates. And especially the... Um, decrease in dependence on rate cuts to spur pretty much anything. I mean, uh, in real terms, interest rates have gone up, but it hasn't stopped anything. There's Governor Das. It's a monetary policy statement of the current financial year, 2024-25. And uh, this is how it goes. As you would be aware, earlier this week, we commemorated the 90th year of the Reserve Bank of India. The journey of this august institution is closely related to the evolution of the Indian economy. Numerous historic events have occurred during these nine decades. And they consist of the nationalization of the Reserve, nationalization of the Reserve Bank in 1949, the planning era, bank nationalization, wars, droughts, the fall of the Bretton Woods system, oil shocks, a precarious balance of payment situation and the subsequent market reforms, the Asian and the global financial crisis, the taper tantrum, and finally the COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical hostilities of the recent years. During this journey, the Reserve Bank was always at the forefront combining its developmental and regulatory roles in steering the Indian financial system and the economy towards stability. While doing so, the Reserve Bank has discharged its responsibility with integrity and professionalism. Compared to many other central banks, the Reserve Bank has a much broader range of functions which is vital for ensuring macro-financial stability of a modern and complex economy like India. There are functional complementarities among the various responsibilities of the Reserve Bank of India. Being a full-service central bank, the Reserve Bank is well positioned to take a holistic view of various critical issues confronting the economy and the financial sector, and it's also well positioned to take appropriate steps in the best interest of the economy. We continuously strive to learn, adapt, and innovate while performing our multiple responsibilities. I would now like to focus on the decisions and deliberations of the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, which uh, met on 3rd, 4th, and today. 
uh, 5th of April. After a detailed assessment of the evolving macroeconomic and financial developments and the outlook, the Reserve Bank MPC decided by a majority of 5 to 1 to keep the policy repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. Consequently, the standing deposit facility, that is the SDF, rate remains at 6.25%. And the marginal standing facility, that is the MSF rate, remains at 6 point MSF rate and the bank rate, they remain at 6.75%. The MPC also decided by a majority of 5 out of 6 members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation progressively aligns to the target while supporting growth. I shall now briefly set out the rationale for these decisions. Since the last policy, the growth inflation dynamics have played out favorably. Growth has continued to sustain its momentum, surpassing all projections. Headline inflation has eased to 5.1% during both January and February. And this has come down to 5.1% in these two months from the earlier peak of 5.7% in the month of December. Core inflation has also declined steadily over the past nine months to its lowest level in the series. The fuel component of CPI remained in deflation for six consecutive months. Food inflation pressures, however, accentuated in February. Looking ahead, robust growth prospects provide the policy space to remain focused on inflation and ensure its descent to the target of 4%. As the uncertainties in food prices continue to pose challenges, the MPC remains vigilant to the upside risks to inflation that may derail the path of disinflation. Under these circumstances, monetary policy must continue to be actively disinflationary to ensure anchoring of inflation expectations and fuller transmission of the past monetary policy actions. The MPC therefore decided to keep the policy rate unchanged at 6.5% in this meeting and also remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation. The MPC will remain resolute in its commitment to aligning inflation to the target. I would now like to provide an assessment of growth and inflation, and I will begin with uh, the scenario relating to global growth. The global economy has remained resilient with a stable outlook as reflected in various high-frequency indicators. Now, in my statement, you know, whatever I am saying, it is backed up with a lot of data which are there in the footnotes. So those of you who are interested could refer to this statement, which as usual will be uploaded in, our, in the RBI website immediately after this statement is over. So a lot of data backing up whatever I am saying is available in the footnote of, in the various footnotes of my statement. You may like to refer to it. Let me start again uh, on the global growth part. The global economy has remained resilient with a stable outlook as reflected in various high frequency indicators. Global trade is expected to grow faster in 2024, although weaker than its historical average. Inflation is moving closer to targets, but the last mile of disin disinflation is turning out to be challenging. Services inflation in advanced economies remains sticky amidst tight labor markets. Accordingly, central banks are cautious in their communications, thereby tempering market expectations about the timing and magnitude of interest rate cuts later during this year. Equity markets have gained while bond yields and the U.S. dollar have remained volatile. The overall outlook is challenged by continuing geopolitical conflicts, disruptions in trade routes, and high public debt burden. In the last monetary policy statement, if you recall, I had expressed concerns about the high levels of public debt in both advanced and emerging market economies, that is the EMEs. 
These are dormant risks which could erupt abruptly. Debt to GDP ratio which rose during the pandemic remain elevated and are projected to increase further with rising interest burden and cost of borrowing, thus raising debt sustainability concerns. Worsening debt situation in advanced economies in particular can generate spillovers for the emerging market economies in the form of swings in capital flows and volatility in financial markets. The emerging market economies with rising levels of public debt in particular would be vulnerable to these spillover effects. Credible fiscal consolidation plans, particularly in major advanced economies, focusing on growth enhancing investment would be necessary to address this challenge, not only for themselves, but also I think for the overall global economy. India, however, presents a different picture on account of its fiscal consolidation and faster GDP growth. Turning to domestic growth, the domestic economic activity continues to expand at an accelerated pace, supported by fixed investment and improving global environment. The second advance estimates placed the real GDP growth at 7.6% for 2023-24, the third successive year of 7% or higher growth. From the supply side, industrial activity led by manufacturing continued its momentum. The Purchasing Managers Index, that is PMI for manufacturing, displayed a sustained expansion in both February and March, touching a 16-year high in the month of March. Services sector Services sector exhibited broad-based buoyancy with all sectors within the services sector registering strong growth. The PMI services remained above 60 during February and March, suggesting sustained healthy expansion. With rural demand catching up, consumption is expected to support economic growth in 2024-25. Urban consumption stayed buoyant as evident from various indicators. Details are given in the footnote. The resilience in, the sim the resilience in cement production, together with strong growth in steel consumption and production and import of capital goods, augur well for the investment cycle to, to gain further traction. The total flow of resources to the commercial sector from, from banks and other sources at rupees 31.2 lakh crore, I repeat, at rupees 31.2 lakh crore during 2023-24 is significantly higher than that of the previous year, which was 26.4 lakh, 26 lakh crore. External demand improved in February with exports registering double-digit expansion. Trade deficit, however, widened in February as imports also accelerated. Going forward, the outlook for agriculture and rural activity appears bright, with good rubby wheat crop and improved prospects of kharif crops due to expected normal southwest monsoon. Strengthening of rural demand improving employment conditions and informal sector activity, moderating inflationary pressures, and sustained momentum in manufacturing and services sector should boost private consumption. Let me read this sentence again because there are quite a few points in this. Strengthening of rural demand, improving employment conditions and informal sector activity, moderating inflationary pressures, and sustained momentum in manufacturing and services sector should boost private consumption. As per our survey, consumer confidence one year ahead reached a new high. The prospects of investment activity remained bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad-based. Persisting Yeah, let me, let me just uh, rephrase it. The prospects of uh, investment activity remain bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad-based. 
persisting and robust government capital expenditure, healthy balance sheets of banks and corporates, and rising capacity utilization, and finally strengthening business optimism as reflected in our service. I think the sentence is a bit long. It's better that I read it out again for uh, greater clarity. And uh, sorry about that, but I think it provides greater clarity. The prospects of investment activity remain bright owing to upturn in private capex cycle becoming steadily broad-based, persisting and robust government capital expenditure, healthy balance sheets of banks and corporates, rising capacity utilization, especially in the manufacturing sector, and strengthening business optimism as reflected in our surveys. Improving global growth and trade prospects, coupled with our rising integration in global supply chains, are expected to propel external demand for goods and services. The headwinds from protracted geopolitical tensions and increasing disruptions in trade routes, however, pose risks to the overall outlook. Taking all these factors into, con into consideration, the real GDP growth for the current financial year 2024-25, which started on 1st April, the G real GDP growth for 24-25 is projected at 7%, with Q1 at 7.1%, Q2 at 6.9%, and both Q3 and Q4 at 7% each. The risks are evenly balanced. Turning to inflation, food price uncertainties continue to weigh on the inflation trajectory going forward. A record rubby wheat production would help temper price pressures and replenish the buffer stocks. As you would recall, the buffer stocks had slightly dipped, but I think the record rubby production of wheat is expected to replenish whatever depletion had taken place. Moreover, early indication of a normal monsoon augurs well for the Kharif season. International food prices also remain benign. The tight demand supply situation in certain categories of pulses and the production outcome outcomes of key vegetables warrant close monitoring, especially in the background of the forecast of above normal temperatures in the coming months. And these above normal temperatures as per the current forecast, are expected to prevail in April, May, and June, if, and not beyond June. That is the current uh, forecast. Frequent and overlapping adverse climate shocks pose upside risks to the outlook on international and domestic food prices. Cost push pressures faced by firms are, seen, are seeing an upward bias after a period of sustained moderation. Deflation in fuel is likely to deepen in the near term, following the cut in LPG prices in the month of March. Notwithstanding the cut in petrol and diesel prices in mid-March, the recent uptick in crude prices, crude oil prices, especially in the recent few days, they need to be very closely monitored. Continuing geopolitical tensions also pose upside risk to commodity prices and supply chains. Assuming a normal monsoon next year, CPI inflation for, when I say normal monsoon for next year, I mean the current year 24-25. CPI inflation for the current year 24-25 is projected at 4.5%. I repeat, CPI inflation for the current year 24-25 is projected at 4.5% with Q1 at 4.9%, Q2 at 3.8%, Q3 at 4.6%, and Q4 at 4.5%. The risks are evenly balanced. Now, what do these inflation and growth conditions mean for monetary policy? I have explained the growth situation, I have explained the inflation scenario, synthesizing everything, what does it mean? what implications it has for monetary policy, and that is precisely what I would like to explain now. Inflation has come down significantly, but remains above the 4% target. Food inflation continues to exhibit considerable volatility, which is impeding the ongoing disinflation process. High and persistent food inflation 
could unhinge anchoring of inflation expectations which is underway. Our ongoing effort is to ensure fuller transmission of policy actions and anchoring of household inflation expectations. The strong growth momentum together with our GDP projections for 24-25 give us the policy space to unwaveringly focus on price stability. Now two years ago around this time when CPI inflation had peaked at 7.8% in April 2022, the elephant in the room was inflation. The elephant, has now gone out, the elephant has now gone out for a walk and appears to be returning to the forest. We would like the elephant to return to the forest and remain there on a durable basis. In other words, it is essential that it is essential in the best interest of the economy that CPI inflation continues to moderate and aligns to the target on a durable basis. Till this is achieved, our task remains unfinished. The success in the disinflation process so far should not distract us from vulnerability of the inflation trajectory to the frequent incidence of supply side shocks. Our effort is to ensure price stability on an enduring basis, paving the way for sustained period of high growth. Uh, I would now like to turn to the aspect of liquidity and uh, financial market conditions. In the February monetary policy statement, if you recall, I had mentioned that liquidity conditions were driven by exogenous factors which were likely to correct in the foreseeable future. Liquidity conditions eased during February and March in the wake of increased government spending, Reserve Bank's market operations, and the return leg of US dollar and Indian rupee sell by auction, sell by swap auction, which had been done uh, uh, earlier in uh, 2022. In particular, liquidity situation improved in March with system liquidity turning intermittently surplus in the first half of the month. In these circumstances, the Reserve Bank conducted 14 fine-tuning variable rate repo operations, that is VRRR operations during February and early March to absorb intermittent surplus liquidity. Anticipating the seasonal tightening of liquidity at end March, the Reserve Bank injected liquidity through variable rate, that is VRR operations, both main and fine-tuning operations. Consequently, the average borrowings under the MSF window moderated Liquidity conditions have, however, again turned surplus from March 30th, necessitating VRR auctions from 2nd of April. So you would have noticed in the last uh, two, three days, we, are, we have been conducting more than one VRRR, uh, VRRR auctions on 2nd April, then again we did it on the, uh, 3rd April. So last two, three days we have been doing it. And today, as you know, there is a variable rate, uh, there is a, you know, uh, there is a, uh, what you call uh, as per our uh, cycle we are doing uh, VRR operation for uh, 14 days, a VRRR operation for 14 days. Now reflecting these liquidity developments, the weighted average call rate, that is WACR, exhibited a softening bias and has hovered near the repo rate since the last policy meeting. In tandem, rates in the collateralized segment of the call money market have also softened. Financial conditions remained conducive as reflected in reduced term spread in the GSEC market and stable risk premium in the bond market. In the credit market, monetary policy, monetary transmission continues to be work in progress. Looking ahead, the Reserve Bank will remain nimble and flexible in its liquidity management through both main and fine-tuning operations in both repo and reverse repo. We will deploy an appropriate mix of instruments to modulate both frictional and durable liquidity so as to ensure that money market interest rates evolve in an orderly manner that preserves financial stability. The Indian rupee has remained largely range bound as compared to both its emerging market peers and a few advanced economies during the financial year 2023-24, that is till 31st March last. 
the Indian rupee was the most stable among major currencies during this period. This is very important. The Indian rupee was the most stable among major currencies during this period. As compared to previous three years, the Indian rupee exhibited lowest volatility in 2023-24. The relative stability of the Indian rupee, which I just mentioned, it reflects, I would emphasize, the relative stability of the Indian rupee reflects India's sound macroeconomic fundamentals, financial stability, and improvements in our external position. Turning to financial stability, let me say that latest data as at end December 2023 show that the key indicators of capital and asset quality of scheduled commercial banks continued to be healthy. The financial indicators of non-banking financial companies, that is NBFCs, are also in line with that of the banking system as per the latest data available. Let me emphasize, let me emphasize here that banks, NBFCs and other financial entities must continue to give highest priority to quality of governance and adherence, adherence to regulatory guidelines. Financial sector players by and large operate with public money, be it of depositors in banks and select NBFCs or investors in bonds and other financial instruments. They should always be mindful of this aspect. The Reserve Bank will continue to constructively engage with financial entities in this regard. It needs to be recognized that financial stability is a joint responsibility of all stakeholders. The Reserve Bank has also been engaging with the regulated, with the regulated entities and various stakeholders for simplifying its regulations and reducing compliance burden. As part of this endeavor, the recommendations of the Regulations Review Authority, RRA 2.0, constituted by the Reserve Bank have been largely implemented. The RRA 2.0 has set a new benchmark for meaningful engagement between the regulator and the regulated entities. Moving further in the same direction, internal review groups within RBI, internal review groups within RBI were formed in 2023 to rationalize, simplify and remove obsolete regulations and streamline the reporting mechanism. In pursuance of the recommendations of the RRA 2.0, that is the Regulations Review Authority which was constituted by the RBI, so in pursuance of the recommendations of the RRA 2.0 and the internal review groups which we constituted in 2023, more than 1,000 circulars have been withdrawn. A master direction for rationalizing and harmonizing supervisory returns has also been issued. The Reserve Bank will continue to follow a consultative approach and undertake review of regulations in line with the evolving financial landscape. Turning to external sector, during the first three quarters of 23-24, India's current account deficit narrowed significantly on account of a moderation in merchandise trade deficit coupled with robust growth in services exports and strong remittances. India's merchandise and services exports have grown at a healthy pace in the fourth quarter of 23-24. India continues to be the largest recipient of remittances in the world. The cost of receiving remittances is gradually coming down. Overall, the current account deficit for 2024-25 is expected to remain at a level that is both viable and eminently manageable. On the external financing side, India's foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI flows, saw a significant turnaround in 23-24. Net FPI inflows stood at 41.6 billion US dollars during 23-24 as against net outflows in the preceding two years, which were in the order of 14.1 billion outflow in 21-22 and 4.8 billion outflow in 22-23.
This is the second highest level of FPI inflow after 23-24. Net foreign direct investment moderated to US dollar 14.2 billion in April January 23-24 from 25 billion a year ago. External commercial borrowings, that is ECBs, and non-resident deposits recorded higher net inflows compared to the previous year. The amount of ECB agreements also grew markedly in 2023-24 up to February 24. Now all this data is given, details are given in the footnote. India's foreign exchange reserves reached an all-time high of 645.6 billion US dollars as of March 29th this year, March 29, 2024. I repeat, India's foreign exchange reserves reached an all-time high of 645.6 billion as of March 29, 2024. Latest data on various external vulnerability indicators suggest improved resilience of India's external sector. We remain confident of meeting our external financing requirements comfortably. Now, talking about the forex reserves, I recall that uh, in 2021, our forex reserves had also reached 642 plus uh, billion US dollars. Then, uh, following the commencement of the war in Ukraine and the outflow of uh, uh, dollar from India as well as from several other countries on uh, safe haven demand. Uh, there were concerns that forex reserves of India was going down and at one point it had gone down. Our forex reserves had gone down to about 524 uh, billion dollars. And at that time, I think several questions were raised about, uh, uh, you know, what was RBI doing, whether RBI was on the right track. If you recall, at that time, we had very clearly assured that the decline in forex reserves was partly due to, uh, you know, the change in valuations of our assets and also partly due to our intervention in the market to ensure an orderly depreciation of the rupee, which is a part of our policy, ensuring orderly depreciation or orderly appreciation. And we had that time very clearly and firmly stated that we are using our forex reserves in a very judicious manner. It was a strong umbrella which we had built up and we are using it because it was raining heavily. And we were mindful of what we were doing. We knew what is our purpose and in which direction we are moving. And as you would see, now the reserves have again risen and they stand at an all time high of 642.6 billion US dollars, 645. not 642, sorry, 645.6 billion as of 29th March. So, you know, this is one area on which the Reserve Bank remains committed. Number one, to sort of ensure that, I mean, the exchange rate of the rupee is market determined. There are inflows and outflows of dollars happening. But it is our focus, it is our prime focus to build up a strong umbrella, a strong buffer in the form of a substantial quantum of forex reserves, which will help us when the cycle turns or when it rains heavily. So let me move forward. Uh, sorry for that digression, but I thought it was necessary to set the record straight. I shall now announce certain additional measures. The first announcement relates to trading of sovereign green bonds in the International Financial Services Center, IFSC, with a view to facilitating wider non-resident participation in sovereign green bonds. A scheme for investment and trading in these bonds in the IFSC will be notified very shortly. The second announcement relates to the RBI Retail Direct Scheme and introduction of a mobile app to operate in the RBI Retail Direct Scheme. The Reserve Bank Retail Direct Scheme was launched in November 2021 for enabling the retail investors to participate in the GSEC market, both in the primary as well as in the secondary market auctions and operations. It is now proposed to launch a mobile app for accessing the Retail Direct portal. This will be of great convenience to retail investors and deepen the GSEC market further. The next announcement relates to review of liquidity coverage ratio, that is LCR framework. Technological developments have enabled bank customers to instantly withdraw or transfer money from their 
bank accounts. While improving customer convenience, this has also created challenges for banks to deal with potential situations when, due to certain factors, a large number of depositors decide to instantly and simultaneously withdraw their money from the banks. The developments in certain advanced jurisdictions in, uh, during the last year demonstrated the difficulties it can create for banks. Uh, the difficulties it can create for banks to deal with such uh, situations when there is heavy outflow of, uh, you know, heavy, heavy outflow or transfer of uh, deposits. And this happens only if that particular bank is in, a st is in an acute stress. It's not a normal thing which happens. But then the banks will have, to be remained, uh, will have to remain prepared for all eventualities. A need has therefore arisen to undertake a comprehensive review of the LCR framework for, for banks. A draft circular will be issued shortly for stakeholder consultation. Our approach is to have a balanced approach and as I said a little while ago, we follow consultative approach. So therefore, the draft circular will enable the stakeholders and the banks to give their views and opinions and suggestions, which will be taken into consideration by the Reserve Bank before arriving at a final decision. The next announcement relates to dealing in rupee interest rate derivative products for small finance banks. At present, small finance banks are permitted to use only interest rate futures for proprietary hedging. It has now been decided to allow small finance banks to use permissible rupee interest derivative products. This will allow further flexibility to small finance banks for hedging their interest rate risk and enhancing their resilience. The next announcement relates to enabling UPI for cash deposit facility. Deposit of cash through cash deposit machines, that is CDMs, is primarily being done through the use of debit cards. Given the experience gained from, from cardless cash withdrawal using UPI at the ATMs, it is now proposed to absorb, it is now proposed to facilitate deposit of cash in CDMs, that is in the cash deposit machines, using UPI. This measure will further enhance customer convenience and make currency handling process at banks more efficient. And uh, the uh, next announcement relates to, I have two more announcements and I shall be quick. Uh, next announcement relates to UPI access for prepaid instruments through third party apps. At present, UPI payments from pre prepaid, uh, prepaid payment instruments, that is PPIs can be made only by using the web or mobile app provided by the PPI issuer itself. It is now proposed to permit the use of third-party UPI apps for making UPI payments from these PPI wallets. That means the PPI wallet holders no longer have to be completely dependent on the PPI issuer, but they can use any other third-party app which is operating under the uh, UPI. This will further enhance customer convenience and boost adoption of digital payments for small value transactions. And the final announcement relates to distribution of central bank digital currency, that is CBDC, the e-rupee, through non-bank payment system operators. The CBDC pilots are currently in operation with increasing number of use cases and participating banks. It is proposed to make CBDC retail accessible to a broader segment of users by enabling non-bank payment system operators to offer CBDC wallets. This will facilitate testing of resiliency of the CBDC platform to handle multi-channel transactions. Let me now conclude, and I would like to state that as we progress towards RBI at 100, the upcoming decade is going to be a transformational journey. The Reserve Bank will continue to focus on preserving financial stability and promoting a system that is robust, resilient, and future ready. And it will be robust, resilient, and future ready to support economic growth. Price stability will be a key component of this endeavor. Turning to the present, inflation is on a declining trajectory and GDP growth is buoyant. At this juncture, we should not lower our guard 
but continue to work towards ensuring that inflation aligns durably and sustainably to the target. Our goal is, our goal is in sight and we must remain vigilant. We are inspired by the profound words of Mahatma Gandhi and I quote, one must persevere and have patience. Success is the inevitable result of such effort. Thank you. Namaskar. Well, um, quite a policy statement though, must say, not much in terms of action or even takeaways on the growth front or otherwise. Uh, so <laughs> the two things that stood out for me, Tamanna, one, I, I love the dialogue. In the past, the elephant in the room was inflation. Now it's gone for a walk, <laughs> heading to the forest. But that notwithstanding, two things. One, we'll continue unwaveringly focusing on inflation, saying that MPC should remain disinflationary. So mm -hmm. the focus is on inflation and not growth thus far. Maybe mm -hmm. growth is taking care of itself, though they didn't raise the targets. And RBI will continue to constructively engage with financial sector entities. I believe a lot of questioning will happen yeah. in the press meet. I think those two stood out for me. So um, the other bit on inflation which stood out for me was when he said that till we don't reach our target, our work is not done. Yeah. And then you look at the inflation uh, outlook for the next four quarters and uh, there is no case right now to understand why they would cut rates because that target is not in sight. 4% is the target. Now, in none of those quarters is 4% in sight. So Except for quarter two, but which is just a passing thing, 3.9%. Yeah. yeah, so that's neither yeah, here nor passing, there. Yeah. The year is 4.5%. So you're way off. So now that makes me wonder whether you're going to have a rate cut this year at all. In terms of dialogues, Umbrella was my favorite. You know, when he talked about how uh, the RPA was criticized when Forex reserves came down, he said we had an umbrella, there was heavy rain, we used it. Now we've built it back up. Anyway, so a lot of interesting things to unpack over here. Jayesh Mehta is with us. He's VC and CEO of DSP Finance. Tanvi Gupta Jain, uh, UBS is India Economist, also with us. Uh, welcome uh, to both of you. Thank you so much for speaking with us uh, on the show on NDTV Profit. Jayesh Mehta, let me begin with your first take. What was the outlook that you really saw coming through in terms of a rate cut timeline? I think, uh, I think as per expectation, it was very clear. We're not going to touch rates. Uh, and as you just said, till we reach four or or us cuts rate so you know from that perspective uh, i think nowadays is a little bit dicey whether us may actually cut rate or not so that's a question mark which is coming in uh, but having said that uh, growth is taking care of itself uh, that's what you just said recently uh, uh, inflation at four and a half for second half from uh, second quarter onwards uh, we still have some room to cut rate because at the end of the day, you know, one has to really look at it like 2% real rate uh, on repo uh, that that may, you know, fizzle down growth uh, if it continues for a longer period. So at some point of time, whether international market cuts rates or not, uh, we may still have to cut rate provided, uh, you know, the global geopolitical oil price, rainfall, everything remains as per projected. All right, so it, it might, so either Fed becomes the trigger or we hit four, maybe at four and a half percent as well. So I suppose quarter two onwards, the case gets stronger. Tanvi, uh, very good morning to you as well. You know, your take on the rate cut sort of uh, comments and what you glean out of it. And also perhaps were you surprised that the target for next year for growth continues to be at seven percent when you've seen such robust data coming in? Sure. Uh, so let me start with, uh, uh, you know, what what is my take in today's policy? So if I look at the way Indian economic growth on the ground remains robust and the manageable macro stability risk, uh, we clearly were of the view that there is no urgency for the MPC to either change the policy setting, whether it means rates or stance at this juncture. Uh, but going forward, I think... I would say looking at the policy, RBI was sounding a little cautious, uh, largely on two counts. One, uh, we are seeing global oil prices have moved higher over the last few days. They are hovering at around $90 a barrel, plus uncertainty on the food prices. I mean, if I look at uh, Indian Med Department recently forecasted longer heat wave 
between April to June. I mean, whenever we have seen warmer temperatures, we have seen vegetable prices, fruit prices. There is a possibility of them, uh, of the prices to go up. So clearly, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty on the food inflation bet. Uh, going forward beyond June, uh, we are all expecting that La Nina, which typically brings more rainfall, uh, will set in by June. So hopefully a monsoon season uh, between June to September, we end up seeing a normal monsoon, which will help keep food prices in check. Uh, but at this point, obviously you need to price in because RBI categorically is highlighting that the medium term target is to take CPI down to 4% and then they're not happy to CPI hovering uh, you know uh, at, at a rate which is much higher I mean currently it is trading at 5.1 the expectation is that the March inflation print will be somewhere between 4.8 uh, that is what our estimate is on the rate cut assumption, we still have a shallow easing cycle in our FI25 uh, policy rate forecast, but that too is a function of three things. One, how the weather uncertainty will play out. Second is oil. Uh, third is, uh, and the most important is a Fed pivot. Uh, so as of now, we are also estimating a June uh, rate cut by the US Fed, but looking at how the US data has been surprising of, on an upside in case it gets pushed forward, I think it will be very difficult for RBI to go ahead and start cutting rates. So as of now, we do have a shallow easing cycle, mostly backdated, and will also be a function of how the global monetary easing pans out over this year. Tanvi, uh, good morning, Neera Jair. Is, is, uh, is the context such a bad thing, considering that the RBI is not forced uh, to go ahead with any kind of rate decision, simply because global growth and India growth by itself, within the current interest rate scenario also, seems to be doing okay. Absolutely. I mean, India's growth is doing very well. I mean, people are talking about whether India's growth has decoupled, which never is the case, but definitely Indian economy has been holding up very well. The other point which Neeraj, I think we should all take into account, I think which Jayesh also met, uh, mentioned, is that a real policy rate, which will start moving into restrictive territory from September onwards, uh, because of faster than expected disinflation. So in case you do see in the September quarter that the CPI inflation is falling below 4%, and your repo rate is still at 6.5%, you're actually talking about 250 basis point real rates in India, which definitely could be constraining growth. So the point is we need a, some fine balance at some point in time, whether we want to wait for the Fed pivot to happen or uh, we need to wait for how the global macroeconomic dynamics are panning out over the coming months. Jesh, coming on that, that's an important point. We do, uh, let's assume the RBI's assessment of 3.9% is correct for quarter two. We hit circa those levels. Real rates remain high. What does the RBI do? Because it's shown its hand saying that that is passe because quarter three and quarter four, the numbers will be higher and average is still 4.5. So how, what, what do you expect the central bank to do in the ensuing two policies when these real rates are these high? I think, uh, you know, by uh, end of second quarter, right, uh, you will get over the weather if there is, a, there are a few cautions, right, weather, uh, crude prices, uh, you know, once you get over that, and of course, you don't have any new geopolitical situation. Um, for us, geopolitical situation means basically crude price remaining stable. Um, if that, or supply chain not getting disrupted. Now, if that are the scenarios, uh, you know, it's even at four and a half uh, for the annual year, right? Uh, because last quarter also they mentioned four and a half. I still think that they will definitely go for uh, some cut uh, once everything is uh, envisaged. Right now it's all about projections, subject to rainfall, subject to uh, climate, subject to, you know, geopolitical crude oil and all that. Now, if that clarity gets by second quarter, maybe then they have room uh, to at least show some softness and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, support the growth uh, at that point of time. Jesh, sorry, just to just to rewind this, uh, you you would expect the central bank to take a rate decision even if the Fed were not to take that decision at that point of time. Absolutely, absolutely, because you see, if everything is projecting out, so they don't need to really wait till four percent to actually cut the rate, right? So if it is four and a half, and if they think. Uh, as you said in the beginning, elephant is not coming back from forest uh, for because by that time they will project uh, first two quarter of next financial year. Uh, if they think that it is maintainable, then they would definitely go for that. Naturally, if it is uh, next quarter forecast looks more than four and a half, then they may still not do it. 
So will they, won't they? Uh, obviously, that debate continues. But uh, another couple of statements that I found um, as a positive surprise in how assertive they were, and I'm coming to Tanvi Gupta with this question, is on rural demand catching up. Uh, and saying that consumption will support economic growth going forward. He's saying urban consumption remains buoyant and the outlook for agri and rural activity is bright. All of this, of course, based on a normal southwest monsoon. Now, in the real world, you're still seeing that distress. You're looking at business updates coming in from FMCG players, consumption companies, and they're still seeing that distress. Are we now on the ground going to be seeing a change in that narrative? Was that fairly clear from what the governor was saying? Sure. So if you look at on the ground consumption indicators, we can clearly see uh, there's a quite a wide gap between affluent Indian consumption holding up, whereas the demand for the low middle class and the low income consumer uh, is actually slowing down. And it is showing up in data in most of the FMCG companies' uh, data. You can clearly see that there's a clear divergence between the affluent versus the not so affluent consumer demand. So going forward in FI25, if we end up seeing a normal monsoons and inflation remains on a decelerating path, so we are also on the camp of a 4.5% inflation for India, uh, there are two positive things on the consumption bit. One, uh, you will see that rural consumption will begin to improve, uh, which was quite mixed last year. Uh, if I look at rural consumption, uh, we did see a lot of supply side intervention by the government last year in a bid to control inflation. For example, there were export bans announced on rice, wheat, etc., which if we end up seeing a normal monsoon, my first uh, expectation was that all these export bans gets reversed which will bode well for the rural consumption also because their income power or the income levels will go up. The second is whenever inflation is falling, it actually bodes well for the real household disposable income. Again, bodes well for the consumption perspective. Uh, so going into FI25, in our base case, we also have a consumption pickup or improvement versus FI24 in our forecast, uh, largely driven by the rural consumption uh, improving. And it should start showing up in numbers uh, in the September quarter onwards. I don't think so. It will start showing up in numbers at least in the next two to three months. Jaish, you have a take on this, that uh, are we seeing the first signs or at least a sort of, um, uh, I would say, a first declaration that the rural uh, consumption pain story might be shifting, coming from the governor? I think governor and I think some of the researchers are also saying that that's kind of that pain kind of shifting. Uh, so that is uh, what I'm hearing, but I, I, I really would not have much take on that uh, uh, situation. But yeah, that's what I, it's more like uh, I did hear from one or two research guys also uh, last week that uh, that change is changing. Okay. Just one quick word on, on the currency. I mean, the, we don't need the RBI governor, of course, to tell us that it has been very stable. We know it has been. Uh, but just the fact that there are so many global factors that play out here too. Uh, flows notwithstanding, the reserves are still high. Do you think the average pace of depreciation of the currency uh, improves the, or does the currency become a headache of some sorts for the Reserve Bank during the course of the rest of the year because of geopolitics? I think uh, uh, you know we 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 uh, people were expecting us to appreciate our currency to appreciate and uh, we still believe that with your uh, JP Morgan index inclusion and stuff. But at the same time, we have to see other uh, export economy they 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 depreciate much. Uh, we cannot really appreciate. So I think we'll have to see that trend. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about uh, mainly China. And that's where uh, it would be maintaining parity. If they depreciate, uh, we would depreciate a little bit, uh, and they may let it go uh, from that perspective. But otherwise, overall, if everything uh, geopolitical and all this stuff are better, uh, we should look at some appreciation uh, post June onwards uh, when the flow starts. And of course, uh, also the election would be behind us, right? So both the things matter. You know, I just want to highlight one point, uh, very important, which has been made in the announcement, uh, actually two points. One is uh, green bond in IFC. Uh, we have to see the detail how it will work, but that's a good start. And very important is retail direct uh, uh, mobile app, right, by RBI. Uh, so that's something, uh, you know, a game changer. Uh, 
I, I think the two more steps required going forward is to allow just like equity others also do it and uh, at some point of time repo for uh, retail so these are the things uh, going forward but this is a very good start uh, what they have done uh, is to get retail mobile uh, direct app this will be by rbi but of course we have to see the guideline how it comes okay so before me and tamanna ask something to tanvi because i have a question on growth to bajesh green bonds i mean why do you think it is such a game changing thing no, it, more than green bond, uh, it is, I would say, it is the mechanism. So the mechanism of NRIs and others. So you are basically widening the market. Green bond is just the start to do it uh, at IFC. Uh, so this is actually, so that's what I said, like, you know, it's a, it's a great, good start. It's right now, today is green bond, tomorrow it could be something else, right? So it's a good start to look at. Uh, but we still need to see that. And I think uh, Retail Direct is a big one. Uh, I personally uh, had been asking for it for a long time. So finally it's come through. Well, uh, you know, you have now an investment, uh, a class of investors who are uh, have increased appetites and, and want to look at different options. So yeah, that'll be interesting to follow. Uh, Tanvi, I just want to sort of come back to a question I asked you earlier and it was bunched up with the inflation one, so perhaps we didn't get a chance to address it properly. But again, on the 7% growth outlook, yes. all things considered, you are the bright spot that is India. Everything is looking good. Your uh, high-frequency data is, is, you know, your PMI manufacturing service pointing out to robust growth. Then why just 7%? <laughs> Okay, so if you look at, we do see upside risk to even FI24, second advance estimate by CSO, which is 7.6. So in case that number is closer to 8%, because as uh, you mentioned, and my lead indicator is telling me that the economic momentum on the ground is very robust, you might see that FI24 number or the growth would actually surprise on an upside versus what the CSO second advance estimate of 7.6 is saying. If there is an upside surprise in FI24 number, I would say at that point, FI25 growth of 7% looks very, very reasonable. In fact, at UBS also, we have a forecast of a 7% GDP growth for FI25. You need to take into account that when you look at FI24 number, there were a couple of statistical nuances which were at play. There was a base effect and there was a uh, significantly lower GDP deflator, which is not going to be the case in FI25. So FI25 uh, on a like-to-like -like basis, a 7% growth adjusted for the statistical nuances of FI24 is actually showing a good recovery. And it is in line with what the high frequency data on the ground is telling you. Okay. Uh, so I think I was more of the camp that the GDP growth will not get revised upwards. And looks like uh, this is where RBI is also standing on the FI25 GDP growth estimates. So it's not that the RBI is being too careful, but the statistical sort of, you know, when we saw that 8.1% quarterly number, et cetera, so the statistical sort of alterations and aberrations have been accounted for. But uh, yeah, that's, that's an important thing. So high growth, inflation cooling off, and the markets are responding to what we are seeing as well, isn't it, Neeraj? Yeah, just to actually, before we take that next question, Tamanda, that's a good cue. Just just mark what the indices are doing as well, mm. because it's not at all banks are doing well, by the way. Selectively, some banks are doing well. Uh, HDFC in particular, piling on the gains, but it's not that everything else is doing well, because the likes of ICSA, Bajaj Finance, Axis Bank, etc., are down as well. So just a quick marking there. There's a bit of a lone star phenomenon there um, in terms of HDFC Bank. Just one quick word, Tanvi. On, 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 on what is often repeated, but mentioned again by the Reserve Bank, this is my last question to you, of course, on, uh, on, on this private capex optimism, which is very selective, even though, the, I mean, everything else, which is government capex, healthy balance sheet, rising capacity utilization, all well known. But yeah, private capex optimism, not necessarily quite visible, but the RBI governor reiterating it two policies in a row. Okay, uh, so if I look at the private corporate capex and look at where are we seeing based on the data of 4,500 companies that we track, which I would say largely account for the bulk of the corporate capex in India, there is a pickup, but it is not broad-based. Uh, it, uh, so it is, again, 
uh, led by a few selected companies rather than expecting a broad based private corporate capex recovery which would have been the case because the underlying drivers of capex are well in place the corporate balance sheet has been deleveraged banks are banks asset quality concerns remains very manageable more than happy to lend and they are lending towards consumption i really hope that the demand for investment uh, loans actually comes in which is which will lead to a much more sustainable uh, credit growth cycle but at this point uh, the prospects for private corporate capex are definitely bright but it is not showing yet in terms of a broad based corporate capex recovery the hope is post elections uh, it gathers steam uh, but we are actually if you look at my capex growth numbers for fy25 there is some deceleration uh, in overall capex uh, we are expecting it to gather steam mostly in fy26 if i specifically look at the private corporate capex growth uh, forecast uh, going forward yeah, absolutely. Another positive is uh, the governor talking about how their consumer confidence survey uh, show for the next one year uh, shows a, a completely upbeat sort of outlook from Indian consumer. So uh, that's sort of a, a, a thumbs up as well. Thank you so much, Jayesh and Tanvi, for joining us on this leg of our coverage as we break down uh, the RBI monetary policy announcement and what it means. Of course, no change in rates, as was widely expected. Um, inflation numbers at 4.5% for the next financial year. That's the target. Growth at about 7%. Um, what has reacted in the markets? Well, nothing much really, to be honest. Banks are relatively better in an otherwise flat market completely. On the Nifty and Sensex, you're not seeing much movement at all. Let's pull up uh, what the broader markets are doing because it's pretty much just the bank nifty showing some resilience but um, yeah your mid cap index about half a percent up your small cap uh, also about half a percent up but nothing much happening there when i talk about banks and neeraj is absolutely right uh, lone star kind of a show hdfc bank some you know of the smaller players doing well avas um, and equitas all of these kind of um, uh, you know players are showing some movement Avas Finance up about 7%. Equitas Small Finance Bank has actually given up some of its gains uh, through the day. So some volatility coming in. There was an announcement um, uh, from the RBI, but we have to wait and see what uh, it uh, goes into in terms of allowing a larger coverage of derivative trade for small finance banks. Mm. So AU Small Finance Bank also about a percent up. But uh, we'll have to delve into that a little deeper. Apart from banks, pharma has been having a good day. Uh, and perhaps that's a bit of a defensive play. Yeah, and, 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 and maybe this US policy about, you know, a new health package, et cetera, who knows, all of that could be in focus. But yeah, a sector wherein select pockets haven't done well for quite some time turning around. Let's wait and watch. Uh, but just round off this piece that me and Taman are doing on the policy with uh, one more expert before we call it today. And that is Anurag Mittal, Head of Fixed Income at UTI Asset Management, joining us right now on the show. Anurag, really appreciate you taking the time out at this last moment and talking to us. Neeraj here, good morning. Uh, what did you make of the policy from, 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 a, from, a, from somebody who manages a book of fixed income? Did this uh, bring about any material changes for you? Uh, we think the policy is BAU, and it's largely in continuation of the you know Feb 2024 policy. If you see the there was a five is to one voting with you know members uh, voting to retain the stance as well as retain the repo rate. I think RBI uh, rightly uh, is not going to, uh, towards a pre-committed path given the uncertainty and pr unpredictability of food inflation, and I think uh, they are re reiterating that they want to have a strong visibility on that 4% inflation target uh, before they take any major rate action. Uh, we believe that market was largely anticipating this policy. So from a, even from a market perspective, it's not really any surprise. And I think with policy now out of the way, uh, going ahead probably, uh, you know, bond market will be looking at how inflation and especially food inflation uh, pans out in the near term. Anurag, um... The, the the rhetoric at the start of the year or maybe last quarter of the previous calendar was great time to buy into fixed income funds simply because we're seeing an interest rate trajectory which is headed lower now if at all we'll see a shallow one who knows even that might get altered i don't know if you think differently right. my question is is it better to space out uh, that investment piece or are you firmly believing that yields are headed lower rates are headed lower and bonds are headed higher so thanks for that. So see, uh, we do expect about 50 to 75 basis of rate cut 
in this monetary uh, you know policy cycle probably in the next 6 to 12 months uh, i think one good thing uh, which has happened in the last 12 months is meaningful repricing uh, of even the moderate duration of the yield curve so if, even if you look at you know the 3 to 4 year part of the yield curve and uh, AAA bonds, they're yielding anywhere between 770 to uh, 780 and thereabouts. So investors don't have to take meaningful duration risk. Even if they uh, look at high credit quality, moderate duration products, they are giving them very attractive accrual and opportunity to participate you know, in uh, some amount of capital gains as the rate cycle starts. Like you rightly said, probably it's a shallower rate cycle with too much fluidity around. So probably it makes sense to stick to uh, moderate duration rather than go for very uh, long end of the yield curve. Mm, absolutely. The, you know, the uncertainty has not become too much clearer after the policy announcement, uh, all in yeah. all. Yeah. Anurag, thank you so much for your time. Great to have you on the show. And uh, with that, we're wrapping out this leg of our coverage on the monetary policy, impact on markets, etc. But uh, it's just a very short break, and we'll be right back with a lot more updates on what is happening in the markets. Stay tuned. I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager.
वेलकम यू ट्यून इन टू द स्मॉल एंड मिड कैप शो आई महिमा वाचराजानी एंड विथ मी इज हर्ष सायता वेल बिफोर वी मूव ऑन टू आर मैनेजमेंट्स फॉर टुडे वी मेनली गोइंग टू टॉक टू यू ग्रो कैपिटल एंड फेड बैंक ऑन द मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी लेट्स टेक अ क्विक चेक ऑन हाउ द मार्केट्स आर पैनिंग आउट टू बी वेल इन टर्म्स ऑफ द बेंच मार्क इंडाइसिस दे डिड ओपन इन रेड एंड करेंटली ट्रेडिंग फ्लैट निफ्टी इज ट्रेडिंग एट पॉइंट जीरो फाइव परसेंट एट प्रेजेंट द टॉप लेगार्ड्स ऑन द निफ्टी इंक्लूड बी पी सी एल एल एन टी ग्रासिम बजाज फाइनेंस नाउ कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटर्स टू द निफ्टी वेल दर इज एच डी एफ सी बैंक आई टी सी कोटक बट द वंस दैर आर लैगिंग इन रेड एल एन टी आई सी आई सी आई भारती एयरटेल एंड सो ऑन नाउ इवन इन टर्म्स ऑफ सेंसेक्स द सेंसेक्स इज ऑल्सो ट्रेडिंग इन अ वेरी फ्लैट रेंज ऑलमोस्ट इन अ रेंज ऑफ अराउंड थर्टी थ्री फोर्टी पॉइंट्स नाउ लेट्स लेट्स टेक अ क्विक चेक ऑन हाउ द निफ्टी बैंक इज डूइंग द इंडेक्स हैज नॉट रियली मूवड मच आफ्टर द मॉनिटरी पॉलिसी इट्स अराउंड पॉइंट टू टू फोर परसेंट हायर um uh, in terms of the broader markets the broader markets are at days high uh, both nifty mid cap 150 100 and small cap 250 are trading uh, around 0.5% higher but uh, what is happening in the sectors and some stocks that are really moving today harsh well yes let's pull up uh, the sectoral indices mahima you're right uh, and let's also zoom in on some of the interest rate sensitives uh, something like a nifty realty is trading a percent and a half higher so clearly positive uh, even though nothing with regard to rates or nothing with regard to even commentary uh on what uh, the likely or when the likely cut could actually come in terms of the repo rate uh but to analyze this and more uh let me quickly divert focus uh we have kishor loda who's the chief financial officer at ugro capital to talk to us about uh, of course the policy announcement itself the commentary of the rbi as well as how ugro is doing uh welcome to the show mr loda thank you so much ads well uh, so so tell us what do you make of the rbi commentary because uh, no rate cut signaled or no timing discussed per se so if you look at the policy as a whole it is more or less in the expected line and so last three four monetary policies rbi's focus has been inflation and fortunately at this point of time for uh, the growth is not a concern uh, we will be growing at the rate of 7.6% this year and next year also rbi is projecting gdp growth of uh, uh, 7.2% so growth is uh, certainly not a concern at this point of time uh, we will be the highest growing economy among the all the major economies in the world uh, liquidity uh, rbi is monitoring uh, very tightly and there are multiple intervention whenever either there is surplus or shortfall of liquidity so liquidity is being managed well uh, uh, and growth is not a concern hence uh, at this point of time rbi is completely focused on inflation Uh, RBI has given a uh, target of four uh, percent as the benchmark for in targeted inflation. At this moment, though it is moderating, we have reached an inflation of five point one percent, but still it is far uh, away from the target of four percent. Food inflation uh, continues to remain a worry, whereas uh, core inflation has been uh, moderated significantly. uh food inflation is likely uh, to give uh, some amount of uh, trouble in the uh, near term also though monsoon is likely uh, to be good uh, so it is possible that uh, we may see a good uh, crop this year as well uh, but in the internationally the crude prices are inching up so that may be a worry so we will have to continue to um, watch the inflation scenario and we can expect that if in, uh, inflation moderates further uh, uh in the uh, quarter 3 of the uh, upcoming year we may see some amount of rate cut by that time internationally also we may see some amount of rate cut by the major uh, major uh, central banks of the world uh, so we, we can expect a uh, rate cut around third quarter of the year uh, provided that the inflation remains in check uh, the other key takeaways from uh, this uh, monetary policy is that Uh, RBI is continuously uh, monitoring some of the other uh, factors as well uh, whereas they have announced an LCR framework revision of LCR framework for banks where if any concentration concentrated uh, withdrawal happens from banks to manage that how the LCR will work uh, they will shortly uh, formulate a draft policy and circulate for the uh, recommendation and comments by uh, the public and the bankers at large 
uh, and also uh, the UPA, the focus on uh, uses of UPI continues to remain high now. Uh, people can deposit money through using UPI at the CDMs and also use, uh, can make payment through third-party apps. Right. So these are the major takeaway from uh, the policy. Right, Mr. Loda. Well, Mahima, this side, uh, just wanted to understand, so when the Fed uh, rate cuts will come in, that's when you're expecting the rate cut here, is it? It is not likely, it is not like apple to apple comparison. It is not that if the Fed rate uh, uh, cut, then RBI will automatically cut. Uh, but uh, it is likely that since the uh, now inflation is at around 5% and uh, benchmark rates are 6.5%. So it is there is a significant divergence between the benchmark rates and uh, the benchmark rates. And if it is RBI's target for next year, inflation is 4.5%. So there the uh, divergence will be 2%, which is... Uh, which is significantly uh, high. Uh, so if the uh, inflation moves around 4.5%, so then we can expect that uh, anywhere between 50 to 75% uh, rate cut. So the primary uh, benchmark for rate cut would be our own inflation rather than the Fed. Okay, and uh, you know, let me switch focus more on the lender or on lenders and what RBI has been doing uh, on the regulatory front. You know, uh, several key decisions made over the last six months. Do you now think that no commentary coming from the RBI is actually a plus in a certain way? And that there will be no regulatory curbs anymore with regard to both lending and lenders? Uh, well, uh, 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 I hope so. Uh, I can just expect that there are no further shocks which are awaiting us. But... Uh, you can never predict uh, RBI would be knowing many more things which we may not know and the regulatory in interventions may come anytime. So you cannot predict by uh, reading through the policy that regulatory interventions would not be uh, coming. Uh, uh, but but it is always, uh, you have to uh, see it from the both sides of the coin. Uh, on the one side, people may think that these are harsh on the market or individual entities or individual sectors, but Generally, whenever such measures are taken, they are for the greater good of the country and greater good of the economy. So, also we have to see it from the both sides of the coin. Uh, however, uh, seeing this policy, you cannot predict that tomorrow there would be no uh, no uh, intervention by RBI in any se segment. Sure. And with regard to unsecured itself, uh, any risk at all that you are seeing in your books with regard to unsecured or do you still feel that, uh, and, and we had spoken with uh, uh, Mr. Nath as well, uh, you know, maybe last month, uh, and at that point at least there were no concerns. Uh, do you still feel that the industry as a whole as well as your own self, uh, any concerns with regard to asset quality? Well, people are uh, mixing up between unsecured or among the segments. Uh, so there is a large segment of uh, personal loan and consumer credit. People are mixing it with uh, any other un unsecured lending. So consumer lending, uh, personal loans, and MSME unsecured loans are quite different in behavior and, and in nature. Uh, so unsecured lending in uh, uh, consumer as well as uh, personal loans may be uh, seeing a very robust growth in the recent year, which is uh, which is a concern for RBI. And RBI has been advising for la almost a year now that we all the lenders, including the banks and private lenders like NBFC, should be cautious on personal loans as well as consumer lending. However, government is continuously focusing on MSME credit. Uh, the MSME credit uh, is the gap, credit gap is widening by the day. Now the credit gap in MSME segment itself is almost 90 lakh crore. Government has taken uh, many initiative like uh, credit guarantee scheme, uh, mudra, swanidhi, etc. But but it is not enough. Uh, the credit gap in this segment is increasing. Hence, uh, there is a further need to, uh, to create liquidity and uh, credit opportunities for MSME segment, which is the largest employer in India. Almost 15 crore people are employed in this segment. Hence, it is expected that uh, uh, when we will see new government in uh, place in two to three months' time, uh, some new initiative may come in uh, when we will have uh, a new budget in place uh, sometime in July, August uh, for MSME segment and uh, increasing the credit flow in the segment. 
Having said that, uh, the, as far as the quality of the credit, uh, we are not seeing any kind of stress in MSME right. uh, unsecured book as well. Unsecured credit is behaving absolutely the same manner as it was behaving a year back or two years back. Uh, there is no deterioration in the credit quality. Right. Right, Ms. Lola, I also wanted to understand that if the rate cut happens whenever, uh, what will be the impact on margins, one thing, and will you pass it on? Well, it is it is a uh, it is a given thing that whenever rate cut happens, it uh, the passing on happens with a leg. So if you see that last increase in rate happened almost a year back, but still uh, banks and uh, banks are still passing on those rates uh, to the consumer and borrower till now. Uh, recently, some banks have increased the rate. So still full passing of that. Uh, increase has not happened. So similarly, when the rate cut will happen, the ultimate uh, borrower will benefit with a leg effect only. But uh, sooner or later, they definitely it will pass on to the uh, borrower, ultimate borrowers. It will take time. Normally, it takes three to six months time when it transmits into the real uh, right, action. Right. No, I think I think what uh, Mahima is trying to allude to, Mr. Loda, is the fact that whether, uh, say, for example, a 25 basis point rate cut or a 50 basis point rate cut, a moderate kind of a rate cut, how much of that will you actually pass on? Uh, and how much of that will uh, probably aid your name? Well, uh, the entire thing has to be passed on with a leg effect. It is not that, uh, and it will not not either compress or reduce because our borrowing cost will reduce to, uh, to that extent. And to that extent, we will be happy to pass into to the ultimate borrowers. OK. OK, understood. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Loda, for uh, all of that. Uh, you know, uh, thanks for giving us all of that perspective with regard to both Ugro as well as uh, the RBI policy itself. Uh, time to slip into a very short break. Uh, we'll see you on the other side. We have the management of Federal Bank on the other side. Strong set of numbers on both the deposits and advances front, as well as, of course, the RBI policy. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. <laughs> Welcome back, you're watching the Small and Mid-Cap Show. Well, Federal Bank is in focus on the back of um, the strong numbers that they've posted. And we have Ashutosh Khajuria, Chief Mentor from Federal Bank, who joins us now. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me here in right. this show. Right. So, Mr. Khajuria, my first question to you is that uh, the monetary policy, the rapid rate, rate, remains unchanged. What are you making out of this? What sense does it make to Fed Bank? So I think uh, Governor has uh, reiterated this time also that the target, uh, you know, CPI is 4%. I mean, it's not, I mean, just don't look at the band that if it has come below 6%, so we are happy with that. And no co complacency should creep in. 
And he very clearly mentioned that our target continues to be 4%. And for next financial year, FI20, I mean, the current financial year, rather, which has recently started, um, uh, the, the, the projection for CPI is at 4.5%, which is 50 basis points higher than uh, the, the, the target uh, inflation. So I think price stability continues to be uh, the prime focus. Uh, and fortunately, on the growth front, uh, the, the numbers that are coming out are better than expectation. So in view of that, there is a headroom for RBI to, uh, I mean, for monetary policy committee to, uh, you know, I mean, have uh, a close watch on how the, um, the, the growth, uh, you know, happens during the year because for next financial year, uh, the, the projection once again of GDP has been 7%. Uh, so rather, I think uh, th there could be an upward bias there and it may happen, you know, more than 7% as well as we saw in FY24. So I think in view of that, uh, uh, you know, I think um, in, you know, cutting the rate in haste uh, should not, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, be an impediment in the process of price stability. That's one part, but then there is a case of rate cut when you look at the real interest rates because... Uh, Today, if you take a one-year treasury bill, which is around, say, 7% risk-free return, and vis-a-vis -vis you take one year's uh, projection of inflation, which is at 4.5%, there seems to be um, a, a real uh, rate of somewhere around 2.6% or so. Because, uh, you know, I mean, what would a person, uh, you know, have an erosion in his uh, purchasing power uh, would be measured by what type of inflation you are looking at. And if there is no credit risk, we are talking of the sovereign treasury bill of one year, and the return there is, say, 7% or 7.1%. Against that, if inflation projection for next year and hoping that this projection comes true hmm. is 4.5%, then the, the, um, the real interest rate that, uh, that an investor gets would be in excess of 26 or around 2.6%. So there is a case, I think, real interest rate uh, can be brought down to below 2%. Hmm. And... Uh, I think uh, there is no fixed formula for that. Sure. You should have one and a half or two or whatever it is. But I think uh, below two or around two um, would be a reasonable. In fact, uh, it should be around one and a half percent or so. Sure. So if that be the case, uh, we can have a reduction in it. And uh, let me tell you, right now, vis-a-vis -vis repo rate, uh, the spread is about 50 to 60 basis points for one right. year risk-free return. Mm -hmm. This may come down. You may even see, uh, you know, the the treasurable and equivalent instruments quoting even below repo rate okay. in case there is a strong case built up that in next one year you may have two, three or four cuts. So that expectation of rate cut also can bring down the the, the yield on uh, you know one year risk free. Sure. So I think in view, of, in view of that if we look at that I think in second half you may have a situation where you know either the rate cut happens or there is a strong Build up of expectation of rate cut, which will bring down the 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 uh, sovereign uh, yield. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, so I take your point, and I think very comprehensively covered pretty much most of the basis. If I can try and uh, take your view with regard to the deposit growth environment, Q4 has been extremely strong. Some of the banks have declared, including Federal, have declared very strong growth on the deposits front. Do you see some pressure easing, or is it just seasonality? See, basically, uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, deposit is a very important uh, component of banking. You know, basically, when he, banking is defined itself in Banking Regulation Act, it is to accept deposits for on lending and all. Now, if there is a demand for, uh, you know, funds, uh, you have a very healthy credit growth. Even if you exclude HDFC Limited's, uh, you know, uh, numbers, which are now merged with HDFC Bank and therefore, all those, uh, you know, uh, numbers have become part of all scheduled commercial banks. And therefore, suddenly you see in banking sector, the credit growth looks, you know, more than what actually it has been. So if you are having around, say, 19, 20% of credit growth uh, of all scheduled commercial banks and exclude HDFC Limited from that, then also uh, the, the loan growth over last year, I mean, comparing apples with apples would be around, say, 16 or maybe around 16, 16.5% or so. Uh, the numbers for 
29th March are not yet out and all. I mean, being a Friday. So a reporting Friday would be there. Uh, you know, I think it's today. So today is the reporting Friday. So for this, then which which would be represented uh, representative of uh, the 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 uh, you know closest to 31st March, and uh, these would come out um, you know after 14 days. So lag of 14 days. So on 19th April we would come to know what was 5th April all scheduled commercial banks uh, loans and advances. Right. So my uh, guess is I think it would be closer to say about six, any, any, anywhere between 16 to 17 percent. That's a very okay. healthy growth. And Got to it. fund that growth, you need to have deposit mobilization and mm. uh, banks are already focused on it. And uh, I think if you see quarter on quarter growth, I think it's ranging between, you know, five to six percent for all the banks uh, mm. deposits as well as growth. So credit is good. Credit growth is good. And mm. therefore, there is focus on deposit mobilization. Right. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to lastly squeeze in one question with regard to HDFC Bank. They're clearly calibrating their loan growth. I know you can't comment on HDFC Bank, but I want to understand the, on, uh, the second rung impact on the industry. This is a large bank calibrating growth. Does that offer a larger opportunity for other players like you and other lenders, especially in retail, especially in housing, where their focus seems to be to calibrate growth. Uh, is this a larger opportunity for uh, other lenders to start to pick through on the market share? See, just look at uh, the, the impact of merger. You know, if you have more, more than 6 trillion rupees worth of loan book increasing just by merger, on the other hand, deposits have gone up by hardly 1.5 trillion. So you have 6 trillion on loans and advances added and hardly 1.5 uh, trillion, you know, uh, coming on the deposit side. There is a need for having more focus on deposits, so there would be more, you know, so-called, um, you know, efforts made for raising, uh, you know, uh, procuring deposits vis-a-vis -vis the credit. So quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth in loans and advances may look like, you know, one, one and a half percent or so, but it's not a small growth because ultimately that entire book from HDFC Limited also is, is now lying with HDFC Bank. So I think when you have a credit deposit ratio of more than 100 percent, then earliest is that you bring it down to maybe less than 100 first and then uh, around 90 percent or below 90 percent because that would be the healthier uh, CD ratio. But then uh, this is not something which is very prescriptive in nature and all because uh, deposit alone is not the the resources you can have the bonds also because the HDFC uh, Limited would have had uh, you know bonds in their book as mm. you know funding uh, resource for their assets. Mm. So those bonds are also now part of HDFC Bank. That money is that those funds are with them, and when they redeem, they will have to take care of the uh, you know I mean bond reduction with uh, that much of you know deposit growth and all. So they are right. preparing very well. Uh, I would see it you know a very healthy way of looking at. Uh, you know, how to balance the uh, loan book with, uh, you know, the deposits and all. Right. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Khajuria, thank you so much for taking out time and uh, speaking with us at NDTV Profit. With that, My yeah, with that, we're completely out of time. Uh, that's all we have on the show for now. Stay tuned for more news and updates on NDTV Profit. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy.
different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others... Hello and welcome. You're watching Ask Profit on NDTV Profit. I'm Smriti Chaudhary and this show is all about your stock related questions. So write to us on any of our social media channels or on the WhatsApp number that'll, that will be on your screen in a minute. You can also write uh, to us uh, through the YouTube live chat and we'll take your questions from there. Be it a long term query or a short term strategy. Right to us and we'll get them answered by our guests. But before we do that, do that let's uh, take a quick check on where the markets are currently at. The benchmark uh, index is uh, pretty much flat uh, right now and uh, it's trading. It's a range bound day for the market. It's uh, trading between those 100 points. Uh, it's a slight negative bias uh, on the benchmarks today, but um, all in all, not too much happening on the benchmarks, but uh, let's uh, look at some of the constituents of the benchmark and see uh, what's moving there. If you look at the uh, Lagards, there's uh, the likes of BPCL that's down about 2%, followed by Bajaj Finance on the back of a business update, uh, but down about 1.5%. Then there's LNT also down about 1.5%. Among gainers, you have uh, HDFC Bank again. Uh, the the largest gainer, the biggest uh, gainer on the benchmark today, up about over a percent. There's SBI Life also up about over a percent. Then there's Hero Motor Corp up uh, about eight tenth of a percent. Among sectors, uh, you have the realty sector that's doing uh, pretty well today. It's uh, if we can uh, pull up the real constituents of the realty sector as well, and uh, it's up about one and a half percent. And uh, you look at the constituents, you have Mahindra Life uh, that's up five percent, Godrej Properties up three percent, Obroy up two percent. There are some stocks in the negative, something like a Sobha, and uh, uh, and this is on the back of the business update that has come. And uh, let's also pull up the breadth of the market today. And uh, it's it's a bit of a, a flattish day. And there you can see a bit of chop and churn in the markets. We started off uh, with the favor and advances. It's still continuing that way. Took a shift, took a hit in the middle uh, in the morning trade. But uh, we're back with uh, the total... Uh, uh, the breath in the favor of the advances itself. But uh, let's look at some stock specific action and what's moving there. But uh, before I move on to that, let me first uh, mark the mid cap and the small cap index. You look at the broader end of the spectrum when mid cap is doing better than the benchmark. It's up about half a percent and small cap also up about half a percent. Let, now let's move on to some specific names, something like a Bajaj Finance, which is moving today on the back of its uh, business update. Now, uh, strong growth, but customer additions were disappointing. Then there's something like a Sheila Foam. If we can pull that up, uh, we're seeing uh, strong gains in Sheila Foam as well. This comes on the back of insurance compensation of about 21.4 uh, crores, up about 3%. Then there's Rashi Peripherals uh, that has received an order of 1,500 crores from NMDC data center. Now the market cap, pretty big order, it's up 5%. The market cap of the company is somewhere around 2,300 crores. So, a large uh, order there. Then you have something like a Purvankra that's moving uh, within the realty space and uh, that's on the back of sales value that's up 90% in FY24 and even in Q4. Uh, the, 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 it's uh, 
the sales value stands in the fourth quarter at 1947 crores but the focus for today is avas financiers this also is on the back of business update it's up 6% and uh, the intraday high was somewhere around 9% and uh, to elaborate on that uh, i'm joined by my colleague harsh saita harsh uh, strong growth there for avas but uh, do break down the numbers for us well yes uh, you know a strong set uh, overall uh, 22% growth on the aum front uh, and a good comeback when it comes to the disbursement growth disbursements mind you over the last couple of quarters took a bit of a knock because of uh, the tech stack which the company was uh, trying to improve on uh, that seems to be now behind them because they've gone back and they've disbursed a solid set of loans uh, and uh, therefore this largely according to city means that going forward the growth is set to continue city is building in a 25 24 to 26 kind of uh, 26% kind of growth number for fi 25 and 26 which is impressive for avas now already given the fact that uh, your uh, your loan growth is strong your gs3 is falling uh, which is gross stage 3 gross nps are have fallen around uh, 14 odd bips uh, on a sequential basis that's the other positive what you're expecting or what city is expecting to see is a lower credit cost number they are putting credit costs at roughly uh, 15 basis points which is 0.15% which is as low as it can possibly get right um and the other piece that city is projecting is roa improvement in this quarter so therefore quite bullish on uh, avas they have a 1830 rupee target price on avas which is still at least 20% away from the current market price so uh, plenty of upside still left despite the 6 and a half 7% move today right thank you so much harsh for that uh, now to discuss more on this we're joined by vaishali parekh from prabudas leeladhar and ashish maheshwari from arihant capital market uh, thank you to both of you for joining us today on the show but uh, let's start with you ashish on avas you heard about the numbers uh, and uh, this is a seasonally this is a strong quarter as well but the question remains is this growth sustainable how are you looking at these numbers and what kind of uh, do you also see this sort of target that city has provided a 20% growth in the stock price uh, in the next one year itself Yes, as far as Avas is concerned, just one month back, his stock was at 52 week low on account mm-hmm. of uh, a large block deal which happened. So uh, from that uh, from that price, the stock has already moved up by 200 odd rupees. Now, as far as fundamentals are concerned, the Avas is not something uh, uh, like where you are like you uh, uh, can see 50 percent kind of CAGR etc. They are slow and steady because they are. Uh, targeting a certain state of society where you need to have a lot of accounts to get the kind of growth is uh, warranted for. Even if we see last three quarter numbers, also they are very really static and steady kind of numbers. Am I am I expecting similar trend will continue in this quarter also? Uh, if we see last two years from three fifty five to four thirty, and this year also I am expecting four fifty crore kind of profit. Rate. profit so it will move in narrow range though so as the sector uh, outlook is quite robust uh, so uh, 1800 cannot be ruled out which is 50 to be high for avas financial so on any decline the stock should be added uh, not at this price all right fair point uh, let's start with the questions now the first ones are coming from prasanna raj from pondicherry this one's uh, on hudco now they say they bought the stock at 42 and sold at 200 so they made a big profit there but uh, they want to know if uh, this is a good time to enter the stock once again now vishali from the charts uh, would you suggest uh, this is the, this is an ideal buying range for hudco well no actually um Uh, the stock has already run up. I mean, after a bit of a consolidation, I think the stock has really consolidated. I mean, uh, run up right from 170 levels. So I would say uh, we've seen a run up of around 30 to 40 rupees from here on. Better to buy at uh, in decline at around 190 levels if the opportunity arises, because yes, the long term trend still shows strength, and um, this can go towards 220 to 250 levels from here on. But as far as the technical levels are concerned, I would say. better to buy it in decline any specific target well i just said that the first target that i would be looking at is around 225 the next projected target that we would witness uh, well 242 to 250 
got it next up uh, we have a question on lnt finance uh, now this is coming from uh, I'm not sure if do mention your names uh, viewers uh, this one's from nandini from tamil nadu now uh, this is uh, the question is from a longer term perspective ashish would you suggest uh, buying the stock it's currently down about over a percent if we see this stock is also at a striking distance of uh, their 52 week high of around 178 and from two digit uh, we have seen a very good journey in lnt finance and the way the company has cleaned their uh, stressed book in last few years is quite commendable and they are also pouring now more on uh, uh, retail loans instead of more institutional loans uh, along with if you might have noticed they are coming out with a bike loan at less than 6% kind of roi to get the more uh, market share in that particular space so my suggestion will be to remain invested in lnt finance don't look at 2 rupees here and there but uh, this stock has potential to touch 200 rupees and maybe in next 6 uh, months time so i'm quite bullish as far as lnt finance prospects are concerned All right. Next up, we have a question from Deepak Sharma from Punjab. This one's uh, on Devyani. They've already bought the shares, uh, 500 shares at 192 a piece. The currently the price uh, is below that. Now, Ashish, uh, within the QSR space, uh, we've seen the stock uh, getting downgrades from brokerages as well. Uh, I think uh, last month or so. If uh, somebody is already invested into the stock, would you suggest shifting to some other stock within the space? Yes, Devani is a stock where we saw uh, some um, promoter selling and block deals, etc. Recently, also, and the stock is moving very narrow range. Uh, so instead of this, I'll prefer Sapphire Food or Zomato, uh, which can give you much better return than Devani International because uh, the growth is not there as far as Devani International uh, businesses are concerned, and they are facing tough competition also. So Sapphire or uh, Zomato, pick your uh, bet. All right, got it. Next up, uh, we have a question um, from Vinod from Chennai, and uh, this one's on uh, IDFC First Bank. Uh, Vaishali, they've bought the shares at fifty-eight a piece, and uh, they uh, can you pull up the chart for IDFC First and uh, see where the stock is currently trading at? Yes, uh, it's up about not not doing too much in trade today, but a considerable profit there. From a shorter term perspective, would you suggest uh, buying into? The, uh, would you suggest holding on to this one? I would say so because actually long term trend is very much intact. In fact, we are recommending this stock once again uh, from these levels because I think it's ready for uh, the way the banking stocks are doing, and this has been quite a laggard. So I think the risk reward ratio wise also 75 holds as a very good support level. And once the stock moves above 80 to 83, I think it's ready for a target of 88. So that's quite a return uh, for a short term period also. So yes, with 75 as stop loss, I would recommend to add. Right. Next up, uh, so that's an ad on IDFC First Bank. But uh, let's talk about Vedanta. This one's from Meeta from uh, Meeta Prajapati from Gujarat, and uh, they've already bought in the shares. They've bought two fifty shares at four thousand. This is from a longer term uh, perspective for about five years. That's the holding period. Uh, the okay, it's at two fifty a piece and four thousand quantity. Apologies for that. The, uh, Price is currently around 313. From a longer-term perspective, uh, Ashish Vedanta, would you continue betting on this metal uh, metal counter? Yes, I will continue to bet on Vedanta. And uh, again, the reasons are many. First of all, this is a company which uh, holds multiple commodities, like they are into aluminium, into big way, copper, into zinc, into nickel, into uh, Into uh, silver, along with uh, oil, which they got because of kind acquisition. So multiple businesses, multiple profitable businesses, and uh, good uh, and high dividend uh, distribution policy. So in my view, worst is over now for Vedanta. And uh, surely, uh, if you are having a five-year perspective, then you can play for uh, more than double uh, in Vedanta. But I think in twenty twenty four also you can expect four hundred rupees in Vedanta. Even I am buyer at this price. All right, fair point. Uh, stick with us, uh, Ashish and Vaishali. It's time for a short break, and viewers, uh, we we'll, uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes and uh, take your queries on the other side. Stay tuned.
Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we are already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers, growing fast. We are even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Welcome back. You're tuned into Ask Profit. And if you haven't sent us your questions, do write to us on any of our social media channels or on the WhatsApp number that's on your screen. You can also write to us on the YouTube live chat. But uh, let's jump into the questions again. Uh, this one's uh, from Shrikar from Hyderabad. The question is on Sriram Pistons and Rings. And uh, Ashish, uh, would you have coverage on this uh, particular stock? The question is, is this a good time to buy? Uh, Shrika says that uh, it's trading at an attractive valuation compared to its peers within the space. Yes, certainly if I uh, see financial of this company, they are quite robust. Uh, the stock has also rewarded the investors very well. If you see the last one year from 900, the stock went up to 2,300 rupees. And the kind of profitability, uh, almost 100 crore kind of profit they are uh, reporting quarter over quarter. So, Stock is good. Only thing is, uh, uh, slightly liquid stock. So, uh, like uh, typically, you can't trade, but in long run, surely you can continue to remain invested. Target on this? Yeah, uh, I think you can continue to remain invested. One year, two thousand eight hundred to three thousand rupees also possible because the way their order book has grown in last one year and the way uh, end user industries are doing, uh, this is bound to do well. All right, fair point. Next up, uh, we have a question from Ratna from Kolkata. This is on HDFC Bank. Uh, they bought the shares at uh, 1,435. We saw the business update and we have spoken about the fundamentals of the company in detail since then. But uh, this is a shorter term query. Uh, how does the charts look, Vaishali, from a three month perspective for HDFC? Well, if you're looking at three months, actually, overall, we are uh, quite upbeat on the banking sector. So, uh, uh, HDFC Bank per se, right now, it has shown a good upward move and is rallying towards the 200-day moving average resistance. So, I would say for now, if it's really for a short-term period, 1560 level is the level to be uh, watched because that is where some profit booking can emerge. But if this stock moves above 15, 60 levels and sustains, then I would be looking at a target of 1600 to 1620. So that, way, that is the way uh, the trader should be looking at this stock for now. All right, fair point. Next up, uh, we have a question from Nikhil from uh, Bangalore. This is uh, on Zomato. Now, uh, we have seen the stock rally in the last uh, month. And uh, Ashish, uh, Brokerages continue to remain very upbeat on this stock, but would you suggest buying at these levels? In fact, uh, this is one of the, uh, if you ask me about the QSR segment, uh, is one of my favorite pick here. And the way now, first of all, uh, the, the trigger which are going to act in the favor is Swiggy is also planning for an IPO. So if Swiggy IPO will come, Zomato valuations will uh, further get um, uh, on a upward trajectory. 
along with uh, now they are into profits or whatever the stigma related to loss making startups uh, getting higher valuation etc are over and blinket has also started performing so my view is uh, uh, there is a stock uh, if you ask me new age businesses this is my one of my favorite pick and my target for next one year is uh, 275 to 300 here even i'll advise to buy at uh, any decline zone at all right. Um, is that this? Uh, would you have a similar view where Charlie on this specific stock? Uh, what What are the buying levels uh, you would suggest for Zomato? Well, uh, the new round of momentum had begun right from 150 levels. So, but of course that gets too far. So now, uh, for a near term perspective, I think 170 acts as a crucial support. 175. So that is a level that I would uh, recommend to buy. And uh, well, for near term target resistance comes to around 200. About that, we have other, other targets of 220, 240 and so on. All right. Next up, uh, we're going to we're gonna talk about RCF. Now, Rashtra Chemicals and Fertilizer. This one's uh, from Namita Singh. They say that uh, they're holding the stock, but they're in losses on this uh, specific counter. From a technical standpoint, where Shali, they want to know uh, if they should continue holding from a three to six month perspective. Do you see any upside of recovery? Now, I'm not sure what kind of losses they have, but uh, do you see some, some sort of upside in the stock? So, well, actually, now that uh, the person is in loss, I'm seeing the longer term uh, time frame uh, chart like right from the monthly to weekly. Most of it is showing a lot of strength. And right now, I would say that, yes, overall, if you see uh, chemical and fertilizer stocks have shown good strength, good momentum and bounce uh, signs of reversals. So same goes for RCF also. We saw the stock right in the recent past from 190 levels. It's corrected and we saw a low at around 118, 120. From there on, we are seeing a bounce coming in. So I would say continue holding. In fact, if the stock goes a bit again into a corrective mode, and keeping in mind 120 as a support, this can be added. All right. Next up, uh, we have a question from, uh, okay, they haven't mentioned their name again. And viewers, a request, do please mention your name and from where you're writing from. Uh, this is on ITC and, uh, okay, Hemant. Hemant has written to us from West Bengal and uh, they have bought uh, 250 shares of ITC. Not sure of what the buy price here is, but... Uh, Ashish, uh, we saw the governor talk about uh, consumption and how rural consumption is picking up. And ITC seems to be doing well uh, in compa comparison to its peers. But uh, from a longer term perspective, would you suggest holding on to ITC? Yeah, I'll uh, recommend to hold uh, ITC for longer term perspective. And I agree with you, uh, uh, like the way consumption is going up. And this time we should not forget there's an election quarter, etc. So a lot of money will go in hands of uh, rural population. And second thing, this is a record summer time. So their FMCG product will get good traction. And uh, as we are expecting good monsoon also this time. So uh, it will again benefit to their agri portfolio. So overall, I am bullish. I think the worst is over for ITC related to bad selling mistake, etc. But uh, it's time to accumulate uh, gradually such a stock. All right, time to accumulate uh, ITC and uh, interesting factors Ashish mentioned about heat waves being predicted and how that will be a positive for a stock like ITC. But uh, unfortunately, we're completely out of time on this edition of Ask Profit. Thank you so much, Ashish and Vishali, for joining us and for answering so many questions for us. And viewers, uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll be back on Monday, same time, 11.30 a.m. Uh, till then, do keep writing us your queries and we'll definitely try and take the most, mo we'll definitely try and take most of your queries. And uh, but don't go anywhere, uh, there's lots more lined up here on NTTV Profit. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. 
However, we are already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers, growing fast. We are even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Stock selection isn't an easy task. And neither is choosing the right moment to sell. Whether it's a doubt about a short-term trade or a long-term investment, all you have to do is ask profit. You have a missed call. Let's be real guys. There are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target? What's good for long-term? When to buy? When to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us worry about giving you the right investing insights on the Portfolio Manager. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing principles with me, Neerat Shah, on my show, Talking Point. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of mind. And welcome. You are watching NDTV Profit. I'm Aga Makil. Uh, let's start with how the market's panning out. Uh, well, we have the verdict from the Reserve Bank of India. There has been no change as far as interest rates are concerned. Uh, but uh, plenty of commentary, plenty of factors to look forward to. Uh, through the course of the next few months and, of course, years. And, uh, of course, we're also going to have the Reserve Bank of India Governor Shakti Kanta Das address a press conference. In fact, there you have it on the screen where he is about to, well, take questions uh, from the media. Uh, in, in the meantime, of course, uh, to mark out how things have panned out, as far as the markets are concerned, they're very, very flat. We haven't seen too much traction uh, uh, overall. Of course, we are keeping an eye on uh, the you know, interest rates sensitives and we have in fact seen a relatively quiet day of trade but uh, you know we 
we are looking forward to what the Reserve Bank of India's governor says with respect to uh, you know some of the questions that will be coming through. I reckon a lot will uh, you know be focused on uh, will inflation coming in, even though there are no severe concerns that uh, that that are being raised. Uh, besides that. Uh, several other well factors which would include uh, you know production as well as uh, perhaps uh how the elections can play out in, 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 you know, what implications can it have in the near term as far as the economy is concerned. Several other aspects there, but here let's, let's uh, you know, move uh, on to that. Welcome to uh, the first policy of 2024-25. Uh, Today uh, with us we have uh, Governor Shri Shaktikan Das, Deputy Governors Dr. M. D. Patra, uh, Shri M. Rajeshwar Rao, Shri T. Ravi Shankar, Shri uh, Swaminathan Jay and uh, two executive directors, Dr. O.P. Mal and Dr. Rajiv Ranjan. So as is customary, I would request Governor to make some opening remarks and then we'll go for the Q&A. Uh, good morning. Namaskar. I guess I will not be off the mark if I say that uh, the policy overall is on expected lines. So it demonstrates that I think uh, the Reserve Bank, the market participants, the market players, and perhaps the media and uh, analysts and all, every stakeholder, I think the thinking is at the moment well aligned so far as the monetary policy is concerned. But having said that, I just want to make five observations. First, inflation is moderating and uh, the GDP growth is robust. Number two, the Monetary Policy Committee remains focused on aligning inflation to the target on a durable basis. We derive satisfaction from the progress made under disinflation, but the task is not yet finished. Number three, the financial sector continues to be stable. Number four, External sector also continues to be resilient. Number five, as we move towards RBI at 100, the Reserve Bank will continue to focus on preserving financial stability and promoting a financial sector and a payment system that is robust, resilient and future ready. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those opening remarks. I will, uh, uh, before inviting all of you, I'll request you to please restrict to one question per person. And if time permits, we will go for another one. I'll call out the names. I'll start with Mr. Ankur Mishra from ET Now. Good afternoon, Governor. Thank you, Yogesh, sir. Uh, my question is uh, that you have mentioned that the elephant has reached, uh, you want elephant to stay in forest in a durable basis. Is it uh, still outside the room or is it has already reached forest? Uh, why I'm asking? Because in your projections, you have said that in Q3 and Q4, there is going to be slight uptick in inflation. So what is your assessment? You see, the elephant moves at a slow pace. <laughs> So therefore, uh, the last mile of uh, disinflation is always challenging and uh, sticky. And as I have uh, very clearly stated, we would like, uh, you know, inflation to align with the target on a durable basis. So that is the, you know, that is the, that is what we are uh, looking for. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to Mr. Mayur Shetty from the Times of India. Uh, Governor, in your speech, you specifically mentioned the need to uh, build up uh, foreign exchange reserves. So, uh, this is something that RBI has been doing and the repeat has been stable. So is it that uh, the uh, currency stability has moved up in the list of priorities for RBI? No, it has always been the priority of the Reserve Bank to ensure uh, stability of the Indian rupee. And uh, I have myself uh, stated about it on a number of occasions. My colleagues have also talked about it on a number of uh, occasions. So far as building up of reserves is concerned, 
I think consciously we have over the last four or five years, we have been building up reserves uh, whenever, you know, uh, as the market uh, moves, depending on the prevailing uh, market uh, situation. So, and that endeavor uh, continues because it acts as a buffer against uh, future risks, especially in situation when the cycle turns and if there are significant outward uh, flows of uh, dollars. So, I have said it earlier also, so it is by way of a buffer that we are building up uh, uh, reserves. It adds, and this is very important, this whole approach adds to the strength of the national balance sheet. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to Mr. Anup Roy from Bloomberg. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, just trying to understand a little bit about your thinking on the heat wave warnings. Uh, you have not changed your inflation forecast that much, but uh, will you be considering, will you be watching out for the heat wave warnings first and what is the impact that's going to be before taking a call? Or you have, uh, you know, seen and, uh, you know, decided that it is not that materially important? No, there is a statement coming out from the IMD that the temperatures, uh, I have not said heat wave, I have said the, you know, high temperatures. The IMD has uh, stated that, uh, uh, the you know, the, there will be high temperatures and perhaps they have used a different word. They have not used the word uh, heat wave, but the temperatures are going to be above normal in the months of April, May and uh, June. So we have to really watch uh, what impact it has on, especially on food crops, and in that uh, uh, I have mentioned specifically about certain key vegetables. Now, so far as wheat crop is concerned, our information is that by and large the harvesting is over. In central part of India, it's all, it's fully over, excepting maybe a few areas, and even in other places also. Uh, by and large, the wheat harvest is over. So, therefore, the wheat crop, uh, the wheat, uh, you know, uh, availability will not be affected uh, as much as it did, you know, some two years ago when there were heat wave conditions starting March. Uh, so, therefore, wheat, uh, there is not so much worry, but uh, there is no, not so much concern. But vegetable prices have to be watched and any other impact that heat wave uh, conditions uh, that may produce. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to Ms. Ritu Singh from CNBC TV18. Governor, just a comment on, uh, you know, thank you for the question. Uh, on the exchange traded currency derivative rules, uh, it's very clear that RBI's stance has not changed. Uh, you know, uh, yet the market, of course, has grown to almost $5 billion of notional turnover on a daily basis. Uh, now that this ex uh, you know, deadline has been extended, but still the fact remains that you're asking for the underlying to be there uh, when these trades are undertaken. Uh, you know, we just wanted to understand, was there a concern that RBI had about, you know, risks, whether it comes to the financial stability or the currency, because of which this deadline was put in in the first place for a rule that has stayed in place for now 10 years? Okay. I guess there could be some more questions on this issue. Uh, if there are any, you could just mention so that we take it all together and give a common reply. I mean, if so, she has already mentioned uh, certain points, yeah. other than that, but related to this exactly. matter, exactly. if you have so, any question, yes. you can just put it so that we take it all together. Exactly. The question is that yesterday you extended the deadline after 5.30, after the trading hours, the market has died by that time, but you still have extended the deadline. What is the reason for extending the deadline by one month? Is there a scope to review your decision? That is the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the but please remember that you are yeah. exhausting your yeah. opportunity to ask a question. Sir, you said you're taking all these together. <laughs> <laughs> so please keep that in mind. So no, just wanted to understand. Unless you are yeah. asking something fundamentally different. Uh, no, I would are you okay huh. with the volumes completely dying down in this market? And globally, uh, the underlying is not a requirement in most markets. So uh, why is that rule being made, especially for India? And why have we had that position for the last so many years? Okay, I think I take it that these are the questions. Uh, so, may I request uh, DG uh, Michael Patra to reply to that question and I will, if necessary, I will supplement. Thank you, Governor. Yes, to yeah. So, uh, let, me, let me just quickly review the whole thing so that everything is in perspective. Uh, please also read our press release of yesterday. Uh, we typically issue after market hours. 
so it is in keeping with rbi's style the rbi's policy on foreign exchange risk management has remained consistent over the last few years and there is no change in the policy approach that is what i want to emphasize at the outset so in 2008 when exchange traded currency derivatives were introduced for the first time they were introduced under the aegis of the foreign exchange management act and the regulations of fema clearly stated that etcds are for hedging only and when you when you state that it implies that you must have an underlying exposure in 2014 the rbi to promote the ease of doing business provided a relaxation in the sense that while you must have underlying exposure up to 10 million of that exposure you need not produce documentary evidence of it since then uh, uh, over the next few years that limit was raised to 100 million just to provide an incentive for market Uh, turnover and to expand the size of the market but the the moot point is that it is only for hedging and underlying exposure is a mandatory requirement the january 5 2024 circular was in pursuance of a commitment made in the monetary policy statement of december 2023 in which we said that there are all these um stipulations all over the place we will bring it together into a master direction and the january 24 circular was a master direction it just reiterated what has been there since 2014 so there was no change in that now some market participants have been uh, um, uh, misusing this to understand that a relaxation in uh, in documentary evidence is tantamount to no underlying which is not the case and that is a violation of the law it might go no much right no just uh, i want to supplement uh, by you know summarizing what the deputy governor said is that uh, there is no change pursuant to yesterday's uh, circular or even earlier there has been no change in rbi's policy this policy of this need to have an underlying has always been a part of rbi's policy for last uh, so many years so there was no change and this is something which every market player knew you cannot say that ki you know this is something new if you read the circulars past circulars very carefully it is it has been always there so therefore if somebody says ki it is new it is not correct i would like them to refer to the circulars and in fact that is the purpose for which we issued the circular yesterday just to you know because there was some kind of a narrative was building up in certain quarters we wanted to make it very clear that there is nothing new nothing new this has been the requirement all along market players knew about it it was it is a part of fema regulation the need for an underlying and uh, all that we have done is to sort of uh, uh, issue this circular and uh, there was also a question or maybe there is a possible question what was the need for extension let me preempt that and say that we received feedback and requests from uh, several market participants that they need uh, more time the circular earlier circular was issued in the master direction was issued in january uh, and let me also say why the master direction was issued uh in the december uh, monetary policy you know statement the regulatory and the developmental uh, part of the monetary policy statement we had very clearly said that a comprehensive master direction would be issued and the master direction was issued in january first week of january and it was said there very clearly it takes effect from 5th of uh, april so everything was crystal clear but because of requests which we have received and because of the kind of uh, narrative which was being built up as if built up as if it's something new what we did is to just retrade the earlier position and say that it is nothing new it has been already always there and number 2 because of requests which we received from several market players that they need more time we extended it uh, extended the time uh, for the implementation of that january circular so instead of april 5th we have now made it 3rd of may
No, this has been a consistent position. It's a legal requirement under the as per FEMA regulations. So there is, uh, where is the question of a review of that? It's been there for last so many years. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sirs. I'll move on to Mr. Laltendu Mishra from the Hindu. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Governor. Uh, uh, what is fueling uh, the, the food prices inflation? And whether this is a new normal? And second question is, um, in an election year, what are the factors the RBI is watching out for? We have given our projections for inflation and growth for 24, 25, up to the fourth quarter of the year. Inflation, we have said it will be 4.5% for the whole year. Growth, we have said it will be 7% for the whole year. And uh, when 7% growth happens for the you know current year, it will be the fourth successive year of 7% or higher growth. Beyond that on elections, I would not naturally like to say anything. And uh, with regard to food inflation, I think let uh, Dr. Michael Patra reply to that. Yeah. So food inflation has been highly volatile. In fact, in February, it was 7.8%. And the indications are that um, in view of adverse climate events occurring, recurring, uh, it will remain high. The, the actors keep shifting. At some stage, it was cereals, then went to vegetables. And currently, it is the proteins, eggs, meat, and fish, while there is still some firmness in rice prices. So these are short duration uh, spikes. But since they occur in multiple occasions, they, uh, they give a persistent character. So what we are worried about is that there should not be any spillovers to the rest of CPI. So we watch very closely. And before we go to the next question, you know, I mentioned about this, about this above normal uh, temperature. Uh, I have the IMD release with me. It says that during 2024, hot weather season, it talks about hot weather season, April to June, above normal maximum, above normal maximum temperatures are likely over most parts of the country. So it talks about hot weather season. It talks about above normal maximum temperatures. Yeah. Thank Next you, question. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, sirs. I'll move on to Mr. Uh, Govardhan Rangan from Economic Times. Thank you, sir. So thanks for the no surprises policy to start with. Uh, and um, so one of the things that's happening is that uh, the real rates, uh, the, uh, what to say, it's at almost uh, double that of what an RBA paper itself had suggested in 21-22, uh, almost to two per, per, so 200 basis points. So, uh, so one of the MPC members in the last minutes had also indicated that probably we may be sacrificing growth if you're not uh, reducing the interest rates. Is it this high rates almost double of uh, what uh, the real interest rate is suggested by the uh, RBA research itself? Is it kind of a sacrificing growth at this point of time. Thank you. I think DG can reply to that question. No, you should, uh, you should assess the level of the real rate in terms of the distance at which inflation is from the target. <clears throat> Even going 12 months forward, inflation is not at target. So that is our primary objective, that we must align inflation with the target. Until then, the real <clears throat> rates are not uh, so high as you say. Real rates do not matter till uh, it reaches 4%. Is that what? No, they is? matter, but we need to see the alignment of inflation with the target. That is the primary objective of monetary policy. You see, uh, under the law, the primary objective, as he has rightly pointed out, is uh, price stability, inflation targeting. It is an inflation targeting framework. And talking about the real rate, that stud, you know, the earlier study by the RBI was done about three years ago or four years ago, three, four years of three years ago, I think. 20, 21, 22. 21, 22. So that is about, you know, about three years ago it was done. Much has happened uh, since then. Our potential growth also appears to have grown, you know, gone up. In fact, uh, when the, going by the NSO's uh, forecast of 7.6% uh, growth for the year 23-25. The average for the three years, that is 21-22, 22-23, and 23-24, the average will work out to 8%. So when your average growth over a three-year period is 8%, naturally the potential growth appears to have gone up. 
we will undertake a study after the final gdp numbers for the current uh, for the year 23 24 uh, it is released uh, end of may after it is released we will again undertake a stay a study to assess this uh, potential growth and the real rate and maybe thereafter we can uh, sort of provide you some additional information uh, so therefore the potential growth and the real rate have to be seen in you know the real rate has to be seen in that context i'm not reaching any conclusion but i'm just saying that the real rate has to be looked uh, in that uh, from that perspective but essentially as rightly pointed out by the deputy governor it is the level of inflation going forward one year ahead where the inflation is likely to be that is what really guides us in our uh, journey of uh, attaining uh, price stability thank you sir i'll move on to mr dinesh unikrishnan from money control thank you yogesh ji thank you governor I just wanted to know what is your view on the electoral bonds data that is published by the Election Commission of India following the Supreme Court uh, directive. So, if you look at it, there are many cases where companies have uh, bought uh, you know, electoral bonds many times more than their net worth and profit. And also, there are quite a few cases where companies which are even in losses, uh, you know, they have bought uh, quite a few, six, about 600 crores worth uh, electoral bonds. That is the that have you looked at this data is there a possibility that rbi you know looking at that these companies probably would have been used by others as a channel for uh, funding no on electoral bonds uh, we have no comments it's a supreme court judgment yeah. which has to be complied with and which has been uh, you know in uh, in uh, in pursuance of the supreme court judgment i think the bank involved the state bank has taken uh, the required action so we have no comments on the supreme court judgment or on the issue of electoral bonds and with regard to the issues you are pointing it out you know that the net worth vis-a-vis -vis how much they have contributed these are issues which are not in the domain of the reserve bank thank you sir i'll uh, move on to mr vishwanath nayar from ndtv profit Thank you, sir. Uh, Governor, uh, you spoke about the real rates in detail, but uh, the bottom line is is you're not seeing four percent in FI25, at least according to your projections at this point in time. Um, there was hope that uh, when the U.S. Federal Reserve supposedly is going to cut rates in June, then the RBI might follow. Are we looking at any kind of a, any indication of a rate cut this financial year or not? That's my primary question. is it with regard to the rate cut this year i cannot give you a forward guidance in fact uh, countries which give uh, dot plots also the dot plots keep changing from meeting to meeting so with regard to rate cut uh, or whatever rate action i mean let me not say rate cut but whatever rate action it is linked to the evolving uh, path of uh, uh, inflation so on that i cannot give you any forward guidance and the other point which you mentioned about expectation linked to us uh, rate cut i think uh, as i have said on number of occasions earlier our monetary policy is primarily guided and determined by our domestic uh, situations so we do not uh, just uh, follow the footsteps of uh, the us a us fed in fact if you see if you just recall in the past several months or you know past few years in particular i can talk about i mean we did our rate cuts our rate rate cut which we did in 2019 or the rate beginning of the rate increase which we did uh, in uh, 2022 they did not really they really they actually preceded uh, us fed action so therefore our policy is governed and determined primarily by domestic circumstances thank you sir i'll move on to mr anand adhikari from business today I think I said very clearly that we would like the elephant to return to the forest and stay there uh, on a durable basis and I reiterated by saying that we would like inflation to align with the target on a durable basis so I think uh, that needs for no further elaboration 
And that's for you to judge. <laughs> uh, I'll move on to Mr. Shayan Ghosh from the Mint. So that's it. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I wanted to ask, so uh, the Prime Minister on a Monday uh, spoke of RBI's priority of growth. He, of course, then went on to, went on to add trust and stability. Uh, does the uh, does the government now want RBI to prioritize growth over inflation? Is that the reading? I think you have answered the question. The Prime Minister talked about growth. The Prime Minister also talked about stability and uh, trust. So therefore, uh, my understanding is that uh, what the Prime Minister said is in line with what is provided in the RBI Act with regard to inflation targeting. Sorry, if I may add, sir, he led with growth, so I thought. Sorry? He led with growth and then no. went on to add, so I thought. Well, I mean, uh, you can make any nuance, you know, ask a nuanced question. Yeah, and he also, uh, he also talked or used the word balance. If you recall, he, you know, he also talked about balance. So, that's it. Thank you, sir. I'll move on to Swati Bhatt Chitty from Reuters. Uh, thank you, Yogesh, sir. Uh, so I had a very small question. Do you think the moderate falling core inflation is indicative of weak consumer demand? Is that something that is a concern at your end? Uh, and you've already answered the question on Forex reserves earlier. Just a side note. So there is a cost to building reserves. Uh, are you considering that cost as well? And how are you looking at that? And are you looking to continue building gold reserves? Thank you. We are building up gold reserves. The data, you know, is released uh, from time to time. We are building gold reserves. You can compare, uh, you know, year after year, what is the gold reserve that uh, the Reserve Bank is uh, holding. So that's a part of our, uh, you know, that's a part of our uh, reserve uh, deployment. And uh, uh, what was the other question? Sorry? No, all aspects are uh, obviously all uh, all aspects are assessed. All aspects uh, in build, while building up the reserves are assessed, and uh, then we take a decision. Thank you, sir. No demand. You said uh, consumption. You say weaker consumption. I think in the monetary policy, I have said very. You have asked three, four questions, including the, you know, the derivative, uh, this thing, the exchange. Uh, now the uh, point is, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, what was that you said? The. Uh, Ah, so because you're asking so many questions, I'm getting mixed up. No, I think in the policy statement, I have said very clearly that uh, urban consumption remains strong and rural consumption is, you know, has recovered and is gaining. So it's there in the policy statement. So I'll uh, move on to Mr. Manujit uh, Saha from the Business Standard. That's it. Thank you. He asked a question. No, no, that was on uh, currency derivatives. Happy to so, skip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The growth projection for FY25, you have kept it at 7%. At the same time, you have earlier said FY24 could be closer to 8%. What will slow down growth in the current financial year? As you said, also said the average growth was closer to 8% in the last three years, but this year you are projecting 7%. So what will slow down growth in the current financial year from the 8%? The MPR has been released uh, today. I think MPR has been released or will be released today. The monetary policy report. Uh, should be up getting uploaded now. It is already uploaded. Yeah, so the MPR is uh, already uploaded so you can have a look at it So maybe dr. Michael Patra can further amplify uh, The 8 percent will pr provide a base uh, effect on to 24 25 But the momentum is very strong. It's still as strong as it is in 23 24 Because the year it's a year on year uh, growth rate <coughs> Not an effect essential, you're saying. Yeah. Thank you, sirs. I'll move on to this side. I'll uh, invite Mr. Ashish Agishe from PTI. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, you, uh, in the end of your speech, you mentioned about uh, the goal being in sight on inflation. Uh, you also gave us the target for the FY25, uh, uh, your expectations for FY25. So, uh, if 4% is the goal, like, like what sort of uh, uh, sort of path do you see on inflation going ahead? 
I think we have I given really see the target inside. Yeah, but we have given the we have given the quarterly projections also, no? For the next year, we have given the quarterly projections. I think Q2 it uh, comes to 3.8 percent, but thereafter again it uh, goes up. And there are so many uncertainties between now and uh, each of these quarters. So we will be watchful, and uh, watchful not on a watchful of the current. Uh, prevailing inflation as well as watchful of what the outlook uh, appears you know what how the outlook uh, uh, appears so based on that we will uh, take a decision thank you sir i'll move on to mr piyush shukla from the financial express uh, good afternoon governor dgs and uh, yogesh ji uh, so very quickly just Uh, you have allowed SFBs to deal in rupee interest rate derivative products today. There is also an ask uh, that uh, they want to shed their small finance tag because people uh, feel uh, you know a bit hesitant towards uh, banking with such names. Uh, apart from that, there are certain regulatory relaxations, uh, relaxations also being sought on PSL CRR. So, uh, what is your view in this regard, sir? And separately, uh, you know, SRO draft framework has come out. When can we expect the final framework to come out? Are you on board with them having a dual mechanism? You are. said in your circular that there needs to be com- a consensus on the membership criteria and uh, dual uh, sro yeah. so no thank you for moving to the part b of the mpc resolution because there are seven other announcements which have been made each of them very important and uh, on the first part about the sfb thing i will re- request uh, deputy governor rajeshwar rao to reply and on the fintech sro i would request uh, deputy governor ravi shankar to reply thank you piyush for that question i see sfbs actually have been conceptualized as a differentiated bank with a specific objective and the tag of having an sfp after the name is a key part of that differentiator so i don't think there is any requirement to modify that and at this point in time also the objective of the sfp is to further financial inclusion among the underserved and the unserved through using high tech and low cost operations and meeting the priority sector norms etc is a key part of this entire process so i think the norms continue to be at that levels for the priority uh, for the sfb <coughs> uh, on the sro we have received the comments uh, the last date was uh, as you know the end of february this is fintech sro uh, fintech sros we have received the comments we are uh, examining those comments uh we will be out with a framework on based on which uh, entities can apply for sros the details of that framework please wait until we announce it you know the various issues that we had put out in the draft uh, framework where you know whether there would be one or more sros and what would be the membership criteria and so on will 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 finalize based on the feedback please wait for the final framework to come out thank you and let me supplement by saying that the framework we we expect to release it uh, we hope you know we propose to release it before the end of april and uh, as mentioned by me in the last uh, global uh, fintech uh, festival that in the next year's festival that is in 2024 uh, uh, global fintech festival we would like one sro relating to fintech to be operational so we are working towards that थैंक यू सर्स अब मैं आमंत्रित करूंगा आकाशवाणी से श्री जीवन भाव सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर सीबीडीसी का पायलट प्रोस्टिंग प्रोजेक्ट जो हमारा चल रहा है तो उसकी वर्तमान स्थिति क्या है वो हमें जानने में इंटरेस्ट है और साथ में यूपीआई के साथ हमने इसको इंटरऑपरेबल किया है तो जो इनकी जो ट्रांजेक्शन है ट्रांजेक्शन में कितनी बढ़ोतरी हुई है इस सवाल इस प्रश्न का उत्तर मैं डिप्टी गवर्नर रविशंकर जी को उत्तर देने के लिए रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा इंटरऑपरेबल uh, uh, करने के बाद उसका वॉल्यूम्स इंक्रीज किए हैं जैसे कि मैं पहले भी बताया हूं ऑब्जेक्टिव यही है पायलट्स के कि वेरियस अल्टरनेटिव टेक्नोलॉजीज हो वेरियस अल्टरनेटिव यूज केसेस हो वो ट्राई किया जाए जैसे कि पिछले साल हम बताए थे हम लोग ये टेस्ट करना चाहते हैं कि सिस्टम कितना रेजिलियंट है अगर ट्रांजैक्शन एक मिलियन को बढ़ाया जाता है तो वो वो टारगेट रखे थे एंड ऑफ द ईयर तक वो टारगेट अचीव भी कर लिए उसमें टेस्ट किए और वो टारगेट अचीव करने में इंटरऑपरेबिलिटी विथ यूपीआई काफी काम में आया उसके बाद वॉल्यूम्स उतना नहीं है नीचे आए हैं लेकिन एक चीज देखने को मिली है कि वॉल्यूम्स ज्यादा पी टू पी से पी टू एम को शिफ्ट हो रहे हैं क्योंकि ज्यादा मर्चेंट्स अवेलेबल हैं 
अभी का डेटा का हिसाब से करीब 46 लाख यूजर्स हैं और चार लाख मर्चेंट्स हैं सो टोटल अबाउट 50 लाख पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैं टोटल ट्रांजैक्शंस अभी तक करीब 2.2 करोड़ तक हुआ है पिछले पॉलिसी में हम लोग प्रोग्रामेबिलिटी अनाउंस किए थे पहला प्रोग्रामेबिलिटी का यूज केस आज शुरू हुआ है तो उसके बारे में बाद में बताएंगे ये फार्मर को सीबीडीसी ट्रांसफर करने का यूज केस है जो कि वो अपना इनपुट्स के लिए ही यूज कर सकते हैं दूसरा केसेस अभी अभी बन रहे हैं वो धीरे धीरे ग्रेजुअली वो भी हम लोग इंट्रोड्यूस करेंगे एक और अनाउंस पिछले बार जो किए थे ऑफलाइन यूजर्स जो सीबीडीसी का वो ऑफलाइन यूजर्स अभी वो क्लोज ग्रुप में विद इन बैंक अभी टेस्ट कर रहे हैं वो डेवलप हो गया है टेस्ट चालू है एक बार वो सेटल कर जाता है तो उसको भी ओपन कर देंगे बार के लिए थैंक यू धन्यवाद महोदय अब मैं आमंत्रित करूंगा ब्रजेश कुमार जी बिजनेस न्यूज से सर मेरा सवाल ये होगा कि हाल के दिनों में आपने दो एनबीएफसी पे एक्शन लिया है एक गोल्ड लोन से जुड़ा था और एक कैपिटल मार्केट की फाइनेंसिंग से तो जो गोल्ड लोन का इशू है उसमें क्या ये आपको लगता है कि कहीं इंडस्ट्री वाइड प्रैक्टिस में समस्या है और इस पर कोई नई पॉलिसी लाना चाहेंगे ऐसी ऐसी ही कोई पॉलिसी की एक्सपेक्टेशन क्या जो कैपिटल मार्केट से जुड़ी एनबीएफसी है उनके लिए भी सोचा जा रहा है क्या देखिए इंडिविजुअल एंटिटी रिलेटेड केसेस के बारे में तो मैं यहां पे रिप्लाई हमेशा प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस में अवॉइड करते हैं लेकिन जनरली मैं ये कहना चाहूंगा कि हमारा जो सुपरविजन मशीनरी है आरबीआई का वो रेगुलरली हम लोग इसको बैंक्स हो एनबीएफसी हो जितने लेंडर्स हो उनको रेगुलरली हमारा सुपरविजन करते रहते हैं और जहां पर हमको दिखा कुछ डिविएशन हो रहा है कुछ कंप्लायंस में और रेगुलेटरी रिक्वायरमेंट्स में मेजर डिविएशन हो रहा है पहले हमारा प्रयत्न यह रहता है कि उनके साथ डायरेक्टली उनको बायोलेटरली सेंसिटाइज करें और उनके साथ काम करें और उनको इम्प्रेस करें कि भाई आप करेक्टिव एक्शन ले लीजिए उनके साथ हम काम करते हैं जब देखते हैं प्रोग्रेस नॉट अप टू द मार्क फिर हम उसके ऊपर कुछ सुपरवाइजरी रेस्ट्रिक्शंस लगाते हैं बट एज अ पार्ट ऑफ सुपरविजन हम पूरा सिस्टम का और सिस्टम में जितने प्लेयर्स है सब पर्टिकुलरली मेजर प्लेयर्स जितना है उनका हम रेगुलरली रिव्यू और सुपरविजन करते रहते हैं तो मैं ये कह नहीं कहना चाहूंगा कि ये एक सिस्टम वाइड प्रॉब्लम है क्योंकि हमने सबको सुपरवाइज किया हुआ है आउटलायर केसेस में ही सिर्फ हम एक्शन लेते हैं the cash dispersals for gold loans are also high uh, you know ifl also right after the action from you said you know this is the common practice on the street you're saying it's not it's one player perhaps it's a wider practice so a larger message for actually no we have i have there's a paragraph on uh, you know today in my statement there is a paragraph where i have talked about uh, focus on uh, governance focus on uh, compliance to regulatory requirements and uh, i have also concluded you know ended that para by saying that ki financial stability is a uh, you know is a joint responsibility of all stakeholders and stakeholders would include the regulator as well as the regulated entities we supervise all uh, you know entities all major entities wherever we see problem we first directly engage with the particular entity to see that corrective actions are taken where we see that the problems are huge or the problems are persistent then only we act now let me say that i am not commenting on the cases where we have taken action and this whole perception that you know against how many entities we have now uh, supervisory restrictions imposed we have uh, about 90 odd banks we have about uh, more than 9000 uh, nbfcs our action is against uh, two nbfcs and one payment bank so spate of uh, regulatory or supervisory action i think would be would not be correct uh, way of uh, describing the situation i think it has to be seen in the total context
धन्यवाद महोदय अब मैं अनुराग शाह ईटी स्वदेश से नमस्ते सर सर मेरा सवाल जो है पिछली पॉलिसी वाला ही है पिछली बार दो सवाल पूछ लिए थे तो समय की कमी की वजह से आपने एक का ही जवाब दिया था सर जिस तरह से सर जिस तरह से जो दोबारा बताएंगे मैं मिस कर गया नहीं नहीं सर मैंने सर जो सभी सवाल पूछने जा रहा हूँ पिछली पॉलिसी में भी पूछा था लेकिन दो सवाल पूछ लिए थे और समय की कमी थी तो आपने एक का ही जवाब दिया था तो वही सवाल वापस दोहरा रहा हूँ सर पर्सनल लोन से जुड़ी हुई जो चिंता आरबीआई की थी जिसमें रिस्क वेटेज भी बढ़ाया गया था और उसके अलावा भी जो जिस तरह से लोन बांटे जाते हैं हम में से सब इस बात से पीड़ित है कि हर दिन तीन चार कॉल आते हैं पर्सनल लोन के लिए और बाकी लोन का भी आप देखो अब तो खुल्लम खुल्ला बैंकें कह रही कि आप होम लोन का जो टॉपअप है वो ले लीजिए और उसके बाद उस पैसे का आप वेकेशन पे चले जाइए ये ओपनली हो रहा है तो जो एंड यूज नहीं हो रहा है तो उसको लेकर कहीं ना कहीं रिजर्व बैंक चिंतित है किस तरह के आपका मानना है आई थिंक डीजी स्वामीनाथन मैं आपसे अनुरोध करूंगा कि आप इसका रिप्लाई दे दे हिंदी में अगर दे सकते हैं तो दे दो इंग्लिश में भी बोल दी ठीक See, absolutely, uh, credit growth is one part, and we keep uh, watch on uh, the segmental uh, growth as well. And wherever the segments have shown an outlier growth, so that we initiate certain measures to ensure that they are contained. Uh, but your question regarding the end use of funds is something which is part of our uh, regulatory framework. That every regulated entity is is expected to monitor the end use of funds, and then. Finance only such of those activities for which uh, the purpose is stated explicitly, and it's not used for speculative purposes, etc. So this is something which we will examine as part of our supervisory uh, steps. And in case we observe any egregious or uh, outlier behaviour, and we will take up, uh, action in proportion to the violation that we that we observe. That's what I would like to say at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, with your permission, last two questions, sir. Okay. Um, Hamsini Karthik from the Hindu Business Line. Hi. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll, uh, uh, my question is with regards to transmission of rates. And as much as this is a prerogative of banks, uh, uh, what is possibly also happening is that fresh lending is happening at rates. Uh, Lower than what prevailed last year, and a lot of borrowers on the retail side are making use of it uh, very judiciously. On the MCLR side, which is also the prevailing rate for most of the corporates, continues to be the prevailing rate for most of the non-retail loans. Banks are not nudging much. It's not changed in the last one year significantly. But on the other hand, the Reserve Bank of India is particular that there is a reasonable amount of transmission that continues to happen before which any. Uh, Action can take place. Aren't we getting to a zone of standstill as far as rate transmission is concerned? I think Michael, you can take. That. So um, please look at the monetary policy report where the data are uh, provided. If you look at the uh, transmission over a period of time, not in a single point in time, let's say April to February, there is still transmission going on. In fact. Uh, in January, there were 13 basis points of increase in fresh uh, loans. So we are still seeing a little bit of transmission going through, and we feel that as the um, the, um, uh, the uh, mo mobilizing of deposits takes place at higher and higher rates, there will be a further transmission to lending rates. So we are still seeing transmission. Just a clarification: Should we expect that deposits? There is still runway for banks to increase deposits because uh, banks come back to us saying that uh, they peaked on deposit rates. Uh, what do you see? How do you see the picture there? No, we see a structural deficit between okay. credit and deposits, and that is why we are seeing a flurry of um, efforts to raise bulk deposits. Mm. So there is still a need for deposits, and these deposits come at a higher rate than the retail deposits. So. They will one day they will try to protect the names and therefore they will pass a little bit more. Thank you. I think uh, Deputy Governor Swaminathan may like to add something. Yes, uh, just to supplement on that, ultimately these kind of actions also have to be seen in terms of the proportion and the mix of the loans that we have. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned about uh, even today, 50 to 53 percent of the loans only are linked to the external benchmark, where the transmission can be near real time. Uh, the remaining 47. percent which is linked to various benchmarks will happen over a period of time the second aspect is also that uh, 
there is a competition for good quality business. So obviously the banks will take a business call in terms of uh, what sort of spread they would like to maintain. And if there is some sacrifice in spread happens, it may impact the effective interest rate. But as DG Patra explained, uh, that it is very clear that the transmission is playing out and we will have to see it over a period of time. And we would like uh, this to continue in that, in that manner. And as regards uh, the deposits, we do see that banks are uh, quite active in terms of its, uh, uh, their purpose in terms of mobilizing deposits because there is three, three and a half percent gap that is visible for more than a year's time now. And also we are seeing that the customers are also becoming price sensitive. There is a significant movement uh, towards the term deposits. Mm. The proportion of CASA is declining as a part of the total deposits. So we would exam we, we will continue to watch the data in terms of its transmission, but moreover it will also be a business call in terms of what sort of market share and share in the incremental deposit or the loan market the entities would like to maintain. So it will be a combination of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sirs. The last question to Mr. Hitesh Vyas from the Indian Express. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, what is the crude price, crude price uh, assumption you have taken in your projection? I think it's given in the MPR. You can mention. Okay. How much we have said? 85? We have taken 85. $85 dollars per barrel. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the uh, close of the first press conference of year 2024-25. Thank you all for being here and making an interactive uh, session. I thank the top management of Reserve Bank uh, for patiently answering all the questions. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. And you all have a great day for the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the day and maximize your financial potential. Stay ahead of the curve with all you need to know on NDTV Profit. Listen to the voices of reason as they talk about corporate health and investing...
Welcome back. Well, we just come out of the press conference from the Reserve Bank of India. Well, among the key things that were discussed, firstly, of course, was growth. Uh, going in, uh, we, uh, well, the, you know, we also had a discussion around food inflation and how it can be volatile and how there are several different factors which can, in fact, play out uh, for in favor or against food inflation going in. Of course, uh, the issue of the exchange-traded derivatives was also taken up where there is a need for a hedge and then that there, there has to be documentary evidence for the underlying uh, which based on which you can in fact go ahead and take positions as far as the derivatives are concerned. And well, uh, it, the, the comments were very clear about the fact that this is a continuation of a policy that has already been in place for many years. And uh, you know, there, it was just about consolidating that particular aspect going forward. Uh, besides that, of course, uh, there were several other uh, well, uh, issues that have been discussed over the course of the last few policies and which potentially will remain in focus through the next few ones. Of course, the only thing that we did not uh, get was an, well, some sort of a trajectory, some sort of an indication of whether or not there could be, there would be, well, changes in interest rates. But I reckon as the governor has been very, very clear about, uh, well, every policy will take into consideration the current economic environment, the factors, and based on that, well, there will be a discussion with respect to GDP growth, and after that, we do see, and we well, then, and that's when they take up a decision of whether or not there will be a change or no. For now, there is no word on a decline or a reduction as far as your current interest rates are concerned, which of course stand around six and a half percent. What we also know that the GDP for, has been forecasted at around seven percent for FY25. Based on that. Has there been a change in the market? Not really. At the moment, the markets trade flat. The Nifty is exactly around the mark of, well, 22,500. And the Bank Nifty is trending slightly higher, marginally in the green, higher by around, well, uh, slightly above the mark of 48,200. Uh, so that's how, well, benchmarks have uh, well, panned out, and we really have, haven't seen too much change in there uh, from the time we had the interest rate decision, or for that matter, well, post the press conference from the RBI. But on that note, Let's get in my colleague Pallavi to give us a little more about, uh, uh, well, in terms of an insight as to what she's, she makes of uh, from what's come out from the RBI. Pallavi. Thank you, Agam. So, uh, like you've summarized a lot of the highlights from the policy, uh, at this point, what the understanding is that uh, between the growth inflation dynamics, uh, it's inflation that the central bank is continuing to focus on going forward, especially given the rising comfort on growth. Uh, GDP growth for FY25 is projected at 7%, with Q1 at 7.1%, Q2 at 6 0.9% and Q3 and Q4 at 7%. At this point, risks are evenly balanced. On inflation, uh Food prices continue to weigh on the inflation trajectory. Uh, in his statement earlier today morning, as well as in the press conference thereafter, uh, the governor and uh, his team continued to emphasize on the volatile nature of food inflation. At this point, there's especially mixed cues coming in. On one hand, with the IMD having signaled heat waves in April, May and June, that is likely to have some impact on perishable Key vegetables was something the governor highlighted. Apart from that, we're also going to be on wait and mo watch mode on uh, other food components like cereals and pulses, where we have seen continuously elevated inflation the past year. Uh, with these warnings uh, on uh, weather, there is a chance that these elevated figures that we're seeing uh, can very well continue. CPI inflation in FY25 is projected as 
at four and a half percent. These headline figures for both growth as well as inflation are the same as we saw in the last policy, but we did see the RBI uh, modestly change its forecasts for some of these quarters. So Q1 is now projected at 4.9 percent. In Q2, we're expected to see inflation actually fall below the RBI's target of 4 percent. Uh, it's going to be at 3.8%. But then again, that seems to be a bit of a temporary reprieve because in Q3 and Q4, we're again looking at projections of about 4.5%. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, the, in, in the growth inflation dynamics at play, at the moment, all eyes on inflation and inflation trajectory going forward. Absolutely, Pallavi. Uh, inflation right at the top of the mind of all and everyone. But, but well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us those insights as far as uh, the, the latest on the policy is concerned. But on that note, we are out of time on this edition, uh, which covers the RBI monetary policy. But don't go anywhere. On the other side, we have plenty more to keep an eye on. Stay tuned in. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. And we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money. There are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks. On your show, Hot Money. Let's be real guys, there are many financial experts out there. Which stocks to target, what's good for long term, when to buy, when to sell? How do you stay ahead of all the financial noise to achieve your dreams? You can accomplish all your financial dreams. Let us 
worry about giving you the right investing insights on the portfolio manager. watching an NDTV profit special on the RBI MPC and I am Pallavi Nahata. Now a short while ago we heard Governor Das announce the MPC's decision uh, where the MPC has uh, along expected lines uh, decided to keep the benchmark lending rate, the repo rate at 6.5% and the stance too uh, is unchanged. Again be, uh, broadly along expected lines. Uh, we did see a few tweaks to the GDP and inflation forecasts. While the headline figures for FY25 were retained, uh, GDP is now forecasted to uh, grow at 7% uh, for the full year, with Q1 at 7.1%, Q2 at 6.9%. Q3 and Q4 both at 7% with risks evenly balanced. Meanwhile, on inflation, uh, the governor did caution against uh, food prices continuing to weigh on inflation trajectory as we have seen during the course of the past year as well. Uh, but early indications of a normal monsoon uh, augurs uh, well at this point for food prices. At the same time, the IMD has issued a heat warning for April, May and June and that could weigh on prices of key perishables, key vegetables, again like the governor uh, brought up in his speech. CPI inflation is projected at 4.5% for the full fiscal year uh, as uh, earlier, but uh, Q1 is now projected at 4.9%, Q2 at 3.8%, Q3 at 4.6% and Q4 at 4.5%. So what do these growth inflation dynamics translate to? Inflation has eased but remains above target, high food inflation, could unhinge inflation expectations going forward, the governor had cautioned. Uh, and uh, essentially, the broad messaging from the RBI and the MPC was that given the comfort on growth, all eyes are on inflation and reining in inflation to target. But uh, for more insights and for his takeaways on today's policy, we're joined by B. Prasanna, Group Head, uh, Global Markets Sales and Trading and Research at ICICI Bank. So thank you so very much for taking time out for us today. Thank so, you, Balavi. So, you know, to begin with, what were your uh, quick takeaways from today? Uh, so, I think uh, broadly, uh, Palavi, I think you uh, gave a good introduction. Broadly, uh, very, very uh, 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 as per market expectations, I would say. And uh, I think uh, the fact that there was no uh, change in policy uh, rates as well as no change in stance was both kind of uh, expected. In fact, the voting pattern at 5-1 was also kind of expected for both the policy as well as the stance change. I think the significant uh, uh, takeaway possibly is the fact that uh, the continued focus on not only the target of 4%, but the fact that it reads to be durably at 4% even after it just touches. So basically it means that we don't, we're not really comfortable with it touching at four and then going back up. So we wanted to be I uh, wanted to be durably uh, stay at 4% was one uh, takeaway. And the second, I think, is the reiteration by the governor again that uh, the growth uh, being very good gives them the policy space to kind of address inflation. So that gives me the uh, feeling that, uh, I mean, they are really looking at... Uh, uh... Right. Okay, uh, well, meanwhile, we'll quickly get in our second guest for uh, the show, Radhika Rao, senior economist at DBS Bank, uh, while we try and get Mr. Prasanna back on the show with us. Uh, Radhika, hi, thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, quick thoughts on today's policy. Uh, broadly along expected lines, but what were your key takeaways? Hi, Balavi, certainly, I think um, uh, 
be i think the central bank went into this policy review with a couple of data, more data points uh you know they had two inflation numbers on hand uh, they already had a very strong gdp outcome uh, and also global central banks uh, and their commentary uh you know in the past uh six eight weeks uh so based on that assessment and i think the probably the most recent development um was the oil prices heading towards the 90 mark globally uh and of course you've also seen geopolitical tensions flare up in parts uh so i would think that um, the central bank's assessment overall economic assessment i think did they are com continuing to be uh, very positive on on growth uh, i think they did see it being investment driven in the earlier assessment as well. At this time, we saw a bit of hint of optimism on consumption also expected to pick up. Uh, they have maintained their overall forecast, but if you see the quarterly profile, there's a very slight uh, change in terms of the first half of the year. And in terms of inflation as well, uh, they expected to be at 4.5%, that means still above target, but in one of the quarters, it actually slips below 4%, and that's what the quarterly profile seemed to suggest. Um, Apart from all of this, and I think they have really emphasized, and I think if you see the monetary policy report, which also got released alongside, uh, there's quite a strong emphasis on uh, you know, weather-related issues and those concerns for food inflation. Um, again, you and I know that uh, you know, uh, central bank policy doesn't uh, or can't do much for supply side pressures. But of course, the channel that they can uh, make sure that doesn't happen, spillover doesn't happen, is inflationary expectations. And that's why they've spoken about, you know, the warning from IMD about uh, potential heat, uh, you know, high temperatures from April to June. Uh, possibly after that, we could still enjoy a normal southwest monsoon, uh, which would be very important for, for food grains. Uh, so in the near term, uh, to conclude, I think the, the strong growth uh, above target inflation still very much in place, um, which you know uh, outright doesn't tell you that there is sufficient room to ease policy or there is an imminent dovish pivot in in view. Uh, and I think the other one is of course to watch whether. Uh, so I think in between now and and uh, you know when they meet next or in the quarter after, uh, there are two three developments which I think they're very keeping a very close eye on. Perhaps we can discuss this in the next section. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Prasanna, now that we have you back online with us, I do want to ask you, uh, like Radhika too pointed, uh, we do expect inflation in Q2 to actually fall below target, even if it's just for that one quarter. But at that point, uh, real rates uh, are going to be fairly high. So. Uh, Despite the fact that for the full year, we're still looking at an inflation forecast of 4.5%, that is above target, do you still pencil in a rate cut even if it's a modest one of maybe about 25 bips uh, back, uh, you know, in Q2 when inflation is uh, expected to fall below target? Uh, so first of all, Balabi, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I can. So I think um, uh, Dr. Michael Patra was making a very interesting point about real rates. Uh, it not only is real rates important, but uh, it's also important from what level of expected inflation we are looking at that inflation and the distance that level of inflation has with, from the target. So when you're having a expected inflation of four and a half percent, and then you know you calculate two percent real rate, it does not necessarily mean it's very high. Is the point he was trying to say? So I guess a higher real rate of interest in order to bring uh, inflation down to four is required when the current inflation is much higher than the target. And then as we go forward, it comes down. I think that's the point he was trying to make. So maybe the real rate, the real rate argument needs to be nuanced from that perspective. The other thing is the, uh, the, the fact that uh, just because uh, quarter two inflation goes to 3.8, but the fact is quarter three and quarter four again goes back much above four to say something like four and a half. Uh, I mean, he made sure, the governor made sure that the market doesn't run away with expectations of big rate cuts because of this fact. And that's the reason why he keeps saying about the durability of uh, the inflation target being achieved at 4%. So I think all in all, I think that's the reason why at the margin, the market might probably take this as a hawkish kind of a, a policy, primarily because uh, he's not just letting the comfort come into the market that inflation is very well controlled because we all know uh, that quarter two inflation is going to be uh, lower and we all know it's also a part of a base effect because momentum of inflation still continues to be good. So from that perspective, I think he's managing expectations pretty well. Having said all this, uh, Pallavi, I think uh, what happens uh, in the Fed, 
will also have a bearing on the way RBI charters its policy as we go forward. He is, of course, not going to say that uh, in so many words. Uh, we do make policy for our own domestic priorities. But at the same time, we don't live in an isolated world. We live in a relative world. And what happens to the Fed and what happens to the dollar will have to have a bearing either indirectly or directly into what we also do. So I guess uh, monsoon is one. Uh, going past uh, uh, the quarter two inflation and looking at uh, quarter three, quarter four also being close to four is uh, the second. And the third is uh, to see Fed actually acting in the cycle uh, behind us rather than ahead of us. I think that's the, uh, I think the most important thing that the governor is possibly waiting for. So we are uh, penciling a shallow rate cut cycle, uh, but uh, we are probably moving the first rate cut from August to October uh, due to the kind of uh, the nature in which the, not only the Fed is moving, but also the way in which the governor spoke today. Got it. Okay. Uh, I have the same question for you, Radhika, you know, given that uh, the global macro economy does appear to be looking up. We have seen fairly encouraging data, not just here in India for GDP, but globally as well. Uh, and given uh, the commentary today, uh, do you think there might be a little bit of a chance that the uh, RBI might even possibly, uh, you know, cut rates uh, before the Fed does? Um, you know, I, I do think that there is some similarity in terms of the undercurrents that the Fed is facing as well as uh, the RBI facing. Um, I think th they both are in a situation where growth is strong, um, you know, and uh, especially in Fed's case, of course, there are many market participants who came into the year thinking there could be a technical recession, uh, you know, soft landing, hard landing, those, those uh, conversations were still going on. Uh, and then but both are in a situation where growth is, is stronger, uh, stronger than expected. And I think that's allowing them the headroom to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, wait it out till the inflation actually heads towards target. Um, and on Fed part, I think they've already mentioned that they might not even, they might not see inflation at their target, but if as far as it heads there, they're happy with that. In RBS front, certainly, I think what happens globally is important. Uh, but I think time and again, in today's press conference as well, the governor did mention that domestic considerations will be far more important. And I think in amongst the Asian central banks, you've actually seen that not many of the central banks uh, actually moved as much as the Fed did. Uh, so, you know, when the Fed reverses course, uh, the Asian central banks also will not need to do as much. Uh, when we come to the RBI's point, I think the scope of RBI moving before the Fed is rather small uh, in our personal view. Uh, we have already expected them to move only in October. I would think the debate would be more towards uh, cut uh, you know, uh, cut by how much or cut at all, I think, rather than uh, them bringing it forward uh, uh, by any any rhyme or reason. I think the other one is, so at this point, look at growth, look at inflation, both don't make um, a justification to essentially go ahead and uh, cut rates. Uh, and as Prasanna also highlighted uh, from the press conference, it was made quite clear that real rates matter, but real rates matter insofar as also comparing where the inflation is at 12 months from now, vis-a-vis -vis the target. Uh, so all these points tell you that they have, there are no clear signals of being dovish. I think it's all market expectations, market pricing, and every subsequent meeting uh, that the RBI comes out and sound, does not change stance, does not move on rates, that market pricing in terms of rate cuts continues to get pushed back. Uh, so I think to answer your question, I don't think uh, there is any scope of, um, in our view at least, that the RBI will move before the Fed. Uh, I, I think if anything, they would prefer to be more cautious. Uh, and between now and, uh, uh, you know, the the next two quarters at least, uh, they have an election where they would like to prefer that financial conditions remain stable. Uh, then you've got uh, index inclusion that starts in June uh, and it happens in a phased manner. So, you know, even then uh, where the currency is, where rates are wouldn't matter. Uh, and of course, the third would be Southwest monsoon, uh, which also starts somewhere in May uh, to July, set August. Uh, so all these things are event risks that they're watching out for. Uh, but on, as far as policy is concerned, a very little justification at this point to go ahead and uh, pivot towards a, a dovish leaning. Okay, uh, so time for a break now, but before we do that, will the RBI follow the US Fed's path and consider cutting rates? That was the question asked by my colleague Vishwanath during the RBI's post-monetary policy presser. Here's what Governor Shakti Kanta Das too had to say. Listen in. You spoke about the real rates in detail, but uh, 
bottom line is is you're not seeing 4% in FI25, at least according to your projections at this point in time. Um, there was hope that uh, when the US Federal Reserve supposedly is going to cut rates in June, then the RBI might follow. Are we looking at any kind of a, any indication of a rate cut this financial year or not? That's my primary question. Issue with regard to the rate cut this year, I cannot give you a forward guidance. In fact, uh, countries which give uh, dot plots also, the dot plots keep changing from meeting to meeting. So with regard to rate cut uh, or whatever rate action, I mean, let me not say rate cut, but whatever rate action, it is linked to the evolving uh, path of uh, uh, inflation. So on that, I cannot give you any forward guidance. And the other point which you mentioned about expectation linked to U.S. Uh, rate cut, I think... Uh, as I have said on a number of occasions earlier, our monetary policy is primarily guided and determined by our domestic uh, situations. So we do not uh, just uh, follow the footsteps of uh, the US, uh, US Fed. In fact, if you see, if you just recall in the past several months or, you know, past few years in particular, I can talk about, I mean, we did our rate cuts our rate rate cut which we did in 2019 or the rate beginning of the rate increase which we did uh, in uh, 2022 they did not really they really they actually preceded uh, us fed action so therefore our policy is governed and determined primarily by domestic circumstances <laughs>
back. You're watching the special RBI MPC coverage on NDTV Profit. I'm joined by my guests, B. Prasanna and Radhika Rao. Uh, Mr. Prasanna, I'll come to you first. So uh, I do want to ask you broadly the expectation for the benchmark bond deals going forward is for them to range between about 65 to 7%. Uh, and uh, what is the uh, figure that you are looking at? Also, can we expect weighted average call rates to also now trade below the repo rate going forward? So, uh, Pallavi, I think uh, bond deals are going to be between uh, 7 and 715 kind of levels uh, till maybe uh, the first quarter gets over. And after that, when the bond index inclusion comes, uh, and hopefully the Fed would either have indicated that they are going to cut very soon or they have actually cut, uh, then, uh, you know, bond deals can slip below 7%. So our range is somewhere between 665 and 7 by the second half of this financial year and between 7 and 7.15 for the first half, uh, first uh, quarter. Uh, and on the question on the weighted average uh, call rate, uh, rest assured that even when RBI turns its, uh, changes its stance and becomes a little easy, it's going to make sure that uh, it's going to uh, mop out excess liquidity to ensure that the weighted average call rate does not slip too far below uh, repo rate. Uh, so they always have been having an asymmetrical kind of a reaction between when liquidity is surplus and when liquidity is uh, deficit. When liquidity is deficit, they are quite slow to act to give money to the system because their chance was also such. But when liquidity is uh, surplus and, uh, you know, it goes below repo, I'm sure they are going to use these multiple instruments to take it out. The, not the long-term instruments like OMO uh, sales and all that, but at least the B triple R's and then take it out. So I would assume that it will be an achievement if weighted average call rate is close to the repo rate. That itself is good enough for the market because the market is coming from a period when uh, there was a stealth hike, so to speak, and uh, the weighted average call rate was about uh, 25 basis points or so above the repo rate itself, which is considered as a policy rate. So I think uh, that that's the way to really uh, look at it going forward. Okay. Uh, Radhika, coming to you, I do want to ask you, so, you know, for the longest time, we've had a, a wide term premium here in the Indian markets. Uh, but going forward, uh, considering the broader expectation given domestic and global factors, is uh, some easing on the benchmark bond yields? Uh, is a smaller term premium then going to be a problem, uh, you know, towards maybe the second half of the fiscal year? Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, a problem. Uh, I think there will be two different drivers that will drive two ends of the curve, I would think. Um, you know, the short end for it to correct quite sharply, you will need uh, quite a clear signal from the central bank on the policy front. And I think we have discussed that uh, in quite detail. Uh, on the longer end, of course, right now the flat, the, the curve is pretty flat. But um, what, what you do see is, again, there too, you need to be, uh, right now you're seeing a lot of inflows uh, kind of keeping a lid on the yields as well. I think that, in fact, there are two-way forces. There's inflows, on, uh, uh, you know, capping up move, and on the downside, you've got, you know, what's happening globally. You've got the U.S. yields that started the year on a very, on a sub-4% footing, and now you've seen them, uh, you know, seen, seen quite an increase. Uh, so going forward, I think on our focus are, are not very different. Um, you know, we, in fact, ex also expect uh, yields to be, or at least the long end of the curve, to be at about 7, 6.95% at best in the first half of this fiscal year. Uh, I think for, in terms of flows, we've already seen about 6, 7 billion flows into bonds front running the index inclusion just this calendar year. And now with those kind of flows, even then you have seen the rupee actually weaken. Uh, so the central bank has been very active in, in absorbing those flows. In fact, in the MPC today as well, or at the meeting, uh, the uh, RBI did mention about the fact that, you know, the reserves, um, because people, generally markets are questioning now at what point will they stop in the sense that is 650 okay, 680 okay, 700 billion okay, in terms of the reserves. And I think the central bank made it quite clear uh, that they don't have any target in mind. And it is a function uh, at the end of the day of strengthening your own country's balance sheet uh, and is also in terms of wanting to minimize any one-sided swings on the rupee, mm -hmm. according to us. Uh, so coming back on the on the yield front, I would think that uh, uh, first half, 
um, and not so much of movement. I think we barely see going down to about 6.95%. This is our uh, own in-house forecast. In the second half of the year, uh, we could see a, a bit more of softness. But insofar as the flows are concerned, uh, I think it is quite clear uh, that the central bank would not want, uh, you know, very strong uh, impact on the currency or on uh, yields just because of the flows. And on the liquidity part of the equation, uh, I think liquidity being relatively kept tight also kind of gels with what they have been talking about in terms of policy transmission. Uh, there was a very passing mention in today's review. Much more time was spent on it in February, um, and you know you, that that. Uh, keeping excess liquidity in check kind of also aids your overall transmission policy transmission, which continues to happen. Um, and I think it will expedite because you've got this external benchmark lending rate, you know, loans under it now almost at about 56, 57% uh, of outstanding. So which is, uh, you know, increasing and then MCLRs are basically coming down. Uh, so net yes, to answer your question, I would think short end and long end, we will look at uh, two different drivers. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that, Radhika. I do have time for one quick question. So, uh, Mr. Prasanna, uh, what are your views on the rupee? We've In today's session, we've seen the rupee strengthen. It's currently at about the 83.29 levels. Uh, what are the levels you are looking at for quarter one? So, I think uh, the rupee did strengthen uh, because it took comfort from the fact that um, RBI is a little bit more... Uh, uh, hawkish than what uh, they could have been or they could have probably afforded themselves to be. So from that perspective, uh, higher interest rates and hawkish central bank is always good for the currency. Uh, but however, uh, in general, what has happened is over the last uh, two, three months, the view on the INR has been quite positive and we have seen a lot of positions in international markets being taken, uh, keeping this view in mind that uh, in addition to the Indian asset class returns, whether it's equity or bonds, you also get a return from the currency appreciation. And RBI has absorbed a lot of these reserves. So to some extent, uh, you can say that some of the, for, uh, the foreign investments uh, have given up a little bit of those investments and hence have sold a little bit over the last couple of days. And also bear in mind that the dollar is now much more stronger than what we all expected it to be at the beginning of the year. Uh, especially even against the G3 currencies and also especially against the emerging market currencies. Right. And that is because of the fact that there is expected to be higher interest rates for longer than what we were expecting at the beginning of the year. So a stronger dollar, especially against EM and a weaker Chinese yuan, I think are the reasons why, you know, the INR uh, has uh, been a little bit on the weaker side. Okay. But it is not to take away any of the positivity from the medium term. I think okay. maybe 83 to 83.75 or 84 for the time being. Okay. But I think 82 to 83 maybe a little while, uh, maybe in the second half of this year. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Prasanan. Thank you so much for joining us, Radhika. That's all the time we have on the show for now. But do stay tuned to NDTV Profit. We have a lot more lined up. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk. Others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. 
Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for Hi, thanks so much for joining in. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show on NDTV Profit and my name is Alex Matthew. Like the name suggests, this show gets you actionable insight on everything mutual fund related. Now, often we look at the performance of equity mutual fund schemes over a period of time and you look at various metrics. For example, you look at point-to-point -point returns, you look at compounded annual returns, you look at the rolling returns, uh, you look at the volatility of a particular scheme, but we don't often talk about the down capture ratio. And this is essentially something that captures how much of capital protection that a particular scheme is offering you. Now, the debate is when it comes to beating the benchmark consistently and in fact getting you the most possible returns, there are two ways in which a fund manager can achieve this and also a combination of those two. One of them is by uh, beating the benchmark by a large margin in the event of a bull run and the other way is to protect the downside when the market itself is falling. The best fund managers get the best of both worlds. We're going to talk about the second aspect in today, uh, today's show and we'll talk about how important this is. Kostu Belapurkar, who is uh, Director of Fund Research at Morningstar India, is joining me to talk about this. Kostub, this is one of the measures that we've taken from you, the downside capture ratio, and you've shared with me your readings for various categories, among them the small cap, mid cap, large cap, and flexi cap categories. Let's first talk about what this ratio is and what it's aimed at. Sure. Uh, firstly, Alex, you know, thanks for having me on the show. And I think it's a very interesting conversation, right? Because I mean, we are obviously, uh, you know, in a market that's been so supremely bullish for the last so many years, uh, especially on the small and mid caps. Uh, and we'll be talking about, you know, how much of the downside that we've captured. Obviously, we've seen some volatility uh, in you know, since the start of the year. Uh, but I think it's an interesting conversation purely because what we've seen over, you know, long periods of time of fund manager history is that fund managers, and like you rightly said, do a great job in capturing a reasonable amount of the upside of the market, but actually end up protecting capital much more than or falling less than you know the index uh, when when the markets are bearish, uh, and and you know then over a market cycle a good fund manager can outperform, uh, which is largely actually given by the downside protection that they provide, right? So what does a down capture ratio really denote, and you know how how does the math behind that work, right? So essentially what it's looking at is over different time periods. So, you know, you could do it over one year, three or five years, 10 years. Uh, you can calculate essentially, you know, which were the months where the index itself gave a negative return, right? So let's just assume we're looking at it over a 10 year period and, uh, you know, 120 months. And, uh, you know, let's for simplicity sake that say that there are about 30 months that, uh, you know, the, the index itself is negative, say the mid cap index in this case, right? Uh, in those particular months, how did the fund perform versus the index, right? So suppose in those 30 months, the index on an average fell minus 1%, right, per month. Uh, suppose the fund's fallen only minus 0.8%. So it's essentially captured or fallen less than the benchmark. Uh, so the down capture ratio would be 80%. So essentially what you want from a fund is an up capture ratio, which is exactly the opposite. How much of the upside of the bull market does it capture? You want that close to as close to 100% as possible so that it's capturing the entire bull market at the same time as low a down capture ratio as possible so that it's actually falling much lesser in, in a falling market because obviously investors are much more concerned when uh, you know markets start going southwards and, and especially in uh, you know categories like small and mid caps where you've seen greater volatility it becomes even more essential and I think a lot of fund managers across you know various time periods have done uh, you know pretty good job of kind of managing this downside protection quite well you would see you know many funds ranging in that 70 80 percent uh, you know sort of down capture ratios uh, which is I think a sort of good sign no, I, what I've done is I've looked at the five-year period, and I know you mentioned the 10-year yeah. period, but uh, since a lot of schemes have uh, not do not have the data for 10 years, 
I've chosen right. to take five years. And what I've done is I've looked at the uh, best readings on down capture ratio in the various categories, the top five. And I've also put on screen, or I will be putting on screen the compounded annual growth rate for these schemes, what the category average was and what the benchmark is. So let's talk about mid cap first. And what I'm reading on the top is uh, Axis mid cap, which in a five year period has achieved the best downside capture ratio, um, followed by Motilal Oswal, Mahindra Manulife, and Baroda uh, BNP. So what I'm reading is that the, the top gainer in this uh, category uh, among these funds is Motilal Oswal. So would it be fair to say that they've got the best of both worlds? And it's not necessarily enough cost to, to only look at downside capture ratio, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's one data point to consider. You're, and again, you don't have to necessarily scout for you know the, the fund that's got the best down capture ratio because maybe the up capture ratio is not great because you want to get the best of both worlds and you want to find a sweet spot within that, right? Uh, and that's exactly what, you know, so these are inputs into your decision making that you would look at and it's not necessarily a case in point. And sometimes what happens also with these numbers is, uh, you know, given the cycle or the style of the fund manager, some of these numbers can also look significantly better than the others. So I will always maybe not just look at it today, but also look at historical numbers, like almost like a rolling down capture ratio over different periods of time. Uh, which will give me a better sense about how really consistent a particular strategy has been in limiting the downside and similarly capturing the upside, right? So that will give me a pretty good understanding of of how that fund has performed across market cycles. Because you know, if you, I mean, if you just think about, yeah, I want to talk about how these schemes are managed because I know for a fact that uh, Axis, for example, uh, which has not just the lowest down capture in a five-year period in the mid-cap category, but also uh, it ranks in the uh, top five in the large cap category as well as the top in the small cap category uh, as well. I, I know that they have a more conservative approach and they have uh, uh, an orientation even within these categories that are broader market towards large cap. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, there are two things to this, right? The access uh, approach. So one is obviously in their mid cap, for instance, they would have some large cap uh, exposure, which would anyways kind of be less volatile, so it'll limit the downside to a certain extent. And I think the other important aspect is when you think about access is, uh, I mean, style of investing. I mean, they're a quality growth manager, right? And let's focus on, on the quality bit of things. I mean, you're looking at companies, you know, with great earning ratios, uh, you know, low debt ratios. Now, typically in any down market, uh, you know, you would expect quality companies to be a much more resilient uh, than probably your cyclical sort of high debt uh, uh, company. So I think that also kind of plays uh, you know, into that sort of lower down capture ratio uh, for some of these strategies. I think also during that crash of 2020, uh, you know, which is during this five-year period, they did have a reasonable amount of cash. Uh, and that's also another important thing to think about, which also resulted in them capturing much lesser of the downside during the COVID correction uh, and even prior to the run-up of the COVID correction, which would uh, you know, kind of uh, also result in this lower number. So I think it's important to put all of these things into perspective, uh, you know, when we think about the number rather than looking at it in, in pure isolation. One last point on the mid-cap uh, category before we move to small cap is Motilal Oswal's mid-cap strategy. They've achieved a five-year CAGR of 26.39, which handily beats both the benchmark and the category. Is there anything that stands out in their management as opposed to their peers? Uh, to be honest, I haven't really tracked the fund closely, so I wanted to give you a oh, okay. uh, nuanced opinion. But uh, I mean, obviously, they've, you know, I mean, Motilal's built a pretty solid team over the years. Uh, while they've had some changes in the past, I think now uh, they've, you know, built a pretty solid team. Uh, I mean, they are a good institutional backed uh, research house. Uh, in which way, so I think they have all the ingredients in, in place there. Uh, but, you know, that's as much as I can comment without really having more information about the way they manage the fund. Fair point. Let's move to the small cap category, and I'm seeing readings um, which are pretty low. And I'm, I'm talking about what uh, 58 for the Axis Small Cap Fund. I'm talking about SBI Small Cap Fund, which is as low as 61 over a five-year period. That's pretty significant, right? Um, and one would assume that small cap funds uh, find it more difficult to protect downside because of the nature of these schemes. Would it be uh, wrong to say 
that in certain situations, a low down capture ratio is not necessarily a good thing, particularly if you're in a category to take on a certain amount of risk and maybe the up, upside capture ratio would reflect the low amount of risk in that uh, scheme? Uh, I, I would say yes and no. I mean, yes, you have to look at it in conjunction with other data points like the up capture ratio and, and uh, other aspects. But it's also important to think about, uh, you know, maybe certain funds because of the inherent style uh, could be going through either headwinds or they had a tailwind. Uh, you know, like I said, we spoke about the cash or the quality approach, which in fact, even SBI was and follows for, for the small cap, SBI small cap fund, which should have helped them during periods of downturns. Uh, but, you know, uh, the quality growth approach is in more recent times is actually struggling, right? And which would you would see in, in the returns of their portfolios uh, over the recent times. So, so yeah, so in more recent times, it probably doesn't look that great. But if you roll that data, both on the down capture, the up capture, and you look at the other risk metrics for the funds, they actually wouldn't stack up. Uh, they would stack up pretty reasonably well, I, I, I would think so. I do want to talk about the flexi cap category as well, where a very uh, a familiar fund ranks at the top if we're talking about the five year, and that is Parag Parikh flexi cap fund. It has a down capture, uh, down capture ratio of 52.87, and in fact, the 10 year down capture is as much as 46.43. That's not on the screen, but it has achieved a five year CAGR of uh, close to 23%. The category average is. Uh, 16.67% and the benchmark has grown 17.9% on a compounded annual basis over that period. And that's quite significant, is it not, Kaustub? Would you say that because of the kind of investments that they had in the international markets, that's kind of helped them to a large extent? Uh, so again, I think you know that's a very interesting observation. And I think to for start with, it's, I think it's an extremely well-managed fund, uh, you know, uh, Rajiv and his team have done an exceptional job in managing this strategy. So yes, uh, there is an element of you know where the international markets have kind of because you know they've international markets haven't necessarily moved in lockstep with the Indian markets uh, and especially some of those uh, you know what we call the magnificent seven names uh, too, right? Which they own a couple of those uh, uh, and and you know that would have helped both I mean helped and probably impeded them in certain times because uh, uh, you know we had this whole crash in twenty. Uh, 22 and then 23, these names again took off again, right? But when we looked at the underlying attribution of returns, uh, while obviously the US holdings have contributed quite significantly, it's also been the domestic stock picking that's been pretty brilliant from, from the Parag Parag team, which has actually added to the significant alpha this this fund has generated over that, you know, the entire time period. So I think it's a it's a good mix of both. Uh, you know, I would I, I wouldn't credit only the U.S. exposure, uh, I think it's a good mix of, you know, both domestic and international stock picking. Yeah, because it's interesting, if I if I reduce the time frame even further and come down to one year, it stands at 18.33, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there is also in that list, and I want to pull that list up again, because if I look at the top five based on the five-year down capture ratio, there is quant uh, flexi cap fund as well. And if I look at the quant's uh, shorter term time frame, and, and here we're looking at the regular scheme, it has a 99.38 down capture ratio in three years and 119.92 in a one year period, which means that they have lost more than the benchmark in the last one year. What about the strategy would cause something like that? Because they are, as their name suggests, someone that uh, follows a quant based approach. So obviously, I mean, given their you know sort of high turnover, uh, and you know some of their holdings because of the inherent approach that could turn to be a little bit too momentum oriented. Uh, so they'll actually have a pretty high up capture ratio too, uh, but that will also result in a significantly high down capture ratio, like you uh, rightly pointed out, uh, especially over the short time frames. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a very different approach that they take to money management. Uh, you know, so that's that's probably resulting in some of those numbers that you spoke about. The last category I want to talk about is large cap. And the reason I kept it for the end is because we've often spoken about 
the futility, if you can call it that, of investing in the actively managed space in large cap. Because ultimately, the, the fund manager has such a small pool to play with, the ability to beat the benchmark is, is uh, uh, compromised. However, over the last one year, a lot of them have managed to beat the benchmark for various reasons. I would think to a certain extent, the portfolio construction, which has allowed for 20% in uh, the broader markets, has allowed them to uh, outperform. But having said that, how would you read the down capture ratio for large caps? Because I would think that the approach here is not necessarily uh, on uh, you know, the taking on of significant amount of risk and therefore profit maximization. You're also looking at protection of downside when you talk about the large cap category. Yeah, absolutely. I think you want to be, you know, again, reasonably lower than 100, I would say. Uh, that's not necessarily been the case, but I think that's also, uh, you know, not something, I mean, it's more of a market function rather than, because, you know, the problem with the large cap category or the index is that you have such large index heavyweights, right? So the moment some of those top heavyweights significantly outperform, uh, you know, uh, the large cap active managers are, are lagging. Uh, but in years like last year, that you pointed out, uh, you know, when you have an HDFC bank that's that's uh, you know the, which is underperforming, uh, you know the large cap managers who've been underweight that stock would make a pretty strong comeback. Uh, so I think that's you know that's one of the challenges, uh, and you know that's a global phenomenon that you would see. I think even in 2023, a lot of U.S. active large cap managers did, I mean, much higher or better success ratios than. Uh, you know some of the others, but you know I think that that uh, uh, I I still think there's there's good runway for active managers to play even in the large cap space. Uh, I think investors just need to be a little patient across the market cycle because uh, you know if you're a very growth manager, you will be underperforming more recently. If you're a value manager in twenty, uh, you would be underperforming that time, but you're outperforming now. But if you stayed the course, you would have actually made money. But you know the challenge is. For an investor to stay the course, identify that fund and stay the course. Uh, but there are, I think, reasonably well-run strategies that can do it. But yes, you're right. I think the the runway has shrunk. Uh, the number of active large cap managers or the quantum that can beat the benchmarks has come down, and it'll probably continue to kind of you know gradually drift downwards. Okay. Uh, the the last point that I will raise in this, when you rank the various parameters that you would look at. Now, of course, you look at the performance over a period of time, but where does this rank when you're looking at determining whether or not to invest in a particular scheme? I think it's important. Uh, it's very important because, you know, if I, if I just think behaviorally as an investor, right, uh, we love positive surprises, right? I mean, if I just, you know, if anyone told me that, okay, you can get an X percent or, you know, historically a, a category or a fund has returned X percent, obviously that's not the right way of looking at things, but, you know, we do tend to pin our expectations on what history has delivered, right? Uh, moment there's a positive surprise, I'm, I'm, I'm super thrilled. But even the smallest of negative surprises as an investor, any investor, I mean, it's human nature, we would hate it, right? So if a fund can, you know, and, you know, if you, you see the markets that are red and you see your, your portfolio has fallen less than the market, that kind of gives you that comfort. So I think it's an important factor, but obviously there, you know, it's an interplay of multiple uh, sort of data points that you need to look at. Uh, you know, beyond these one parameters, obviously, in terms of the investment team, uh, you know, consistency of style, I think, I think that's very, very important, which uh, often doesn't get spoken about enough. Uh, you know, I think that's something that investors should be focusing on uh, so that they, they continue to invest in funds and stay invested. I think that's the most important thing. Okay. Uh, do stay with us, Kostu. We have to slip into a very quick break. There's more on the other side. Viewers, do stay tuned. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. 
the idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created. But this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Welcome back. We've been talking about an interesting metric to judge the performance of a mutual fund scheme in the equity category, and that is downside capture ratio. It measures how much of capital protection a particular fund has offered. Now, uh, Kosov, when you've studied this over a period of time, has it indicated that a fund that has managed to consistently have a low downside capture ratio has actually done better than schemes that have consistently had an up capture ratio that is beating everybody else, but not, not necessarily a good downside capture ratio. Yeah, absolutely. I think two things, right, to this uh, point. One is just the fund returns, right, or when you think about it, because typically any fund that has a high up capture ratio in excess of 100% probably also has a down capture ratio, either way close to 100 or higher than 100. Uh, we've seen that in the past. They tend to be you know, slightly high beta portfolios. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, in the zone that they would do exceedingly well in certain market conditions and, and obviously correct most significantly uh, as obviously the numbers would suggest. Uh, uh, and, you know, the biggest challenge is not necessarily just the fund return or the point-to-point -point perspective, but it's more importantly, the investor return or an average investor making money in those funds, right? And let me explain to you what that means. Uh, because investors tend to gravitate towards funds that have done well in the recent past. Uh, you know, that's human nature. Uh, they'll probably end up buying this particular fund because it looks like the top of the pile, uh, but they're buying this fund after that great returns already been delivered, right? And, and because it's got a large down capture ratio or can be much more volatile, uh, they're probably participating in that second bit of that movement, uh, which is not desirable to them. And, and they're always chasing the tail for such funds. So I think it becomes a bigger challenge in investor returns or you know investors getting poorer outcomes from such funds as opposed to funds that probably you know are around that 90 to 100 percent up capture that you know we're getting a good portion of the upside uh, at the same time uh, we, we're protecting your downside when the markets fall uh, it makes for a much more you know or less volatile investor journey uh, and, and investors tend to stay invested in these funds and actually end up gaining most of the returns that the fund would make. I think that's that's a very crucial aspect when you think about, you know, from the art of, you know, investor behavior and how they, uh, they invest the money across cycles. So it's an interesting point that you make because I know that we've looked at five years, but then you would want to have a longer time frame to, look, to study something like this because you're looking at different market cycles and we've only really seen the COVID-19 pandemic or the, the correction that you saw post that over the last five years, which was really massive. Um, and, and there was quite a big, uh, uh, you know, re recoup of that very quickly. What I want to understand is how do you study this? And, and does a different category throw up different results? And do you have different downside capture ratios that you would be acceptable or that would be acceptable? Uh, for example, if you're talking about a small cap category. Yeah, so I think uh, two things. So, uh, you know, yes, different categories will have different, uh, typically different ranges. Uh, and, you know, in the large cap space, actually, surprisingly so, the down capture ratios tend to be closer or higher than some of the mid and small caps, purely because of the fact that, you know, one is, you have these 100 stocks, there's, there's lesser active share that the fund managers run. Uh, by the virtue of that, obviously, you know, they're, their performances, I mean, there's not a huge delta from the benchmark on either side, right? Uh, but with mid and small caps, as we've seen that, you know, you can have really interesting periods where funds are, you know, beating the benchmark hollow or, uh, you know, the other way or underperforming quite significantly. So these types of funds tend to have, uh, you know, smaller or better down capture ratios, uh, purely because, you know, even the construct of these indices, you would have stocks uh, for instance, if you just look at you know the past you know twelve months mid cap returns, you would have stocks that have probably done 400, 500 percent returns over a period of time. But they're at the same time, there's stocks that are probably minus fifty percent 
uh, you will not see that range of returns in uh, you know in a uh, in a large cap index sort of fund, right? Uh, so I think that then eventually results in uh, typically more palatable or lower down capture ratios, and that's a good thing, right? Because I mean, anyways, these uh, this whole category is more volatile, uh, so you want to protect that much more on the smaller mid cap side as much as possible. Uh, and you know that's uh, that's what most uh, many funds have achieved uh, over the over the lo longer time period. And I think the other interesting data point that we you know if you just break it down into calendar years. So let me talk about you know the last big mid cap rally that happened about six seven years back. So 2017 smaller mid caps rallied. So I just looked at the granular data for mid cap funds. Not a single fund in that year beat the benchmark uh, because again, like I said, you had very polarized returns and so. Okay. Boom. And just held those, yeah. uh, and and you know that resulted in uh, none of these funds outperformed the benchmark. But when the markets corrected in eighteen and nineteen, uh, you know almost two thirds or three fourths of the fund in those two years actually beat the benchmark, right? In the mid cap space. So that's really the testament to what we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, that you know you will capture or you will protect the downside in, in, in falling markets, especially in smaller mid caps. And I guess we'll have to look for the next cycle to really. Uh, see how this pans out because we've been uh, looking at a pretty stellar up move over the course of the last several months and years in fact. Thank you so much Kostup for joining in and for giving us all of that perspective. My, my pleasure Alex, thank you so much. That brings us to the end of this particular edition of the Mutual Fund Show. Let us know what you think and uh, whether or not you uh, saw the readings and uh, measured them according to your portfolio. Do stay tuned, lots more coming up on NDTV, NDTV Profit. I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Welcome back to NDTV Profit. You're watching Large Trades, a show where we talk about all kinds of bulk and block deals, 
large trades and stocks buzzing on the back of volumes. I'm your host Nika Barve and with me is Agam Bakir. But before we go on to the stocks we'll be discussing today, Agam, how do the markets look like right now? So, uh, well, it's been very, very quiet. There was uh, no volatility before the RBI monetary policy and there has been none uh, since. And uh, well, the Nifty at the moment is at around 20 to 500 and, and that's exactly where the index has been trading at through the course of the day. Well, say for the first perhaps a half an hour or so. So it's a day of consolidation. Uh, the monetary policy was on expected lines, nothing out of the blue. And this is possibly the reason why we aren't seeing anything out of the ordinary for the benchmarks either. So while the Nifty continues to remain flat, the, ben the, the bank Nifty is advancing by around half a percent. But that has also been maintaining this particular level say, over the course of the last well, two hours or so. So we haven't seen any substantial change as such as far as well, some of these key indices go. We do have, let's, let's pull up the constituents of the Nifty. We do have further gains for, from the likes of HDFC Bank. And that's in fact the top contributor towards the gains as well. ITC and Kotak Mother Bank also having a reasonably good day of trade also contributing to the up move. But what is countering that up move is LNT, ICICI Bank and Bajaj Finance. Of course, Bajaj Finance has also come up with quarterly updates. Uh, not looking too bad, but I reckon that considering the fact that Bajaj Finance has moved up in the last, uh, well, 10 odd sessions, after the well, quarterly update, we're looking at just a tad bit of consolidation or maybe a little bit of profit booking coming through. What about the broader markets? Let's pull that up as well. Uh, let's see how things are panning out there. So a uh, little bit of an outperformance once again for the mid cap index up around 0.4%. And the small cap index is uh, uh, again out by as much as half a percent. Now, if you just consider the broader markets and the kind of stocks that are in fact seeing a change, you know, uh, we are looking at gains in the likes of IGL, which is up around 3.7%. The, the gas sector has been in focus of late, hasn't it? Um, of, and we also have uh, something like a Tata Chemicals, which is now starting to see a little bit of recovery. That's up around 3.7% as well. We have a resumption of the up move and an uptrend in something like a PB FinTech, that's up around 3.7%, and IRFC. This one has been perhaps one of the bigger gainers in the last 12 months, and it seems like after a bout of profit taking, we're starting to see strength return to IRFC. In terms of, well, some stocks which are under a tad bit of pressure, we have Max Healthcare, which is down 2%, and Gujarat Floro, that's the chemicals company, which is also declining by around one and a half percent. But on the whole, it's turned out to be a, a quiet, quiet day for the benchmark indices. Uh, and, you know, no big takeaways as far as uh, the RBI monetary policy goes. And as far as the advanced decline ratio is concerned, that also remains with those which are advancing and just have a, a, a notch higher. Uh, that's how markets are uh, faring at the moment, Mika. Yes, but let's, you know, before we go on to the equity markets, let's take a look at the commodity markets. Now, Brent prices have been on a bullish trend. It's up about 11% in the past uh, month itself. On, on your screen, what you have is NYMEX crude, but I'm talking about Brent prices. But just to get some more perspective, we're joined by Amrita Sen, who's the founder and director of research at Energy Aspects. Good afternoon, Amrita. Hi, hi. So, of uh, course, I wanted to ask you your general view on how the prices have been faring and what are your what is your analysis on the entire scenario? Um, I mean, look, we've been calling for um, stronger summer crude prices, contrary to most people. And I know banks have finally started raising their price forecasts, but you know, coming into this year, our crude price forecast this year was already $85 for bread. So this is very much in line with expectations. The only thing I'd say is that we've probably gone above 90 a bit prematurely because of geopolitical uh, risk premiums being priced in. Our view was that we'd probably hit the nine handle more in the summer months, so a couple of months later. Uh, but fundamentals remain strong. There's nothing there to suggest that you know the prices shouldn't be high through the summer. Right now, we are seeing quite a bit of geopolitical risk premium in uh, baked into prices. 
And you, you spoke about um, you know, the market premium that has been priced in. What kind of range do you think the market is pricing in the premium at? And you know, obviously we can't um, forecast on how the geopolitical situations pan out, but in the short run, in the next three to six months, how do you, what do you feel like the trajectory of the prices are gonna go to? Um, I think a couple of dollars of uh, geopolitical risk premium is priced in, so say two to three dollars, I wouldn't say it's much more than that. However, um, where, where I do think um, you could see, if anything, in the short term, after the next, you know, right now, of course, given all the Iran-Israel uh, rhetoric and, and, and attacks that we've seen and, and potential for retaliation uh, sentiment and just generally nerves are, are quite um, uh, high and, and people are going to be unlikely to willing to short this. But we actually don't see any impact in the crude oil market in terms of outright supply disruptions from these um, geopolitical tensions. So I think short-term prices will probably correct lower, um, say, in a week or two's time before it rises back again above 90 towards 95 in the summer. So no expectations of the prices maybe going to $100 per barrel? Um, we can absolutely see $100 in terms of just kind of hitting 100 but it doesn't mean we're going to sustain there given the fact that we do have OPEX fair capacity. And, you know, they, they, they can always start to gradually bring back barrels um, to the market in, in Q3 if required. That's not our base case, but it can absolutely happen. I think what we need to be mindful of is that there can be a time lag that prices could actually go quite high. Definitely, like you said, definitely above $100 is possible um, for a period of time before OPEC reacts. So, yes, you could have a short period of time, but I don't think it's going to necessarily be sustainable. Thank you so much, Amrita, for joining us. Well, viewers, um, there you have it, a 2 to $3 risk premium that the market is currently pricing in on the, on, on the back of geopolitical tensions. Prices could uh, inch higher, but not likely to sustain. Um, up next, let's talk about the stocks that we do have in focus today on the back of large trades and higher volumes. There's something, co something like an Indico Remedy, Venkis India, Sahi India Glass, as well as Mahindra Life Spaces. But up first, I want to talk about Indico Remedy, where the stock is up more than... Um, 2% in trade today. It, uh, it's up more than 7% in trade, 2% uh, in trade today. And my um, colleague, Vasha, joins us for more details about the same. Hi, Mika. So as you rightly said, so Indo Indico Remedies is buzzing on the back of volumes. Volumes are uh, trading over a 6 x 30-day average, while company did see an intraday high of 7%. Currently, the uh, stock price is hovering around, uh, the, the stock price is up around 2%. Um, now, uh, I'm going to break this into uh, two part, into three parts. Firstly, I'm going to talk about what this company does and what are the growth prospects and maybe some fewer points on margin and export segment as well. Uh, so this company manufactures uh, uh, formula formulation that is finished dosage form that is the end medicine the final drug that we eat also this company manufactures api that is used for making that the final medicine that we eat now uh, they are present in anti infectives respiratory ga gastrointestinal and dental therapies as well now if you see the future prospect for this company so they are ex they are expecting to launch two to three new products for us market from their goa facility and they have located almost 150 crores of capex for fy24 and similar levels of capex capex for fy25 as well and they are expecting a minimum of 15 percent growth in h2 fy24 as per q2 con call of q2 con call, con call of the company and company is also focusing on, on export markets as well now few points that i want to highlight on margin aspect if you see margins in FY23 declined to 17% versus 21% in, 20, in uh, FY22. Now, this was because of low contribution from domestic formulation segment, which typically has a high margin. Further, raw material price inflation and higher ad advertisement promotion costs also affected their margins. But in H1 FY24, if you see, margins declined to 14.6%. Now, this was on, on account of higher expenses, mainly towards official action indicated, that is OAI status for Goa plan. Now, what does this mean is, this is the strictest regulatory classification. It means that regulator issued observation to the plant and was not satisfied to the responses given by the company on that observation. Now, the regulator can decide what further action can be taken and can uh, impose an import alert also. So, the margin were affected because of the cost 
attached to this OAI status and uh, this is expected to remain impacted for one more quarter as well. But in Q2, company was expecting, uh, in Q2, Concord company said that they, that they are expecting margins of around 17% uh, in, in HY24, uh, in H2 FY24. Now let's see what that happens. And lastly, uh, company is expecting uh, growth in export markets as well. But with this, the uh, working capital intensity is expected to increase marginally as higher inventory will be required and higher uh, uh, debtor days will also be seen on the balance sheet. So this is all we have on Indoco Remedies. Right, Varsha, thank you so much for getting us uh, that insight into Indoco Remedy. Again, uh, a relatively volatile stock in a sector which isn't very volatile, but uh, there is choppiness in this one. It's, it's, it's very evident in the, what you've seen in, on your screen. But today, of course, uh, the stock has been moving on very large volumes. And in fact, it's, it's, it's had its own share of choppiness today as well, because at one point in time, it was substantially higher. It is uh, considerably off its day's highs. But uh, we move on and talk about Venki's India. You know, before I just wo move into Venki's India, there was in fact a comment from the from the deputy governor, uh, where he did in fact mention the volatility in prices for food inflation, the various factors that play at different points in time. It's been sticky. And uh, of course, he had also mentioned proteins in this case, where he had spoken about eggs in poultry as well. Uh, well, on that note, let's get in my colleague Mahima to tell us a little more about what's going on with Venkis India, because they are into this business as well. Mahima, this one's for you. Right, uh, Agam. So, uh, well, the stock did touch an intraday high of almost 9% in trade today, and the volumes are uh, six times the, its 30 day average. And the stock, the stock has seen a lot of weak performance in the past six months. However, it is off, um, you know, it, the stock is actually recovering from that. Uh, the resistance levels are around 2087 uh, at three months peak, and support levels at 1531, which is their one week low. Now, uh, in terms of feed prices, where the feed price of soy and maize are expected to remain stable going forward and the other ingredients that Venkis use may uh, see some kind of price increase. Uh, however, uh, for their Q4, uh, recently their new plant in Maharashtra has become operational. So we, we, we might see some kind of addition to revenue from that and um, some kind of volume growth from that particular plant. But if we talk about Q3 performance, the Q3 performance was not uh, up to the mark. The revenues were down around 8%. Uh, they had incurred a net loss of around 7 crore. However, the losses have improved from 60, uh, 16 crores to 7 uh, crores uh, YOY. And um, well, for Q3, uh, the revenues degrowth was driven, driven mainly by uh, fall in oil seed revenues. And uh, the oil seed, oil seed segment was impacted by lower demand and muted realizations and poultry segment profit uh, margins were impacted on lower realization so basically um, uh, in q4 what we'll watch out for is the trend in prices of oil seeds overall and the demand for poultry overall so this is what we have for venki so far right mike maima thank you so much for joining us and taking us through that one uh, well it's a uh... Uh, oil seeds, I guess, in this case is also a critical factor for as far as Venkis is concerned. Well, uh, let's move on and talk about Asahi India then. And that one is on your radar, Mihika. Yes. So Asahi India Glass, it's a glass solution company, play on the automotive as well as the architectural glass segments. Now, it's the top volume buzzer of the day. Volumes over 21 times its 30-day average. And the buyers did outnumber the sellers. Now, the stock is up to an intraday high of 8.7%, up 13% in the last five days itself and 33% in the last one year. Now, a little bit about the company, two major segments. One is the automotive glass uh, segment where it holds a pretty dominant position in the Indian automobile industry. It holds over 70% of the passenger car glass market and also caters to the commercial vehicles like trucks and buses. And in the architectural glass segment, it offers um, glass solutions for exterior and interior architecture, solutions like tempering, laminating, insulating units. Now, capacity at 13, man 13 manufacturing factories, um, uh, laminated capacity of 8 million pieces, tempered capacity of 40 million pieces, and 
the company is also set to invest um, heavy capex um, in FI24 itself. It, the highest ever capex of 1,400 crores was guided by the company. Investment would be in a third float furnace in Rajasthan, um, modular and brownfield expansions in the auto glass business itself. And when you look at the outlook in terms of the CV segment, while there has been moderate growth, experts are confident in the market improvement um, despite the low growth rate, better economic activity, higher traction in terms of um, infrastructure related activities given the government push is set to help demand and lastly um, you know we had an ISO management itself that you know guided heavy duty truck sale volumes to touch um, 2.8 lakh units by the FY24 end so that would trigger the you know might trigger the company's volumes and the performance regard despite having a weak Q3 um, that's all we had on Asahi but finally we have Mahindra Live Spaces now, the company has positive growth outlook and has reached an intraday high of 7.2%. It's off his eyes up about 4.5%. But we have Anushi joining us to give more perspective on the stock. Right, Mihika. So if you have to look at the realty stocks today, they have been in focus on the back of couple operational op updates over here. But what is dragging the tension in the realty space is surprisingly Mahindra Live Space developers with an intraday high of about 7% as you mentioned. And the stocks volumes also seeing about five times the volumes compared to the 30-day average. Now, while there are no fundamental drivers as such that is moving uh, due to which we are seeing this kind of up move, let's just go back and see what kind of performance that the company has displayed over the last three quarters and try to sum up uh, on that basis. So again, if you have to look at the quarterly trends of the company, the sales value has remained in the range of about 345 to 443 crore in the last three quarters, which now culminates to about like 1,800. Again, if you have to look at the annual residential sales that they're tapping into is about 3,000 crore by 20, FY25. Uh, coming to the collection side, collections have also remained in the 2,676 to 300 of crores um, in, uh, in the last three quarters. Again, if you have to look at the guidance that the company has given, um, this number in context to what the FY25 by 25 and 28 guidance is there we are seeing a strong CAGR growth over here 3000 crore is the estimate that they're giving for the annual residential sales by FY25 and a further estimate of about 8000 to 10000 crore of sales value by FY28 so definitely focus remains on the company able to get in those numbers that they have planned out for the next in the next uh, four five years um, again the focus markets for the company remain in the MMR that's the Mumbai metropolitan region in Pune and the Bengaluru markets. Um, so a significant presence over here. And now uh, moving its focus from the um, from moving to mid premium and premium segments again compared to the earlier affordable housing segments it was seeing in so this can also lead to the margin expansion for the company going forward again so that remains on the watch out on when these expansion can uh, be panned out for the company's financials going forward if you had to look at the stock performance of the company as all realty players, the one-year return for the company remains impressive at about 81 percentage, while its one-month and six-month re return stands about 12 percent and 22 percent. So, Bahindra Live Space has been in focus for today, and definitely we will be on the watch out for if there is any new update coming in for the company going forward. All right, Anushi. Uh, well, thank you so much for getting us those updates. But on that note. Where it's time to slip into a short break, but on the other side, we get you an update on the rupee and a lot more. Stay tuned in. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy.
Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company, some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. What matters worldwide is now in the palm of your hands. Get ready to seize the... Welcome back to NDTV Profit. You're watching Large Trades. Up next, the rupee has seen a marginal, has seen marginal gains against the dollar after RBI decides to maintain the status quo. My colleague Mimansa joins us with more on the same. Yeah, hi, Mehka. So uh, the rupee rose to 83.25 dollar today uh, after the, a little while ago, uh, which shows that the rupee has strengthened a little bit from the previous close, which was at 83.44 dollar. Now, why is this important? Is because uh, for the last two consecutive days, the rupee has been closing at record lows, and in fact, yesterday the rupee opened at a, a record low of 83.43 dollar. Now, after the uh, uh, after the MPC. A statement, the currency market has drawn a little bit of comfort in the sense that there was no uh, surprises on the currency market front uh, and the positive commentary that came from the RBI governor on inflation and growth also uh, led to some sort of uh, uh, uncovering of the long positions that the traders had built on the dollar. Uh, now, uh, currency traders were expecting uh, some announcements on uh, the futures uh, derivative trade that uh, that the, that the currency market has been panicking about for the last few days. Uh, but uh, since the MPC statement did not give any uh, surprises on that front, the currency market dealers were unwinding their long positions that they had built over the week on the US dollar. And that led to a little bit of uh, strengthening in the USD INR. Right, Mimansa, thank you so much for joining us and giving us those details. Of course, one way to uh, protect the dollar from strengthening further uh, is, of course, uh, the reserves that we have. So in his MPC outcome uh, speech, where uh, the Reserve Bank of India Governor Shakti Kanda Das also spoke about how the Central Bank has, in fact, managed its uh, forex reserves despite global headwinds. Listen in. In 2021, our forex reserves had also reached 642 plus a billion US dollars. Then uh, following the commencement of the war in Ukraine and the outflow of uh, uh, dollar from India as well as from several other countries on uh, safe haven demand, uh, there were concerns that forex reserves of India was going down and at one point it had gone down, our forex reserves had gone down to about 524 uh, billion dollars. And at that time I think several questions were raised about, uh, uh, you know, what was RBI doing, whether RBI was on the right track. If you recall, at that time we had very clearly assured that the decline in forex reserves was partly due to, uh, you know, the change in valuations of our assets and also partly due to our intervention in the market to ensure an orderly depreciation of the rupee, which is a part of our policy, ensuring orderly depreciation or orderly appreciation. And we had that time very clearly and firmly stated that we are using our forex reserves in a very judicious manner. It was a strong umbrella which we had built up and we are using it because it was raining heavily. And we were mindful of what we were doing. We knew what is our purpose and in which direction we are moving. And as you would see, now the reserves have again risen and they stand at an all time high of 642.6 billion US dollars, 645, not 642, sorry, 645.6 billion as of 29th March. 
We now move focus to the e-gaming space. Now, the Supreme Court has transferred to itself on Friday all petitions pending before various high courts challenging the 28% retrospective good and services tax liability on e-gaming companies. We have Varun Gakhar joining us with more on this. Yeah, hi, that's right. A, to a, a total of nearly 27 cases pending before nine high courts have been transferred before the Apex Court. And some of these pending challenges are filed by Delta Tech com Gaming Company, Golden Gaming International, Vision 11 Gaming, etc. And the tax demands from these companies are running into thousands of crores. Now, the court has said that to avoid different views that might prop up from different high courts on this issue, it is better that the top court takes a final call on the matter. The court will now hear all these matters along with the Gamescraft case in the first week of May. Now, it must be noted that earlier this year, the top court had agreed to hear pleas challenging the retrospective application of the revised 28% GST rate. Now, these e-gaming firms are that are challenging the tax department's stance to impose a 28% GST on the full face value of the bets for the period prior to October 1, 2023. Now, as per the department, the tax will be levied at the point when the deposit is made, irrespective of whether the activities are a, a game of skill or a game of chance, as long as they are played with stakes. Now, in addition, the government has said that this liability was already pre-existing and that the law has not been amended in this regard, but only clarified. Consequently, the tax department has been issuing GST notices for, for the period prior to October 1, 2023 as well, which has led to a battery of GST notices being slapped on these companies with demands that are running into multiples of their earnings. Right, Varun, thank you so much for getting us those updates. Uh, another very interesting story there you have, uh, well, uh, to keep an eye on. But uh, on that note, we've run, run out completely out of time on the show. So, uh, well, uh, we're going to wrap this uh, session up, but uh, don't go anywhere. On the other side, we get you India Markets Close. Stay tuned in. I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. We've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money.
there are different types of stocks. Large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, and small cap stocks. How to decide which is the one for you? Don't listen to anyone and everyone. When it comes to your hard-earned money, join us as we put the spotlight on six stocks on your show, Hot Money. Thanks so much for tuning into India Market Close, uh, and um, it, it's a it's a very interesting characteristic of the day today that there is uh, a bit of a, while the markets are flat, there is a bit of a lone ranger kind of a performer which is helping the markets do this. Though the likes of ITC are also bouncing back, but before I get to specifics, bring up the mid caps and the small caps as well because it's not been a bad day for a day which was besieged by queues of. Slightly choppy world markets and higher oil prices. I think we've done very well. Mid caps up about half a percent, small cap index up about half a percent. This is actually turned out to be a much better outing than what most people would have hoped for. And you know, this week is characterized by the kind of performance that one HDFC bank has put up. Bring up the heat map and then bring up the point contribution so look at the kind of gains that are happening in select stocks the index is flat because the likes of hdfc bank the likes of kotak bank and the likes of itc are the ones which are helping the markets do better else there's a fair degree of red in the session today there is weakness in grass and weakness in bpcl and omc's by and large are sulking there is weakness in two wheelers in the session today bajaj auto has stayed low for better part of the morning today and continues to stay lower bajaj finances uh, continue to stay lower after the customer addition numbers seemed a bit off so that's the other piece but the point I'm trying to make is if we just get the contributors list out here and you will see that we are flat or kind of we, we kind of flat because principally because of HDFC Bank and then to an extent ITC that ICICI Bank has moved back into the green is only incidental and and uh, before I hand it over to Harsh just get the advanced decline ratio up on the screen as Harsh walks in to just show you how the day is shaped up so a fair degree of red which crisscross and now the green and that just shows the strength at the broader end of the spectrum. Yes, absolutely Neeraj. Uh, you can clearly see that uh, the broader markets are doing fairly well. Let me pull up uh, some stocks counters uh, which are doing well on the back of one being news of course and uh, others just generally uh, which are buzzing in trade. I want to uh, first off try and pull up something within the finance basket. Avas, Bajaj Finance both declared numbers uh, and both have gone different ways. Bajaj Finance's numbers not bad, but couple of blips in with regard to the new loans booked, possibly keeping the stock in check. Also, mind you, the stock has been up nearly 15% over the last month till close yesterday. So, some possible bit of profit booking, maybe that's the other possibility. The other one, Marico doing very, very well in trade, 3.5% higher. In a tough environment, posting a decent set, a growth and looking at double digit margin uh, or rather EBITDA growth as well, not bad uh, in terms of those numbers. Uh, some of the other stocks uh, which are at play, something like an Amber Enterprises um, signs a JV agreement, absolutely flat now but was up around a percent or thereabouts. Puravankara, again very strong set of numbers has been up all through the day. Uh, let's see where that one is at, 6% higher even now. Let's pull up again some finance stocks. IFL Finance is doing fairly well in trade today. Look at that, 13% up now, IFL Finance. Uh, and uh, you have SBI cards as well, up about 5 odd percent. Not sure what is on with IFL Finance, but it's on a tear at least uh, at the moment. Let's also pull up some gas stocks doing fairly well in trade today, IGL, MGL. You also have something like a Rashi Peripherals. Uh, order win of 1500 crore, market cap of 2500 2, odd crore, so clearly up and away that one newly listed company. Zomato, SJVN, IRB, all of those are also up and away in trade. Uh, as, uh, Zomato has been pretty much a one-way performer. Uh, we've seen it go from 40 to 200 now. 
uh, it's it's been quite a quite a performer for someone who's bought it at uh, at those lows um max health intellect uh, angel one angel one second consecutive day of losses after uh, the numbers that they disclosed yesterday morning uh, i also want to try and pull up a couple of tata stocks tata chemicals tata investments uh, was doing fairly well in trade today i think maybe yeah okay tata investments down 2.6 but tata chem still continues to be three and a half percent higher uh, neeraj back to you well um there is some strength uh, in banks for the week as well if you look just look at the weekly performance of hdfc bank before i go to vijay chopra and that's what i want to start off talking about with nifty bank for the day has done well for the week too has not done too badly and that is courtesy what's happening to hdfc bank i think that is the key thing weekly performance three percent hdfc bank weekly chart before i go to vijay chopra seven percent higher and being the star performer really uh, he's md and ceo enoch ventures joins us right now on the show vijay good having you thanks so much for taking the time out and speaking to us um the the monthly numbers from the banks or the rather the quarterly updates from the banks have looked or financials have looked reasonably strong for the most part is that is what driving this kind of performance and can it continue well the most of the growth we have seen you know let me talk about the private sector banks first so hdfc coming first and i think that even on your show i have mentioned that shift to large caps uh, shift to uh, hdfc bank you know which has not moved much and uh, has actually fallen down in the last few months and there's a lot of pessimism around hdfc bank so whenever there is a huge amount of pessimism around a good quality stock uh, i think it's time to latch on to it so hdfc even kotak right now it hasn't moved much i would recommend that you know uh, people can start nibbling into a bank like kotak so it's a great bank uh, i think that uh, certain public sector banks like bank of baroda looks very good uh, bank india bank of in uh, bank of india indian bank uco bank idbi bank these are great banks to have in a portfolio and you know you can latch on to the performance has been constantly uh, on the up move uh, you know the the the, the overhang of uh, bad loans and uh, a bad asset quality is is gone past i think in the last 3 4 years so most of the banks are doing very well their names are improving their uh, deposits are uh, definitely going up because you know the fd rates are pretty high so people are locking more and more money into their fds uh so i think that you know the banking sector overall uh, for 24 25 seemingly looks very good and i think that you know be with the large cap banks they can do really well even you know the likes of indusin um, sbi in a correction yes uh, one should buy in a correction but yes the smaller banks uh, smaller public sector banks and large private sector banks look good mm-hmm. okay Richard Jain, lead analyst at FiPaisa.com, joins us on the show. Richard, it's been a while. Thanks for taking the time out. Uh, how do you gauge the strength in financials? Because that's, I mean, today too, ITC is there, but otherwise for the week, it's been financials which have led the rally. Can that continue next week? Yeah, hi, very good afternoon, Neeraj. Uh, well, Neeraj, if we so, uh, look at the recent corrective phase, which just went by where you know Nifty corrected by about by about 800 points, and even mid cap and the small caps had a very sharp correction. Now, if you compare that correction of Bank Nifty vis-à-vis the other sectors, then I think Bank Nifty has relatively managed to do well during their corrective times, and uh, you no, know, it has formed that high top, high bottom structure. And now, last two trading sessions also, if we see yesterday, markets witnessed a witness a bit of volatility on the Nifty front, but relatively it was doing well. Bank Nifty was doing well, and even today's trading session, we can clearly see that relative strength. And this time, I think the private sector banks have been showing some positive signs. You look at HDFC Bank. Uh, breakout from a consolidation of, of of about two and a half to three months uh, uh, sideways movement. Even Kotak Bank has uh, you know started picking up momentum. ICC Bank is trading around its support. So I think the downside seems to be very limited for this banking space at least for the short term. And that high top high bottom structure which I was talking about that should lead to Bank Nifty towards new all time high, which is I think around forty eight thousand six fifty was the previous high. So from a trading perspective, uh, the trend still remains quite intact. We are expecting new highs to be, uh, no, crossed quite soon, maybe early next week itself. Okay, Rachit. Uh, while I am on financials, and while we are on financials, rather, Vijay, if I can ask you your views with regard to Bajaj Finance, because it's puzzling. Thirty-four percent growth, six and a half odd percent sequential, on uh, an AUM which has 
ballooned uh, uh, so on a very high base, if I can call it. Uh, uh, how, what are investors thinking? One and a half percent lower in trade today? No need to react on one and a half percent. This is the call. And you know, if you have a company like Bajaj, which is one of the behemoths and one of the biggest in the NPFC space, uh, I think that you know uh, one should not worry at all. Uh, these stocks are uh, you know great stocks and should be bought into a correction. And I actually recommended it in some of the channels around say, 64, 6500. It is now at 71, 80 odd. I think that it has a potential to go up to 8,000. So no worry at all. So just keep on hanging around. Uh, these companies, if somebody is a long-term investor, keep on hanging to the stock. This might go to 10,000. And uh, for yes, traders, I think that there's a lot of steam left. Uh, this uh, stock should cross 8,000. Clearly bullish on that one, Vijay. <clears throat> And it seems uh, you're quite bullish with regard to the larger, uh, larger lenders, uh, if I can call that. Uh, Ruchit, your views specifically on Bajaj Finance, if at all, on charts and uh, your top picks as well. Yeah, so if we look, uh, look at both the stocks, Bajaj Finance as well as Bajaj Finsav, they made their previous all-time high in the, somewhere in the month of September or October 2021. And since 2021, uh, markets or NBFC space has done quite well, but still this uh, both these stocks, Bajaj Finance as well as Bajaj Finsa have been consolidating in the range. Now, if you look at a bit uh, longer term time frame, then this entire move of last two and a half years seems to be a consolidation phase or a time-wise corrective phase, which we can say. So we are not expecting any significant price-wise decline from current levels, but uh, no, stocks are still within this uh, consolidation phase. So I think in near term, we expect the sideways movement to continue. Well, more attractive is Bajaj Finsav if you look at the chart structures then in the, the entire following trend line of this entire consolidation is coming around 1700, 1750 and uh, no, the stock is quite close to that level. In case if we see a breakout above that 1700, 750 range in Bajaj Finsav, then I think this stock would be poised for a, for a decent run up. Usually both the stocks move uh, in tandem with each other. So I think a relative outperformance or if uh, we get a breakout in Bajaj Finsav over there, then short to medium term traders can look for buying opportunities are there. So at these levels, not expecting any significant downside in both Bajaj Finsav as finance, but both are uh, no, still in a consolidation phase. And we need to see a breakout uh, no, before taking a fresh uh, entry on the long side. Uh, now, as far as uh, no, fresh recommendations are concerned, uh, InfoEdge is one of our recommendations which we are recommending. Uh, if you look at this stock within the entire IT basket, a relative outperformance has been seen. In fact, very few of the IT names in this last corrective phase, if you see whether it's InfoEdge, LTTS, uh, or uh, OFSS, these have been three names which have shown an outperformance in a uh, corrective phase. So I think this is looking quite positive even from, uh, even from current levels. Price volume action is quite bullish over here. So one can go long on InfoEdge with stock below 55.50, expecting target somewhere around 59, 50 to 6,000 in the short term. And century textiles within the mid cap uh, space is looking quite attractive. Recently, we have seen at the start of this week itself, we witnessed a breakout from a consolidation that was supported by very good volumes. Last three days, it has been consolidating, but no volume based selling has been seen. Minor corrections without any meaningful volumes compared to the volumes that we have seen during the breakout. So I think this is poised for a good move uh, in the coming week. So take a time frame of about one week's perspective and go long on century over here, stop with 1600 for potential targets around 1800. Mm. Okay, so those are some ideas. Now, uh, one of the key gainers or the gaining sector for the day, you would argue has to be real estate, up more than a percent and specific stocks have come out with a Q4 business updates. Let's get in my colleague Anushi to talk about uh, some of these. Anushi, good afternoon. Right, good afternoon, Neeraj. So we have three companies coming out with their Q4 updates. First on the list is Soba Limited. Now, if you had to look at Soba Limited's numbers over here, let's look at the pre-sales number over here. If you had to look at the pre-sales, that has comparatively remained in the 2% of a upside, not much of a great quarter over here, while the realizations have moved about 13.5% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. But it is the QOQ numbers which are kind of disappointing over your pre-sales have gone down about 23% 
while the realizations has also slipped about 4 to 5 percent of a range. If you had to look at pre-sales also and see most of this 2.8 percent growth, even that is driven by the company's Bangalore uh, launch, uh, which was announced in Q3. So that remains on Soba. Again, sequential decline, which we saw was the lowest in the last 10 quarters. Sales volume also stood at about 1.3 million square feet, which is again about a 9 percent downside on a year or year basis. Now, Again, if you have to look at the context of the overall FY24 update over year, the pre-sales that we are looking at, that has seen about a 27.8% growth. Again, this 27.8%, if you have to compare it with the company's management guidance that they had stated, that is about the 20% mark that they had given in the previous conference call. Again, um, on the price, average price realization, the 19% of an up move over year with about price realization of about 10,922 per square feet. Moving on, we have macro tech developers. Um, overall, in line results for macro tech, if you have to look at the pre sales, about 4,230, which showcases about a 40% growth on the basis of its Q4 numbers, while the collections have gone about 20% of an uptick. While if you look at the company's FY24 results, a 20% of, of a growth over year to about 14,520 and about a 6% growth in its collections. The company did guide for about a 20% of a guidance for its FY24, which it currently met in the year. Now, even um, more on this, if you are to look at the company's net debt also, the company has been, most of the realty players, in fact, have been on the focus to bring down their net debt numbers, which has reduced to about 3,000 crore compared to about 7,000 crore in FY23. So significant downside over year, if you are to look at that. And the GDV number, which is about the gross development value, initially the company had guided for about 17,500 crore, but the company has exceeded that with about 20,300 crore. Last on the list is Purvankara, strong set of numbers over year, about 93% of a volume and pre-sales value growth, while the realizations has remained comparatively flat. This is due to the inventory mix that the company has between Purva, Purva land. So one aspect is that, again, coming to the FY23 number, FY24 numbers for the company, 84% of volume driven growth, while the value has seen about a 90% upside. Again, the company had in the last three quarters has posted some strong number numbers and continues on this trajectory. So the focus now remains on the company's realization on how it would change its inventory mix going forward. So these are the three companies which were on the focus on the back of its Q4 numbers. Thanks, Anushi. Thanks for that. And Purvankara is the stock that we will talk to 7% higher. We take a quick break. We back from a break and get in the management of Purvankara. Our group CEO Abhishek Kapoor throws some light on the quarter and the year gone by. I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Ninety-three percent uptick uh, in volumes, ninety-three percent uptick in value. Realizations being uh, steady in the quarter. Purvankara 
may not have asked for too much more. Abhishek Kapoor, Group CEO, Purvang Karada, man behind the execution, joins in to talk about the quarter in the year gone by. Abhishek, good having you. Thanks for joining in. Uh, this is this is not. I mean, this is unusually strong numbers. Is this pure demand or is this also some bit of spillover happening from quarter three? I'm trying to ascertain if this is a new normal of sorts for you or did this take you by surprise as well, the 93% growth? Um, so thank you for having me on the show. Uh, but this is really not something which is a surprise for us. Clearly, there is a plan behind it. There is a execution behind it. There is a thought behind it. Um, we started our year with a plan. I think we have delivered very close to the plan, internal plan that we had. Um, while the sales volume, I think the amount of inventory that we really opened up eventually exactly was similar to what we had planned, even though we didn't get sanctions as per plan. Uh, but overall, we are very happy with the numbers. And uh, we start uh, with a plan in the beginning of the year, like for this coming financial year as well. Uh, we have a plan in mind uh, and we did announce all the new launches uh, very close to those numbers in terms of opening of the inventory and selling. Uh, so pretty happy with it. Uh, I am now we are on to the next year. Right. So give us a uh, uh, harsh also joining in uh, Mr. Kapoor. Uh, give us a visibility with regard to FY25 uh, on this higher base. Uh, how would execution be? How would new launches shape up? And how would the numbers really shape up? Look, um, so we were planning to open about 15 million square foot uh, last year, in the sense, uh, launch 15 million square foot, of which we only got sanctions of about 10 million square foot. Uh, so we still have a spill over the five of the 5 million square foot. Even in terms of opening of inventory and sales, we achieved the numbers that we had planned originally, which was around 9 million square foot of our area. Uh, so that 5 billion will continue to give us some momentum. Uh, we obviously had a, have a land bank of about 32 million square foot. So some inventory will come in from there. We've also signed up a redevelopment project in Bombay. And, you know, there is some pipeline which is on the acquisition side, which is currently under play. Uh, so we are hoping that those transactions will get concluded and something will get added over there. So, you know, on an overall basis, we believe that we will uh, tend to continue to push on the growth numbers. Yes. Sure. And, uh, you know, with regard to realizations, I want to try and understand what's happening there. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, uh, with regard to demand, there is no concern, but realizations not creeping up. Is this specific? Uh, is there a specific factor which is at play here, which just want to try and break this down? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, in Purvankra and Provident, we have seen clearly, actually across all three brands, we have seen clearly a price appreciation anywhere between 12% to 25%. Uh, having said that, the mix of inventory changes because uh, we launched a project very recently in Chennai, which was at about uh, 3,000 rupees a square foot. And because of that realization and those volumes, the average uh, you know, realization came down for the company. But if you look at each brand wise and project wise, the realizations only grown. So I think the brand commands a premium in every market it's presented, and we see that trend continuing for sure. Vishak, uh, so what what happened? Uh, oh, it's a two part question. I don't know. Maybe kind of harsh referred to this, but on a higher base, uh, at times it becomes difficult to grow at the same pace. I'm not asking for an exact number, but what I'm trying to ascertain is one: uh, would growth rates moderate a little bit despite the best laid plans as as the quarters roll by, part one, and what happens to uh, the cash flows generated? Do you, ring, do you reckon the demand is strong enough for you to deploy all of that money back into the business in order to keep on growing at a particular pace? Uh, so look, there are two parts, and it's, it's again a more deeper question that you're asking. So the cash flow that we are generating, like we collected in excess of about uh, 1,000 crores in the last quarter, the cash flow we are generating is going towards uh, two or three things, right? Uh, one is clearly it's going towards operations. The second it's going towards repayments because these are self-generating um, uh, kind of on the debt side and the repayments are happening. And then the third is the surpluses are getting accumulated to make sure that we are able to redeploy. Now, we have sold about 7.35 million square foot in the last year. Our goal will be definitely to first ensure that if we have opened 10 million square foot, we replace 10 million square foot of inventory in the business. That is point number one. So clearly there is a focus on new acquisition and that will require capital, internal approvals and external capital. 
Uh, now, one of the things that we are clearly doing is we are rebalancing the portfolio and we are reallocating our capital from different geographies. For example, now there is a bit of reallocation happening towards the West because we believe that the West business will give us uh, the push on the average realization which is especially in case of Bombay, for example, uh, with all the redevelopment work that we are trying to get there, we believe our average realizations will go up. So there is clearly a deployment plan for new acquisition, which will come into play. And that's what happens with the cash. Uh, and of course, part of it will go towards uh, repayment. Part of it is also going towards asset creation. So, you know, for example, some of the debt goes into commercial asset creation, which currently we have about two point, about uh, 2.8 million square foot currently under construction. Sure, and uh, these new launches as well as uh, the projects in Bombay, uh, average realization should be bumped up uh, next year. Uh, so uh, given the low base probably this year as well as the new projects coming next year, uh, can we see a mid-teens kind of increase with regard to uh, realizations? Look, uh, so, you know, realization in our case is a bit of a bit misnomer in the sense that if we go out there and launch another three and a half thousand rupee product in uh, Urua land, but our ability to churn cash is much faster, our margins are good, uh, you know, then it's still average realization may not look effectively going up at that rate, but it'll still look uh, look fairly healthy. I I'd like to believe that it should get better next year. But having said that, you know, if you decide to launch a couple of projects at a lower realization, still making a lot more money, then uh, that should not matter for the market. Okay. Um, my, my last question, Abhishek, um, based on the growth targets that you may have, uh, I mean, I heard you mention that if you open with 10 million, you will close 10. I don't know if that's the official number. I don't know if you're in a position to lay out an official number right now or a guidance right now, but based on the number that you have, and if you have an official number, I would love to hear it, but based on the numbers that you have, would you need to do any kind of fundraising activity on the equity side to execute any of those plans? Oh, definitely. External capital will be required. Uh, so there will be a bunch of, as I said, internal accrual. Some of the, uh, the uh, capital will be raised on the back of ongoing projects because that's the cheapest cost of capital available. Equity is more expensive, so we will evaluate equity as well at an appropriate point in time. Um, so, but at the project level, at the at the business level, not at the group level or the entity level, we're definitely going to uh, look at uh, capital raise because we also, as I mentioned earlier, we are reallocating capital from different geographies. For example, uh, we're sitting in a, on a very large surplus in Kochi. We want to reallocate a bunch of it to, to the West, right? Uh, uh, so therefore, there will be some amount of shifting happening. Uh, but, you know, for us, what's very important is that the business that we do, uh, as long as the debt per square foot of area under development remains comfortable for us, which is somewhere sub thousand rupees a square foot, we'll be pretty happy with it. So I think we're keeping that in mind, we'll continue to do business and make sure that our top line pre-sales and operations go up, collections go up at the same time, our you know, debt per square foot remains at a similar level. Point taken, debt per square foot at a similar level. So can we expect uh, debt, this base uh, of debt, to probably continue and you building on debt from here. So uh, no debt reduction plans at, 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 at a company level, at a console level. Just want to understand that. You're absolutely right. I think as an absolute number, in fact, you might see marginal increase in debt. But on a per square foot basis, again, I'm going back to that per square foot because business is relative. Uh, as long as I have great cover, I have great cash flows, I think we should not be worried about debt. So in that sense, uh, on, a, on a per square foot basis, similar number on an absolute basis, possibly go up. Uh, but on an overall basis, I think the performance of the business will far, uh, you know, like outrun the debt number. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Kapoor, for all of that perspective. Uh, uh, th thanks for having up, taking our time, having a thank conversation you. with us on this one. Stock up and away, of course, 6% high on the back of those very solid numbers. Uh, let me take it across to Vijay. Uh, Vijay, you, you know, we've spoken, uh, you. Hopefully, you've heard uh, that commentary coming in from Purvankara. Uh, with regard to Purvankara in particular, as well as other real estate plays, maybe something smaller, uh, maybe a Suntech uh, or, or a Soba, which came out with numbers. Your views with regard to the space as a whole and any specific names that you're liking at this point? Well, I think that real estate should start doing well once the interest cycle starts coming down. So we had a credit policy today, although it was unchanged. 
Uh, but yes, the cost of uh, capital would come down, come down considerably. Okay, uh, uh, I think there is an audio issue there. Uh, let me quickly just take it to charts. Ruchit, uh, on charts, uh, could you talk to us about Purvankara, how you're looking at it on charts at the moment and the Realty Index in general, uh, if you can quickly take us through that. The broader trend for the Realty space still uh, no, looks quite positive. We are not seeing any kind of volume based sell -off. Even in Purvankara, if you see the recent correction along with the mid caps and the small cap space which we saw, it retraced by about 38.2% of the previous move and it has resumed its uptrend from there. And as I said, you know, when this correction was there, you have not seen any kind of higher, high volume based selling in many of the you know, mid-sized reality names. So I think uh, no, the trend still remains intact. Any existing positions that investors are holding, then they should continue to ride this trend. So maybe around 260, 270, which was the previous swing highs, those levels should be expected uh, in the short term. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Richard. We'll slip into a very short break. On the other side, we'll take you through FNOQs. We'll have Agam uh, coming in on that one. And we'll take a closer look at Shashi Tharoor's portfolio today. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. People believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies. For others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future. Some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Well, it's simple. If you think the market is moving... Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned with us. Uh, we have Agam standing by to break down FNOQs. We are on the last half hour of uh, trade this week, Agam. Well, it's been a very quiet day of trade, Harsh. Uh, and despite the fact that we had the RBI monetary policy, where, of course, we, didn't, we weren't expecting too much and we didn't really get a lot either, well, it was a very, very quiet day of trade for the benchmarks as a whole. And the Nifty continues to trade around the mark of 22,500. That's where we started. That's where we are ending the note uh, days and, uh, on, and very little change in open interest either. The Bank Nifty, again, the picture wasn't very different. We did start off with gains, uh, and we are now looking at the index sustaining the 48,000 mark 
currently at 48,400 and up by around 0.7 percent. A lot of that is on account on thanks to the HTSC Bank and the kind of gains that we've seen there. And we have a 13 percent increase in open interest there. Moving on to your options market as far as the Nifty is concerned, what are we bracing for as we move into the next week? Well, it's going to be a truncated one, mind you, and the expiry will be on Wednesday because Thursday is a holiday. And that's where we are seeing a little more traction once again around the 22,500 mark. This was perhaps one, an easy one to get. When it comes to your overall open interest distribution picture, as one might expect, once again, a lot of straddles being written. And by that, I mean calls as well as puts being written around the 22,500 strike. Let's move on, talk about stocks then and see where things have uh, moved. Well, we do have MGL, Gujarat Gas and Tata Cam looking at longs, Bandhan Bank and Bajaj Finance looking at shorts in terms of stocks which seeing unwinding. We do have short covering for Hindustan Copper, City Union Bank and BEL and AB Capital and Siemens looking at long unwinding coming through. All in all, a quiet uh, will end to this trading week. That's what it looks like right now. Quiet end to the trading week. Thanks for that, Agam. Uh, we hope it remains that way and nothing, no major moves in the next half an hour or so. Uh, let me quickly take it across to Vijay. Uh, uh, Vijay, uh, want you to complete that point with regard to Purvankara and real estate, uh, if you can close that. Yeah, so what I was saying was that interest rate cycle has peaked out seemingly and you know we're going to see a decline in the interest rates. So once that starts, so it would be good for the builders because they are under a lot of debt. So the cost of capital would go down, debt uh, would, be, would be cheaper. Secondly, for the uh, investors and the customers and the buyers, because the interest rates would be available at a cheaper rate. So that would propel the housing market. Now, uh, you know, we, I'll take you back a few years back where there was a lot of overhang of inventory with most of the builders. So this uh, overhang is uh, slowly and steadily going out. They have sold most of their inventory. And uh, I think that, you know, the, the bigger ones would be uh, would be beneficiary. The ones which are on my uh, radar would be, you know, the likes of Godrej Properties, Oberoi Reality, uh, Prestige, uh, Sobha. Uh, you know, the DLF, uh, for sure, you know, these co these companies would keep on doing well. And I think that, you know, in a correction, one should buy these companies. So I think, uh, you know, once the interest rate cycle starts coming down, it will be good for the investors, uh, buyers, as well as the builders. Okay. Ruchit, uh, when I look at this week's performance, uh, while banks, real estate, etc. have done well, the the big gainer has been media. Six and a half percent uptick for that space this week. Uh, have have any of the stocks individually stood out for you from this bucket? I think uh, a lot of underperformance have been seen since uh, have been seen in this uh, index since last two months. Uh, but uh, no, I think it, one should be very stock specific because there are no signs that this is just a resumption of the trend. I think this could be just a pullback move. But if I look at individual stocks within the media space, then I think Sun TV is one stock uh, no, which is looking quite attractive. Uh, just because the entire correction from levels of 730, 740, the stock has replaced its previous up move by about uh, 50%. And we have a very strong moving average support on the weekly charts of some TV around the recent lows of 560, 570. So the downside here seems to be very limited. But again, as I said, uh, you know, the entire index, if I see all the other components, then it could be just a pullback move. So one needs to be very uh, selective from uh, stocks within this space. And the exposure to this sector, I think, should be quite limited. Okay. Well, some NBFCs, of course, ruling the roost today. IFL, by the way, is up 13% now. It's a really strong move that we're seeing in the stock today. And the last half an hour, 45 minutes, this stock has done very well for itself. Avas, of course, Harsh spoke about in the morning as well. A good numbers back move. So that's done okay. And infrastructure seems to be coming back. NBCC, NCC, uh, there is IRB infra, that bucket has done very well. Also, what's done well are, are selectively gas stocks. They are in focus. Several counters witnessing gains. Mika Johnson to talk about what could the potential reasons be for the boost in these stocks. Mika, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So yes, we had the gas stocks, you know, boost in trade, um, you know, early afternoon with Indraprastha gas gaining 7.3% intraday. Mahanagar gas 5. 
percent, Gujarat State Petronet four percent, and Gujarat and Gale in the range of one to two percent. Now there are several factors. One is the peak electricity demand that is coming up. Um, in summer. Now, the IMD is projected higher than um, normal um, minimum and maximum temperatures for the upcoming summer. And the, this basically um, reflects into peak electricity demand, which the data has also been indicating. The government may issue something called the Section 11 under the Electricity Act to gas-based power plants. What it essentially does, it gives authorizes the government to mandate and direct these operating plants to um, operate at a higher level than they already are. Now, according to City, there's 25 gigawatts of gas-based power plants, and the average plant load factor is at 14% in the 10 months of FY24, um, which is slightly lower than the historicals, and Section 11 will help um, boost the gas demand. Potentially higher plant load factors will increase the incremental demand, and City expects 20 million metric standard cubic meters of gas per day to increase in the short term. There was also a Nomura note on gas companies as a quarter four preview where it's maintained its new neutral stance on Gale, IGL, and MGL, a buy on Gujarat State Petronet, which was also up in trade today, and a reduce in Gujarat gas. Now, they expect the counters to benefit from the low input gas costs with spot LNG prices being dipping this quarter. They have also the price cuts to help on a volume uptick point of view. They expect Gale's EBITDA, gas, uh, EBITDA and gas transmission volumes to rise 5 and 10% respectively on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. For IGL, EBITDA to rise 10% quarter-on-quarter and the price cut to also, it could impact the margins, but the lower LNG prices will offset that according to Nomura. And finally, for MGL, they'll benefit from their gas sourcing mix, which stands at an advantageous point versus its counters. And for Gujarat gas, their EBITDA will increase 55% on a sequential basis. Okay, thank you for breaking that down quite comprehensively, Mika. Uh, uh, if I can go to Vijay, your views with regard to gas stocks in particular and within the power basket as a whole, uh, given the way possibly the weather and climate may evolve over the next three to four months. Uh, any opportunity that you are seeing, Vijay, structurally? Uh, uh, Vijay, uh, are you on mute? Uh, if you can just quickly yeah, check. Yeah, sorry. yeah okay, no worries. Yeah. So you mentioned two things. One, that you know I'm uh, fairly bullish on power with the longer. Uh, and of course, you were talking about some gas stocks. So I think IGL... Gujarat Gas, NGL, all these companies uh, seemingly are looking very good on the charts and fundamentals are definitely intact. So I would say that gas is one part. Secondly, you're talking about power. So uh, there is a huge, huge potential in the power stocks. You know, I'm talking about the next 10 years. If India has to grow and become a five trillion economy and more, so we would require power. With the new EV wave, you know, we require power ever more because more and more EV vehicles are getting sold and, you know, they need to be charged as well. So I think the likes of Tata Power, the likes of PFC, REC, uh, you know, PTC, these companies should do well, NTPC should do very well over a period of time. Even I think that, you know, uh, look what's happening to Ereda today, you know, Ereda is almost 11, 12%. So uh, all these companies should do well and, you know, to be bought in a correction, if at all you are seeing a you know uh, unusual spike in the stock, don't just you know jump and buy. Wait for the stock to correct and cool down. So I think that power theme should be there uh, and should be relevant for the next ten years. Okay, and uh, you know you spoke of Ereda. Ereda in particular, uh, I think uh, uh, trading at now uh, pretty much its all-time high, uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, but uh, on valuations, uh, you feel comfortable at this point, Vijay? As I said, let the let the stock come down. Now, uh, you know, the renewable energy circuit has just, I would say we are just scratching the surface. Uh, the government has mandated, uh, you know, to, uh, that, you know, people should have uh, solar power at, on their rooftops. And we are, you know, um, increasing in uh, our, our, our consumption as well as our production is increasing by the day. What I'm talking about, Ereda, is the next 10 years, as I said. So uh, I think that renewable energy and energy and power are going to be the themes. And if at all India has to grow, India is a power-hungry country and we need a lot of power. Uh, Ruchit, uh, with regard to charts, technicals, your views? Uh, Ruchit, uh, I believe there's an audio issue there. Yeah. But... Uh, no, I just, um, it's interesting to see that one, uh, what's happening within that pocket hush, 
uh, to uh, when when you just look at uh, some of the metal counters and it, especially the ones which have the base metal element to them hindustan copper for example yes. with copper prices doing what they're doing i think hind copper despite putting in some rally behind it i think it's still in the green today 2 and 1/2% higher and the price volume action is not too bad either so that's the f- that that's a set of stocks that uh, kind of look interesting um vijay can i ask you uh, the 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 china recovery has flattered many times in the past flattered to deceive uh, could this time be different would you bet on any of the metal names because of either the china factor or otherwise well china is just one part you know look at india look at other parts you know d- during the war most of the production units were closed down in europe so uh, are you suggesting that it's going to be closed down forever no uh, the the consum- the the production would start soon or is starting or in the early phases of uh, of starting so i think that metals should do well now one more data i want to uh, present here uh, the copper mines are getting dry by 2% per annum this means that copper is going to become rarer uh, over the period of uh, you know next few years and for industry uh, you know if you want to see growth across the world copper would be the major metal which is going to be used and that's a parameter also of understanding that what whether there is a industrial uh, actual industrial growth or not so copper uh, price is going up consumption going up definitely denotes something so uh, i think that hind copper in a correction again i'm saying in a correction hindustan uh, zinc in a correction um, national aluminium in a correction right now i think nmdc is well placed you know nmdc one can latch on to at these levels so stocks like nmdc G, uh, gmdc look very good uh, tata steel for that matter in a correction i think that you know tata steel can double up from here so there are great stocks even vedanta the kind of uh, you know news we are getting that uh, they are you know wiping off their debt slowly and steadily uh, we can you know i'm giving a very big target for vedanta uh, probably we might see it at 600 rupees very soon if there is no debt overhang so this company is a fantastic company into aluminium into copper into uh, you know various kinds of metals so i think uh, vedanta is a great company minus the debt so if debt is taken care of i think it can double up so valuations can really square uh, skyrocket and it's a wonderful dividend yielding stock as well so lots of metal uh, you know companies uh, uh, there there are you know some uh, uh, some public sector companies as well as like medani you know mishra dhatu nigam which i like at, uh, like a lot uh, the, the the metal uh, you know production it has it, it is used in defense so mishra dhatu nigam is another public sector company which i think can do very well in the coming years Okay, uh, very very bullish with regard to some of the counters. There's six hundred uh, on Vedanta. That's a that's a solid one. Uh, uh, okay, so thanks for that, Vijay. Let me uh, take it across. Uh, switch focus from metals to FMCG. Marco has come out with its Q4 numbers. Uh, just its Q4 update, uh, rather the pre-result update. Stock is up over three percent, three and a half odd percent now. Over three and a half percent. Mahima. Uh, is here to break down the numbers what it means uh, overall mahima street clearly excited right hers so i'll just start with what the um, the filing says well the fmcg demand uh, sentiment has remained consistent is what they're saying and uh, there is some kind of uh, converging that is looking in terms of uh, both urban and rural demand the domestic business has seen a slight uptick in volume because of um, you know stabilizing their uh, portfolios across segments now something that is working for them is parachute coconut oil uh, and safola oils which is achieved mid single digit volume growth and the food segment has maintained a steady growth uh, and it is reaching about four times its scale in fy20 now and uh, food segment is growing mainly because of um, its digital first brands now uh, in terms of um, Uh, what the guidance that management has given they saying that they expect gradual growth in core categories through their initiatives in the general trade and they want to expand their reach in both urban and rural outlets uh, they're also planning aggressive diversification of portfolio through scaling up food and digital first brands uh, their international business has returned to a double digit constant currency growth and the consolidated revenue uh, has grown in low single digits now uh, overall their margins have improved because uh, copra 
prices have um, have lowered down a bit and uh, edible oil and crude oil derivatives have remained stable and um, the management has also guided that they anticipate low double digit operating profit growth with a healthy expansion in operating margin their aspiration remains focused on sustainable and profitable volume led growth supported uh, by brand strengthening and um, equity in new growth engines so this is the overall view of um, the, what the business update america has come out with well clearly positive and uh, you know we're in we're in we're at a time when fmcg in general is under quite a bit of pressure uh, vijay how do you read into uh, some of this commentary that's coming through uh, from marico seemingly i think that marico uh, and others uh, you know they were under the huge pressure of input costs so input costs were not coming down uh, there was an uptick uh, in the food prices and other things but i think the the the, the performance which marico has shown today and the and the uh, you know uh, commentary we've got from marico this is quite heartening i think that in you know, the likes of tabar hindustan lever itc should do very well i am particularly bullish on itc on another business channel i've given a target of 800 uh within 2 years so i think that you know uh, i'm giving very large huge targets today uh, itc i'm fairly fairly bullish on so there would be you know there are a lot of businesses which would be emerged in future and there's a lot of deep value so they have also built their uh, fmcg business beautifully i think that you know uh, these stocks can be definitely added to portfolio the likes of hindustan lever itc dabur you know these are great companies they have they are uh, you know behemoths and uh, they are bellwethers and they've seen uh, the troughs and the crests of the market for for you know decades so i think that you know these are great companies to start accumulating in in our in the portfolio uh, and definitely you know shun over value and you know look at value i think there's deep value in all these companies okay uh, um also uh, ruchit uh, your view with regard to some of these fmcg counters one and marco in particular i think uh, very selective counters have done well over last few months from the fmc space stocks such as copal has shown a good outperformance where the trend still continues to be positive merico if you see then you know the stock has been in a consolidation phase since almost 2 years now but the lower end of that entire consolidation is around 460 480 in the stock is quite close to that lower end of the uh, of this range so i think the risk reward ratio is favorable for creating for going fresh longs over here But again, you know, in, uh, you know, one should not expect any big gains. But uh, you know, this stock even moves to the higher end of this range, then levels around 560, 550 uh, could be expected. So around 10 to 12 more percent up from current levels. That's uh, you know what the expectation should be. Uh, but uh, overall, it's still in a consolidation phase, and as I said, from the entire FMCG basket, and should be very selective if one is looking from a trading perspective. As of now, the sector has shown a decent underperformance. But going ahead, let's see. You know, which stock witness good price volume action. You know, then only one should uh, place any aggressive bets over there. Yeah, uh, be selective, uh, be cautious. Uh, time of consolidation at the moment. But quickly switching focus. Uh, politicians and investments. We've tried to start <laughs> to focus on that, uh, Neeraj. If I can, if I can term it that way. Uh, how diversified is their portfolio? We put spotlight on Shashi Tharoor's investments. from government bonds to mutual funds to even bitcoin we have alex matthew joining us to help us break down tharoor's portfolio so well, the question that i asked was what stands out in shashi tharoor's portfolio and what stood out to me was the multifarious multitudinous mutual fund schemes that he has and i'm probably using lightweight tharoorian words here but then what that probably probably means or should mean to you is that they are way too many let's take a look at some of those though you have uh, bank deposits of 10.08 crore rupees and these are varied in multiple banks including banks abroad and then let's come to the mutual fund holdings which is as many as 1.72 crore in 23 or 24 schemes and seven of those schemes are equity linked saving schemes and this is incredible for an individual that has total assets of over 50 crore 
is still thinking about saving taxes. Uh, some of the big holdings, however, are in the likes of HDFC Credit Risk Fund, Franklin India Focused Equity Fund, as well as ICIC Approved Multicap Fund, the BAF Fund, the Balanced Advantage from, Fund from ICIC Approved, as well as HDFC FlexiCap Fund. He's also got RBI bonds and certificates of deposit. By the way, those are short-term uh, instruments, debt instruments, to the tune of 3.61 crore rupees. He's got a portfolio management scheme with JM Financial, to the extent of 36.7 lakh rupees. He's also algo trading with an entity called ST Advisors to the tune of 1.23 crore rupees. Uh, and he's finally got gold worth 32 lakh rupees, US Treasury worth 2.02 crore rupees, overseas equity which eclipses everything from domestic holdings at 9.33 crore rupees. One would have to ask if he holds uh, the FANG stocks or, in fact, uh, some of the other large entities there, including NVIDIA. A Bitcoin ETF, which was mentioned earlier to the extent of 5.11 lakh rupees. Bitcoin to the moon, Mr. Tharoor. And options that are currently open worth about 20 lakh rupees. So it seems like Mr. Tharoor's investment portfolio is almost as savvy as his vocabulary, uh, apart from his mutual fund holdings. Yes, indeed. This homo sapiens, uh, I'm trying to think of difficult English words. <laughs> Maybe Alex or Harsh can help me, but that would have been a perfect ending. Sorry, I botched it up. But Alex, thanks so much for bringing that to us. Well, uh, from Rahul Gandhi to Shashi Tharoor. And whoever Alex finds uh, next or whoever's portfolio is found next, we'll try and get some next week as well. Uh, it's something that we'll try and do. Uh, during this election season for sure. Uh, okay, uh, just before we wrap up the trade, uh, let's, uh, let's take in some uh, closing ideas. Uh, usually, Vijay has uh, an interesting investment idea. Uh, Vijay, anything on your radar? There are a few stocks which I would like to recommend. I think that LIC... Vijay, 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 we are very close to market close. So, let's, today, let's just stick to one. Okay, so I think that you know the one stock I would like to recommend today is uh, LIC. So LIC has fallen a lot, and uh, I think that you know post the correction it has become uh, really good, enticing. It is now the largest insurer insuring uh, company in the country. Uh, the Adani overhang is gone. Uh, the numbers more or less are in line. So I think that you know LIC is here for a long haul. I would recommend it for a target of twelve hundred. Okay, Vijay. Uh... Uh, Ruchit, your top BTST or buy this week, sell next week ideas? Oh, this property is looking quite uh, interesting. Uh, for one of the uh, real estate names which is on to its uh, new record high again after the recent corrective phase. So volumes are also good. Price valuation is quite strong. One can go long over here. With stop loss below 2470 and expect targets around 2580. Four and a half percent higher. Godrej property is clearly doing uh, very, very well in trade. Uh, Ruchit, uh, what do you make of some of these NBFC names which are doing fairly well in trade today? Something like an IIFL. We are seeing 13 percent uptake uh, in trade today. Something like an SBI cards up five odd percent as well. Uh, what should one uh, do at this point? Is it a good time to enter? Uh, is there something unique happening with regard to charts? So I'll keep my comments restricted to SBI cards because IFL since we belong to same group company, so I won't be able to comment on that. Uh, SBI cards, I think, you know, the stock could see a sharp pullback move. Today we have a good price volume action after a long period of time. The momentum readings were quite oversold. In fact, the being a weekly close today, even the weekly momentum readings have uh, are giving a positive crossover. So I think one can expect levels around 770 to 770 in the coming week. So if any existing long positions are there, one can hold on, even fresh fine could be done, but from a very short term perspective, a potential target is around 770. Okay, uh, fine. And uh, so well, clearly bullish uh, on that one, SBI cards, uh, 770 being the target price. Uh, Vijay, if I can come to you, uh, funnily, SBI cards up 5.5%, quick take on that one, because uh, it's not been uh, the most clean journey uh, for an investor in SBI cards has been a difficult one. Well, yes, you know, the credit card business is definitely going to be challenged by the new ways of payments. 
and uh, you know i think that sbi card although it is a larger player uh, but yes we have seen you know city bank commercial banking winding down selling its business to uh, to access bank uh, you, the likes of abn amro many many companies have gone out of india so credit card business so to say in india is, is a dangerous business because it, the default rate is pretty high uh, so i think that you know this oversold zone once it i would be comfortable buying uh, you know hdfs uh, uh, sbi card would be you know around maybe 780 790 if it crosses that level i would be comfortable buying it otherwise you know it might be one of flash in the pan hmm. okay Jamman we we'll leave it at that thanks both of you for joining in and giving us your thoughts uh, really appreciate your time have a great weekend let's start wrapping up the markets a minute and 20 seconds left and uh, the intraday of the nifty um, we know that it's flat but just want to mark the intraday to just see the gyrations because we did have uh, a bit of red today for most part and therefore that we are ending close to the flat line is not bad considering that the rest of the world didn't particularly have the greatest of days today i mean if you look at what us markets did overnight what asia did today as well select markets at least in asia i think we are okay uh, bring up uh, the heat map and let's just see if it changed there was about three rows of red uh, and yes a bit more green but kind of around those same line the the aditya billa group has had a bit of an issue today grasm and ultra tech are down Larson is down about a percent and a half. There is weakness in two wheelers. The likes of Bajaj Auto uh, is certainly down in trade. The others, which were down in trade on open, have kind of recovered a little bit of lost ground. Hero Motor Corp, in particular, is in the green now. And what's done well? Kotak Bank, the best performer in addition to HDFC Bank. So two great movers, if you will. ITC was at a point of time the top of the list. It's still up about a percent, but not as strong. as one would have thought and now just before harsh takes over for the broader end of the spectrum just one quick word on the market breadth um, and that will come up on your screen well we ending nearly at the high point of the day so not bad going uh, even as far as that goes harsh what about the mid caps well yes uh, uh, it's a strong day of trade for the mid caps uh, we've outperformed uh, the benchmarks for sure uh, half a percent higher for the nifty mid cap the small cap too uh trading higher and uh, that was very very indicative uh, in the advanced decline ratio as well uh tons of stocks in focus uh, but let me uh you know talk about some specific names uh, which have been in focus today let's pull up uh, something like uh, an IFL see where it's settling in at at close today uh, there you go almost 13% higher let's also see some other financial something like an avas uh jm financial is up roughly 4% as well uh, something like an avas uh, nearly up 10% at close uh so some of the financials seem to have done quite well within the mid cap space let's pull up something like a supreme industries it's one of the top gainers on the nifty mid cap it's done uh, again very well in trade today uh let's also try and see where uh, americo is closing in at uh, again that update coming in uh there you go 3 and a half percent higher some of the losers max health Uh, being one of them uh intellect uh, angel one uh there you go 2% not too bad even among the top losers you're not seeing uh, you see maybe a 1 to 3% kind of a decline so not bad at all angel one has given up some of those losses uh that it was sitting on some real estate counters something like a purvankara uh, sofa had slightly softer set of numbers let's pull that one up as well uh where is it settling in at okay uh so that's where we've closed where sofa is concerned uh, uh some gas stocks igl mgl uh also i want to try and pull up pb fintech because that's uh that one has really hit it out of the park uh, uh in the same time as zamato has it's been a little less covered than zamato uh yeah, yeah. than we've covered zamato maybe uh deserves more merit but that one is up 2% as well both of those uh, pb fintech and zamato Yeah, quite unlike what PTM strategy has been, unfortunately. Yes. But with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Market Close from Hashmi and the team that put this show together. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. 
We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we are already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers, growing fast. We are even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Headlines you start your day with. Hello and welcome. You're watching NDTV Profits special RBI MPC coverage. I am Pallavi Nahata. Now, uh, uh, the RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das, as was largely expected by the markets, decided to keep the uh, benchmark lending rate at 6.5%. Uh, the M RBI and the MPC have also uh, voted to continue to maintain the stance uh, at withdrawal of accommodation. But for more insights and their analysis uh, from today's MPC, we're joined by B. Prasanna, Group Head, Global Markets, Sales trading and research at ICICI Bank and Radhika Rao, senior economist at DBS Bank. So thank you so very much for taking time out for us today. Thank so, you, Balavi. So, you know, to begin with, what were your uh, quick takeaways from today? Uh, so I think uh, broadly, uh, Palavi, I think you uh, gave a good introduction, broadly, uh, very, very uh, 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 as per market expectations, I would say, and uh, I think uh, the fact that there was no uh, change in policy uh, rates as well as no change in stance was both kind of uh, expected. In fact, the voting pattern at 5-1 was also kind of expected for both the policy as well as the stance change. I think the significant uh, uh, takeaway possibly is the fact that uh, the continued focus on not only the target of 4%, but the fact that it means to be durably at 4% even after it just touches. So basically it means that we don't, we're not really comfortable with it touching at 4 and then going back up. So we wanted to be, uh, wanted to be durably uh, stay at 4% was one uh, takeaway. And the second I think is the reiteration by the governor again that uh, the growth uh, being very good gives them the policy space to kind of address inflation. Meanwhile, we'll quickly get in our second guest for uh, the show, Radhika Rao, Senior Economist at DBS Bank. Uh, while we try and get Mr. Prasanna back on the show with us. Uh, Radhika, hi. Thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, quick thoughts on today's policy. Uh, broadly along expected lines, but what were your key takeaways? Hi, Balavi. Certainly, I think um, uh, we, the, I think the central bank went into this policy review with a couple of data, more data points. Uh, you know, they had two inflation numbers on hand. Uh, they had a very strong GDP outcome, uh, and also global central banks uh, and their commentary. Uh, you know, in the past uh, 
six eight weeks uh, so based on that assessment and i think the probably the most recent development um was the oil prices heading towards the 90 mark globally uh, and of course you've also seen geopolitical tensions flare up in parts uh, so i would think that um, the central bank's assessment overall economic assessment i think did they are com continuing to be uh, very positive on on growth uh, i think they did see it being investment driven in the earlier assessment as well. At this time, we saw a bit of hint of optimism on consumption also expected to pick up. Uh, they have maintained their overall forecast, but if you see the quarterly profile, there's a very slight uh, change in terms of the first half of the year. And in terms of inflation as well, uh, they expect it to be at 4.5%, that means still above target, but in one of the quarters, it actually slips below 4%, and that's what the quarterly profile seemed to suggest. Um, Apart from all of this, and I think they have really emphasized, and I think if you see the monetary policy report, which also got released alongside, uh, there's quite a strong emphasis on uh, you know, weather-related issues and those concerns for food inflation. Um, again, you and I know that uh, you know, uh, central bank policy doesn't uh, or can't do much for supply side pressures. But of course, the channel that they can uh, make sure doesn't happen, spillover doesn't happen, is inflationary expectations. And that's why they've spoken about, you know, the warning from IMD about uh, potential heat, uh, you know, high temperatures from April to June. Uh, possibly after that, we could still enjoy a normal southwest monsoon, uh, which would be very important for, for food grains. Uh, so in the near term, uh, to conclude, I think the, the strong growth uh, above target inflation still very much in place, um, which you know uh, outright doesn't tell you that there is sufficient room to ease policy or there is an imminent dovish pivot in in view. Uh, and I think the other one is of course to watch whether. Uh, so I think in between now and and uh, you know when they meet next or in the quarter after, uh, there are two three developments which I think they're very, keeping a very close eye on. Perhaps we can discuss this in the next section. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Prasanna, now that we have you back online with us, I do want to ask you, uh, like Radhika too pointed, uh, we do expect inflation in Q2 to actually fall below target, even if it's just for that one quarter. But at that point, uh, real rates uh, are going to be fairly high. So, uh, despite the fact that for the full year, we're still looking at an inflation forecast of 4.5%, that is above target. Do you still pencil in a rate cut, even if it's a modest one of maybe about 25 bips uh, back, uh, you know, in Q2, when inflation is uh, expected to fall below target? Uh, so first of all, Balabi, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I can. So I think um, uh, Dr. Michael Patra was making a very interesting point about real rates. Uh, it not only is real rates important, but uh, it's also important from what level of expected inflation we are looking at that inflation and the distance that level of inflation has with, from the target. So when you're having a expected inflation of 4.5% and then you know you calculate 2% real rate, it does not necessarily mean it's very high is the point he was trying to say. So I guess a higher real rate of interest in order to bring uh, inflation down to four is required when the current inflation is much higher than the target. And then as we go forward, it comes down. I think that's the point he was trying to make. So maybe the real rate, the real rate argument needs to be nuanced from that perspective. The other thing is the, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, just because uh, quarter two inflation goes to 3.8, but the fact is quarter three and quarter four again goes back much above four to say something like four and a half. Uh, I mean, he made sure, the governor made sure that the market doesn't run away with expectations of big rate cuts because of this fact. And that's the reason why he keeps saying about the durability of uh, the inflation target being achieved at 4%. So I think all in all, I think that's the reason why at the margin, the market might probably take this as a hawkish kind of a, a policy, primarily because uh, he's not just letting the comfort come into the market that inflation is very well controlled because we all know uh, that quarter two inflation is going to be uh, lower and we all know it's also a part of a base effect because momentum of inflation still continues to be good. So from that perspective, I think he's managing expectations pretty well. Having said all this, uh, Pallavi, I think uh, what happens uh, in the Fed will also have a bearing on the way RBI charters its policy as we go forward. He is, of course, not going to say that uh, in so many words. Uh, we do make policy for our own domestic priorities. But at the same time, we don't live in an isolated world. We live in a relative world. And what happens to the Fed and what happens to the dollar will have to have a bearing either indirectly or directly into what we also do. So I guess uh, monsoon is one. 
uh, going past uh, the quarter two inflation and looking at uh, quarter three, quarter four also being close to four is uh, the second. And the third is uh, to see Fed actually acting in the cycle uh, behind us rather than ahead of us. I think that's the uh, I think the most important thing that the governor is possibly waiting for. So we are uh, penciling a shallow rate cut cycle, uh, but uh, we are probably moving the first rate cut from August to October uh, due to the kind of uh, the nature in which the, not only the Fed is moving, but also the way in which the governor spoke today. Got it. Okay. Uh, I have the same question for you, Radhika, you know, given that uh, the global macro economy does appear to be looking up. We have seen fairly encouraging data, not just here in India for GDP, but globally as well. Uh, and given uh, the commentary today, uh, do you think there might be a little bit of a chance that the uh, RBI might even possibly, uh, you know, cut rates uh, before the Fed does? Um, you know, I, I do think that there is some similarity in terms of the undercurrents that the Fed is facing as well as uh, the RBI is facing. Um, I think they both are in a situation where growth is strong, um, you know, and uh, especially in Fed's case, of course, there are many market participants who came into the year thinking there could be a technical recession, uh, you know, soft landing, hard landing, those, those uh, conversations were still going on. Uh, and then but both are in a situation where growth is, is stronger, uh, stronger than expected. And I think that's allowing them the headroom to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, wait it out till the inflation actually heads towards target. Um, on Fed part, I think they've already mentioned that they might not even, they might not see inflation at their target. But if as far as it heads there, they're happy with that. In RBS front, certainly, I think what happens globally is important. Uh, but I think time and again, in today's press conference as well, the governor did mention that domestic considerations will be far more important. And I think in amongst the Asian central banks, you've actually seen that not many of the central banks uh, actually moved as much as the Fed did. Uh, so, you know, when the Fed reverses course, uh, the Asian central banks also will not need to do as much. Uh, when we come to the RBI's point, I think the scope of RBI moving before the Fed is rather small uh, in our personal view. Uh, we have already expected them to move only in October. I would think the debate would be more towards uh, cut uh, you know, uh, cut by how much or cut at all, I think, rather than uh, them bringing it forward uh, uh, by any any rhyme or reason. I think the other one is, so at this point, look at growth, look at inflation, both don't make um, a justification to essentially go ahead and uh, cut rates. Uh, and as Prasanna also highlighted uh, from the press conference, it was made quite clear that real rates matter, but real rates matter insofar as also comparing where the inflation is at 12 months from now, vis-a-vis -vis the target. Uh, so all these points tell you that they have, there are no clear signals of being dovish. I think it's all market expectations, market pricing. And every subsequent meeting uh, that the RBI comes out and so does not change stance, does not move on rates, that market pricing in terms of rate cuts continues to get pushed back. Uh, so I think to answer your question, I don't think uh, there is any scope of, um, in our view at least, that the RBI will move before the Fed. Uh, I think if anything, they would prefer to be more cautious. Uh, and between now and, uh, you know, the the next two quarters at least, uh, they have an election where they would like to prefer that financial conditions remain stable. Uh, then you've got uh, index inclusion that starts in June uh, and it happens in a phased manner. So, you know, even then uh, where the currency is, where rates are wouldn't matter. Uh, and of course, the third would be Southwest Monsoon, uh, which also starts somewhere in May uh, to July, August. Uh, so all these things are event risks that they're watching out for. Uh, but on, as far as policy is concerned, a very little justification at this point to go ahead and uh, pivot towards a, a dovish leaning. Okay, uh, so time for a break now. But before we do that, will the RBI follow the US Fed's path and consider cutting rates? That was the question asked by my colleague Vishwanath during the RBI's post-monetary policy presser. Here's what Governor Shaktikanta Das too had to say. Listen in. You spoke about the real rates in detail, but uh, the bottom line is is you're not seeing 4% in FI25, at least according to your projections at this point in time. Um, there was hope that uh, when the US Federal Reserve supposedly is going to cut rates in June, then the RBI might follow. Are we looking at any kind of a, any indication of a rate cut this financial year or not? That's my primary question. Is it with regard to the rate cut this year, I cannot give you a forward guidance. 
In fact, uh, countries which give uh, dot plots also, the dot plots keep changing from meeting to meeting. So with regard to rate cut uh, or whatever rate action, I mean, let me not say rate cut, but whatever rate action, it is linked to the evolving uh, path of uh, uh, inflation. So on that, I cannot give you any forward guidance. And the other point which you mentioned about expectation linked to U.S. Uh, rate cut, I think... Uh, as I have said on a number of occasions earlier, our monetary policy is primarily guided and determined by our domestic uh, situations. So we do not uh, just uh, follow the footsteps of uh, the U.S., uh, U.S. Fed. In fact, if you see, if you just recall in the past several months or, you know, past few years in particular, I can talk about, I mean, we did our rate cuts our rate rate cut which we did in 2019 or the rate beginning of the rate increase which we did uh, in uh, 2022 they did not really they really they actually preceded uh, us fed action so therefore our policy is governed and determined primarily by domestic circumstances Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Welcome back. You're watching the special RBI MPC coverage on NDTV Profit. I'm joined by my guests, B. Prasanna and Radhika Rao. Uh, Mr. Prasanna, I'll come to you first. So uh, I do want to ask you broadly the expectation for the benchmark bond deals going forward is for them to range between about 6.5% to 7%. Uh, and uh, what is the uh, figure that you are looking at? Also, can we expect weighted average call rates to also now trade below the repo rate going forward? So, uh, Pallavi, I think uh, bond deals are going to be between uh, 7 and 7.15 kind of levels uh, till maybe uh, the first quarter gets over. And after that, when the bond index inclusion comes, uh, and hopefully the Fed would either have indicated that they are going to cut very soon or they have actually cut, uh, then, uh, you know, bond deals can slip below 7%. So our range is somewhere between 665 and 7 by the second half of this financial year and between 7 and 715 for the first half, uh, first uh, quarter. Uh, and on the question on the weighted average uh, call rate, 
uh, rest assured that even when RBI turns its uh, changes its stance and becomes a little easy, it's going to make sure that uh, it's going to uh, mop out excess liquidity to ensure that the weighted average call rate does not slip too far below uh, repo rate. Uh, so they always have been having an asymmetrical kind of a reaction between when liquidity is surplus and when liquidity is uh, deficit. When liquidity is deficit, they are quite slow to act to give money to the system because their chance was also such. But when liquidity is uh, surplus and uh, you know it goes below repo, I'm sure they are going to use these multiple instruments to take it out. The, not the long-term instruments like OMO uh, sales and all that, but at least the BRRRs and then take it out. So I would assume that it will be an achievement if weighted average call rate is close to the repo rate. That itself is good enough for the market because the market is coming from a period when uh, there was a stealth hike, so to speak, and uh, the weighted average call rate was about uh, 25 basis points or so above the repo rate itself, which is considered as a policy rate. So I think uh, that that's the way to really uh, look at it going forward. Okay. Uh, Radhika, coming to you, I do want to ask you, so, you know, for the longest time, we've had a, a wide term premium here in the Indian markets. Uh, but going forward, uh, considering the broader expectation given domestic and global factors, is uh, some easing on the benchmark bond yields, uh, is a smaller term premium then going to be a problem, uh, you know, towards maybe the second half of the fiscal year? Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, a problem. Uh, I think there there'll be two different drivers that will drive two ends of the curve. I would think um, you know the short end for it to correct quite sharply, you will need uh, quite a clear signal from the central bank on the policy front, and I think we have discussed that uh, in quite detail. Uh, on the longer end, of course, right now the flat the the curve is pretty flat, but um, what what you do see is again there too. You need to be uh, right now. You're seeing a lot of inflows. Uh, kind of keeping a lid on the yields as well. And in fact, there are two way forces. There's inflows, on, uh, uh, you know, capping up move. And on the downside, you've got, you know, what's happening globally. You've got the US yields that started the year on a very, on a sub 4% footing. And now you've seen them, uh, you know, seen, seen quite an increase. Uh, so going forward, I think on our focus are, are not very different. Um, you know, we in fact ex also expect uh, yields to be, uh, at least the long end of the curve, to be at about 7, 6.95% at best in the first half of this fiscal year. Uh, I think in terms of flows, we've already seen about 6, 7 billion flows into bonds front running the index inclusion just this calendar year. And now with those kind of flows, even then you've seen the rupee actually weaken. Uh, so the central bank has been very active in in absorbing those flows. In fact, in the MPC today as well, or at the meeting, uh, the uh, RBI did mention about the fact that you know the reserves, um, because people, generally markets are questioning now at what point will they stop in the sense that is 650 okay, 680 okay, 700 billion okay in terms of the reserves. And I think the central bank made it quite clear uh, that they don't have any target in mind, and it is a function. Uh, at the end of the day of strengthening your own country's balance sheet uh, and is also in terms of wanting to minimize any one-sided swings on the rupee, mm -hmm. according to us. Uh, so coming back on the on the yield front, I would think that uh, uh, first half, um, and not so much of movement, I think we barely see going down to about 6.95%. This is our uh, own in-house forecast. In the second half of the year, uh, we could see a, a bit more of softness. But insofar as the flows are concerned, uh, I think it is quite clear uh, that the central bank would not want, uh, you know, very strong uh, impact on the currency or on uh, yields just because of the flows. And on the liquidity part of the equation, uh, I think liquidity being relatively kept tight also kind of gels with what they have been talking about in terms of policy transmission. Uh, there was a very passing mention in today's review. Much more time was spent on it in February, um, and you know, you that that. Uh, keeping excess liquidity in check kind of also aids your overall transmission policy transmission, which continues to happen. Um, and I think it will expedite because you've got this external benchmark lending rate, you know, loans under it now almost at about 56, 57% uh, of outstanding. So which is, uh, you know, increasing and then MCLRs are basically coming down. Uh, so net led, yes, to answer your question, I would think short end and long end, we will look at uh, two different drivers. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Prasanna. And thank you so much for joining us, Radhika. That's all the time we have on the show for now. But do stay tuned to NDTV Profit. We have a lot more lined up. Hi. 
I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0, if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite oh, simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call option. But if you think the market could slide downwards... Simplifying futures and options trading. Don't worry about the future. And we've got your options covered. Futures and options strategy that will help you move with the tide. An unmissable trip. If you want to be in the money, Markets end flat after recovering from the day's low, as the central bank keeps repo rate unchanged. The Monetary Policy Committee leaves the benchmark lending rate unchanged for the seventh straight time. Any rate cut action is linked to how inflation evolves, says the RBI governor. Now, two years ago, around this time, when CPI inflation had peaked at 7.8% in April 2022, the elephant in the room was inflation. The elephant, has now gone out, the elephant has now gone out for a walk and appears to be returning to the forest. We would like the elephant to return to the forest and remain there on a durable basis. In other words, it is essential that it is essential in the best interest of the economy that CPI inflation continues to moderate and aligns to the target on a durable basis. The RBI retains the FY25 CPI inflation forecast at 4.5%, says the elephant appears to be returning to the forest. Congress leader Shashi Tharoor picks global equities over domestic stocks as he has invested over 9 crore rupees in overseas equities, says an affidavit that was filed during his nomination for the Lok Sabha polls. The Congress releases its poll manifesto, focuses on unemployment, guarantees to set national minimum wage at 400 rupees per day, promises to implement MSP or minimum support price for farmers growing cash crops. NDTV Profit brings to you a ground report from the Okla Sabzi Mandi from New Delhi on how the heatwave warning from IMD will impact vegetable prices.
Hello and welcome. You're watching The Reporter on NDTV Profit. I'm your host, Pallavi Dahata. And as always, the show aims to bring to you market headlines along with national and international news. But before we dive into the show, let's have a quick look at how the markets have fared today. Let's go across to my colleague Harsh Saita, who joins us with the wrap-up of the day's action. Well, flat day for the benchmarks uh, is how we've closed the week. Oh, as flat as it can get. Uh, that's, that's where we're at, down just about one, less than a point. Uh, but not a bad uh, close, given the fact that uh, we've had a bit of a tumultuous kind of a day, especially on the benchmark. Let me quickly take it to the Nifty Bank because that's where we're seeing green, 1% higher. If we can also pull up the broader markets because that's where we saw performance, half a percent higher on both the mid cap as well as the small cap indices. And if we can have the advanced decline, that's what will reflect that the broader markets continue to outperform the benchmarks. and. That brief bit of reversal and we've closed at probably the highest point of the day where advanced decline is concerned. So the breadth of the market was quite healthy. Let me fl uh, flip it over, switch focus on the heat map of the Nifty 50, see what was buzzing in trade. Uh, look at the private sector banks. Those were the ones really leading the charge in trade. Kotak Mahindra Bank up 2%, HDFC Bank up a percent and a half. So that's where we saw a bulk of the action. HDFC Bank week to date 7%. Not very often that we see a move like that on a stock of that size. So, so that one uh, to be noted. Among the losers, uh, the Birla Group stocks. Bajaj Auto, LNT, Bharti, so it's a mixed bag uh, where the losers are concerned. You'll see a Bajaj Finance there as well, 1.3% lower on the back of uh, the numbers that they've come out with. Let me quickly take it to uh, sectors uh, and try and pull up uh, the sectors uh, and Realty was the top leader there. Nifty Bank was the surprise performer, especially the way it started. Uh, it's the surprise performer, definitely. It's done very, very well. And among the losers, you have IT, a bit of cool off after a couple of days of hot trade uh, within that IT space. Infra also uh, had a soft day. But uh, that's how we've wrapped the week. We'll obviously see you on the other side. And on to the big story from today, the Reserve Bank of India left the repo rate unchanged for the seventh consecutive time. Now, the MPC uh, and the RBI have also retained the inflation and growth forecasts for FY25, while the inflation forecast has been retained at 4.5%. GDP growth is estimated at 7% for the full fiscal year. That's FY25. And uh, the uh, RBI in its commentary has also said that food and fuel inflation will be a key monitorable. The central bank also said that weather conditions may also have an impact on vegetable prices, uh, especially given the IMD's heat warning. Uh, basically, the warning essentially says that we will be seeing heat waves in the months of April, May and June. Uh, also on global factors, the central bank has said that crude prices will remain volatile because of production cuts and geopolitical tensions. But will the RBI follow the US Fed's path and consider cutting rates this calendar year? That was the question asked by my colleague Vishwanath Nair during the RBI's post-monetary policy presser. Here's what Governor Shakti Kanta Das had to say. Listen in. You spoke about the real rates in detail, but uh, the bottom line is, is you're not seeing 4% in FI25, at least according to your projections at this point in time. Um, there was hope that uh, when the US Federal Reserve supposedly is going to cut rates in June, then the RBI might follow. Are we looking at any kind of a, any indication of a rate cut this financial year or not? That's my primary question. Issue with regard to the rate cut this year, I cannot give you a forward guidance. In fact, uh, countries which give uh, dot plots also, the dot plots keep changing from meeting to meeting. So with regard to rate cut uh, or whatever rate action, I mean, let me not say rate cut, but whatever rate action, it is linked to the evolving uh, path of uh, uh, inflation. So on that, I cannot give you any forward guidance. And the other point which you mentioned about expectation linked to U.S. Uh, rate cut, I think uh, as I have said on a number of occasions earlier, 
our monetary policy is primarily guided and determined by our domestic uh, situations. So we do not uh, just uh, follow the footsteps of uh, the U.S., a U.S. Fed. In fact, if you see, if you just recall in the past several months or, you know, past few years in particular, I can talk about. I mean, we did our rate cuts, our rate, rate cut, which we did in 2019, or the rate, beginning of the rate increase, which we did uh, in uh, 2022, they did not really, they really, they actually preceded uh, U.S. Fed action. So therefore, our policy is governed and determined primarily by domestic circumstances. On inflation, the RBI governor said that we would like the elephant to return to the forest. Listen in. Now, two years ago, around this time, when CPI inflation had peaked at 7.8% in April 2022, the elephant in the room was inflation. The elephant has now gone out the elephant has now gone out for a walk and appears to be returning to the forest. We would like the elephant to return to the forest and remain there on a durable basis. In other words, it is essential that it is essential in the best interest of the economy that CPI inflation continues to moderate and aligns to the target on a durable basis. More from the monetary policy, the RBI has allowed the distribution of central bank digital currency or the e-rupee to retail users through non-bank payment system operators. My colleague Pragati Oberoi joins us with more on this. Pragati, what does this entail? Right, Pallavi, as you rightly mentioned, uh, in the monetary policy address uh, this morning, the RBI announced that the retail CBDC, uh, which is already in its pilot stage, would now be available uh, to more users through the non-bank payment system operators, which we also call as PSOs, which basically includes companies like PhonePay, Google Pay, uh, because they are the payment service providers in this case. So the idea of RBI to do this is to enhance access and also test the system we must remember that till now before this announcement this particular facility of giving the CBDC wallet was only available through the banks but now with the RBS announcement it would also be available through these particular PSOs while the modalities or the technicalities of how this will be executed executed are yet to come in the public domain but we are awaiting more details on it however for context we must tell our users here that uh, the cbdc retail pilot has been something in rbs focus in fact in the post policy uh, press briefing that was done uh, uh, the when uh, the questions were being taken the rbi's uh, spokespersons also said that the interoperability of cbdc with upi is what is leading to a boost in the transactions and it, they are also observing a very interesting trend that the transactions are now slowly shifting towards P2M, which is the person to merchant transactions from the current person to peer transactions. So uh, once we have more details on how this would be executed, we will definitely bring them to you. Thank you, Pragati. Uh, the currency market also drew comfort from the MPC's decision to maintain the status quo. Uh, the rupee closed 15 pairs higher at 83.29 about levels versus the dollar. Mimansa joins us with more on the rupee. Yeah, hi Pallavi. So the rupee closed higher, 15 paise higher than the previous close on Thursday. Uh, this is important because for the for this week there was a lot of chaos and panic in the currency futures market as to uh, uh, because af after the RBI circular reinstated circular had mentioned that the uh, that, that the uh, users can transact in the futures market only if they have an underlying exposure. So uh, currency traders were awaiting announcements on that front, or they were waiting for RBI to give any uh, relaxation but since there were no surprises on that front the currency uh, traders in the spot market uh, started uh, unwinding their long positions that they had built on dollar which led to a uh, rise in the rupee towards the end of trade when the uh, RBI policy uh, with the post policy conference uh, ended uh, one thing that we have to note, no, note down here is that the RBI governor also mentioned that their prime focus is to build their foreign currency reserves uh, uh, 
so that wherever there's a uh, turn in the cycle, uh, the RBI is prepared enough to uh, withstand those shocks, if any. Uh, so that is what gave uh, co gave an indication to currency market players that the RBI will not let the rupee depreciate a lot. Uh, and for the past few days, we have seen that the RBI has been, uh, there's a speculation that the RBI has been intervening into the currency market around 83.40 to 83.45 levels. So that is a level that the currency traders are expecting that it will be a cap on the upside for USD INR and that is why they unwound their long positions that they had built on the dollar uh, through the week and today. Thank you so much for that, Mamansa. Moving on, Congress leader Shashi Tharoor uh, picks global equities over domestic stocks. This is according to an affidavit that was filed during his nomination for the Lok Sabha polls. We have Alex joining us with a special report on the portfolio of the Congress leader. Alex? What stands out in Shashi Tharoor's portfolio? And what stood out to me was the multifarious, multitudinous mutual fund schemes that he has. And I'm probably using lightweight Tharurian words here, but then what that probably, probably means or should mean to you is that they are way too many. Let's take a look at some of those though. You have uh, bank deposits of 10.08 crore rupees, and these are varied in multiple banks, including banks abroad. And then let's come to the mutual fund holdings, which is as many as 1.72 crore in 20, three or 24 schemes, and seven of those schemes are equity-linked saving schemes, and this is incredible for an individual that has total assets of over 50 crore, is still thinking about saving taxes. Uh, some of the big holdings, however, are in the likes of HDFC Credit Risk Fund, Franklin India Focused Equity Fund, as well as ICIC Approved Multicap Fund, the BAF Fund, the Balanced Advantage from, Fund from ICIC Approved, as well as HDFC Flexi Cap Fund. He's also got RBI bonds and certificates of deposit. By the way, those are short term uh, instruments, debt instruments, to the tune of 3.61 crore rupees. He's got a portfolio management scheme with JM Financial to the extent of 36.7 lakh rupees. He's also algo trading with an entity called ST Advisors to the tune of 1.23 crore rupees. Uh, and he's finally got gold worth 32 lakh rupees, US Treasury worth 2.02 crore rupees, overseas equity which eclipses everything from domestic holdings at 9.33 crore rupees. One would have to ask if he holds uh, the FANG stocks or, in fact, uh, some of the other large entities there, including NVIDIA. A Bitcoin ETF, which was mentioned earlier to the extent of 5.11 lakh rupees. Bitcoin to the moon, Mr. Tharoor. And options that are currently open worth about 20 lakh rupees. So it seems like Mr. Tharoor's investment portfolio is almost as savvy as his vocabulary, uh, apart from his mutual fund holdings. The Supreme Court has transferred 27 pending cases against 28% GST on e-gaming companies to itself. These pleas were transferred from several high courts. My colleague Varun Gakhar joins us with more on this. Varun? A total of nearly 27 cases pending before nine high courts have been transferred before the Apex Court. And some of these pending challenges are filed by Delta Tech com Gaming Company, Golden Gaming International, Vision 11 Gaming, etc. And the tax demands from these companies are running into thousands of crores. Now, the court has said that to avoid different views that might prop up from different high courts on this issue, it is better that the top court takes a final call on the matter. The court will now hear all these matters along with the Gamescraft case in the first week of May. Now, it must be noted that earlier this year, the top court had agreed to hear pleas challenging the retrospective application of the revised 28% GST rate. Now, these e-gaming firms are that are challenging the tax department stance to impose a 28% GST on the full face value of the bets for the period prior to October 1, 2023. Now, as per the department, the tax will be levied at the point when the deposit is made, irrespective of whether the activities are a, a game of skill or a game of chance, as long as they are played with stakes. Now, in addition, the government has said that this liability was already pre-existing and that the law has not been amended in this regard, but only clarified. Consequently, the tax department has been issuing GST notices for, for the period prior to October 1, 2023 as well, which has led to a battery of GST notices being slapped on these companies with demands that are running into multiples of their earnings. 
And with that, it's time to slip into a short break. But stay tuned, we have a lot more lined up on the other side. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world. Welcome back. You're watching The Reporter on NDTV Profit. Now, the Indian Meteorological Department had a short while back cautioned about above normal temperatures and heat waves in several parts of the country. But how will the heat waves impact the prices of perishables and key vegetables? My colleague Janani Janardhanan brings us the special ground report from the Okla Sabzi Mandi in New Delhi. Meteorological department has issued an intense heat wave warning. For the next three months, an intense or extreme heat wave could be gripping the country starting April, May, and June. What's different about this heat wave, of course, is that it's expected to be longer, drier spells, uh, perhaps ranging up to 10 to 20 days from the usual four to eight days. The direct impact, of course, could be on a various of other sectors, primarily on agriculture. While uh, grains could be controlled by policy measures, the state of perishables is in fact something we're yet to find out. Will onions, tomatoes, potatoes perhaps become pricier? Will they become dearer to the pockets of the everyday shopper? We're here at Delhi's Okla Sabzi Mandi to find out. जो प्याज की बहुत बढ़िया है प्याज खूब है और कोई महंगाई नहीं है 20 रुपए से लेकर 25 रुपए तक का रेट है प्याज का अभी का रेट है जी और महीने दो महीने बाद भी यही रेट रहना है क्योंकि फसल जो सारी तैयार है नासिक की बेंगलोर की पूना की भावनगर की और भी मतलब काफी देशों की प्याजे हैं कोई महंगाई नहीं है सर अभी सरकार ने वार्निंग दी है कि अगले तीन महीने बहुत खड़ी धूप हो सकती है अप्रैल मई और जून की टमाटर की क्या हाल है अभी फिलहाल और आप क्या सुन रहे हैं मार्केट में 200 250 की 10 रुपया किलो 8 रुपया किलो 6 रुपया किलो तो हो जाएगा और ये इस साल की नहीं है यूजुअली होती है इसी टाइम पे या बस इस साल की हमेशा होता है इसी टाइम पे हमेशा एंड देयर यू हैव इट we seem to be getting the sentiment that things are not very bad off for considering that the summer season is just beginning. However, like I said, it's just the beginning of the season. We'll have to still wait and watch whether the months to unfold will in fact bring about a change in the seasonality. So far, the beginning of April seems to have bought seasonal lows in terms of prices, particularly for tomatoes and onions. Uh, it is expected that this will continue and perhaps the yield is good enough for it to last through the summer. 
But however, if the higher temperatures will indeed lead to crops going bad uh, quicker, whether it reduces the footfall of people coming to the market, purchasing from them, is something we'll still have to track as the months roll on. This is Janani Janarthanan with camera person Surat Singh for NDTV Profit. And Jindal Lifestyle debuts in the premium cookware segment. It launches 50 stock keeping units under the Art Dinox brand and targets a 1,000 crore rupees revenue in the next five years. My colleague Stesha Sen spoke to Ranjan Chaudhary, the CEO at Jindal Lifestyle. Listen in. The range will start uh, from 3.5k, it will go up to 5.5k, depend on what SKUs you are buying. And you know, because this industry is innovation-led industry, so there will be always price revisions in a different kind of product. Uh, something may go higher, something may go lower, but yeah, it start with 3.5k, go up to 5.5k approx. Got it. So, uh, you know, you are entering this market at a time when the industry is facing a double whammy of uh, low demand as well as rising prices, input prices. So how do you see the market and also what is the kind of growth that you're looking to, uh, you know, uh, do in the next two, three years? Okay, so I give you first background of this industry. You know, we are the largest stainless steel producer in India. All the, our cookwares are made out of stainless steel. So we have an edge here, that is the first thing. Secondly, the stainless steel is basically a very healthy in terms of material when it goes on the cookware. Uh, so that's the second idea about it. Uh, basically, now the industry is around 15,000 crore when it comes to the kitchen cookware. Out of that is around three and a half thousand crore is for the premium. We see a growth of 10 to 15 percent year on year. Uh, and as you know, the disposable income of India is increasing. Uh, That's why uh, we feel that this could be a game changer for one, one of the game changer for our uh, business. In long term, what we are planning in next five years to achieve at least thousand crore of revenue from this product line which is cookware. Luminous Power sees opportunities from the PM Surya Ghar Muft Bijli Yojana for its 250 megawatt solar panel plant that was commissioned in Rudrapur in Uttarakhand. Let's listen to the company's MD and CEO Preeti Bajaj as she talks about how the Luminous Power will benefit from the government's impetus on solar power. Anyone who has had power shortage uh, hopefully has experienced a luminous inverter battery solution in their home. And uh, we are very proud to supply around 15 gigawatts of power, uh, power solutions effectively over the last 36 years. Uh, one is that those customers are aware of who we are and they know that we build reliable and good quality power conversion solutions, i.e. inverters. Now, when they think about the future readiness of their homes or their energy needs in the home today and want to offset their expensive electricity bills, they can upgrade to a solar inverter with a solar solution. If they are in a area where the grid is not that great, power quality is not high, they can go with our off-grid solutions or hybrid solutions. And if they are in a urban or metro India, they can go with grid-connected solutions as well. So I think uh, when you think about India and the 25 crore roughly rooftops that are available, um, the world's your oyster. All you need is the support and trust and loyalty of the consumers and brand quality and reliability of technological solutions. Hopefully we can bring both to our customers. Earlier today, the Congress released its manifesto for the upcoming Lok Sabha polls, calling it the document for justice. Now, the manifesto guarantees to set the national minimum wage at 400 rupees per day. It also mentions that the party will launch the Mahalakshmi scheme to provide 1 lakh rupees per year to every poor Indian family. The document also says that the Congress will conduct nationwide socio-economic and caste census and it will replace the GST laws enacted by the BJP or the NDA government with GST 2.0. The new GST regime will be based on the universally accepted principle that GST shall be single moderate rate with a few exceptions that will not burden the poor. Moving on, Actor turned politician and independent MP from Mandya in Karnataka, Sumalata Ambarish joined the BJP, with BJP ceding Mandya seat to its alliance partner JDS in the upcoming Lok Sabha polls. 
Sumalata, after consulting her supporters and well-wishers in Mandya on Wednesday, announced her decision to opt out of the elections and joined the BJP. As an independent candidate, Sumalata had won the seat in 2019 by defeating the then Chief Minister Kumaraswamy's son, Nikhil Kumaraswamy of the JDS with the BJP's support. And that's all we have time for on this edition of The Reporter. But stay tuned to NDTV Profit for more news and updates. Hi, I'm Tanuj Bhojwani and I run People Plus AI. We're an organization that helps startups build AI. Will AI take away jobs? Well, that's a mixed bag. Some jobs like customer service or KPOs or even junior level programming will be impacted in the short term. However, we're already seeing a new class of AI engineers, prompt engineers growing fast. We're even seeing a new version of the IT services industry, an IT services 3.0 if you will, come up around building for AI. The idea is that your job and what you do every day will change because of AI. Some jobs might go away, new jobs get created, but this is going to be an exciting time for our economy. Different people believe in different things. In cricket, some hail the king, some believe in God. Some wait for Mr. Right, some believe in swiping right. Some run away from risk, others run after it. For some, kids mean babies, for others, kids mean puppies. Some want a home to settle in the future, some want to roam the world today. Some make a career in a company. Some make a career out of building companies. But when it comes to money, everybody believes in only one thing. Profit, profit, profit. And for profit, watch only NDTV Profit. We all love money. Bro, what are you doing? I'm trading FNOs. So, have you made any money? Quite simple. If you think the market is moving upwards, just buy Nifty call options. 